Welcome to the 49er and 49er FX World Championships here in Marina Rubicon in the south of Lanzarote. 
Hi, my name's Andy Rice, and I will be joined today by Nora Ruskula, 49er FX Olympian and double 49er Olympian Stevie Morrison from Great Britain. Uh, Nora from Finland, I should say. Um, you're, you're still campaigning on the Olympic trail, but this takes you back to your, your previous boat, the, uh, the FX. must be really exciting for you to see some of your old mates in the fleet. And Stevie, um, you, you go back, you won the 49er Worlds uh, a few years back as well. Um, so this is very familiar territory for you. Um, Stevie, looks like great conditions they've been having in Lanzarote so far. I mean, we get great winter winds out here. Nice big sea state to make it interesting. Should be shifty, gusty. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And uh, yeah, first day at Gold Fleet Racing. So the nerves are always a little bit more heightened than they've been the other few days. Well, uh, let's get into the, the action. Um, Stevie, I know that uh, you know this venue super well. Let's find out a little bit more about this amazing location. Oh, we're actually going to go to some uh, competitor interviews. So uh, let's find out a little bit about uh, some of the competitors racing here this week. Netherlands one. Flores van der Werke and the crew on board Netherlands one. We, we just came off the water. I, I believe we're in second. We're not quite sure. I haven't looked at it ourselves, but um, the event's been going quite well so far. Um, just today we finished with, uh, with a bit of a bad result, which is a bit of a shame. But other than that, overall, we're, we're very happy with how it's going. So I think in general we're, uh, we're happy and uh, going into the finals in a good position. So that's always, uh, that's always an important bit. Hi everyone, I'm Kuba from Pol64, I'm a crew. I'm Mikolai and I'm a home. Currently we are sitting on a third position. Right now we are coming to the finals and there are to gain, lots to lose. Uh, we just gotta keep pushing and hope for the best. So we really enjoy racing here in Lanzarote and we really like the conditions today. I think it suited us quite well and I think our technique was all right. Um, it's pretty shifty, quite moderate um, wind strength. It's a bit like you sailing, a bit more sunny maybe. Uh, but we really like the conditions here. So it's nice today. Yeah, so we just finished four races in quite challenging conditions, I would say. It was very up and down and shifty and you could never really rest um, to actually get around the race course. But I'm very, very happy about how we sailed today. We. We did a lot of mistakes, but also a lot of good comebacks. So we never really um, let ourselves down until the finish line. So yeah, we're quite happy. Yeah, I mean, we love sailing here in Lanzarote. It's wavy, it's shifty. We haven't sailed in this condition so much here. It's uh, a bit special now, like always when it's the regatta, but we really enjoy it and just uh, looking forward for the rest of the week. Yeah, so we already qualified for the Olympics this summer in um, Marseille. So. We're really excited. It's quite fortunate to be selected so early in the game. So that makes we can just focus everything on how to get best until the game. So that's our main focus. Nora Ruskula, you can relate to the emotions that people must have felt yesterday at the, uh, just the end of the halfway stage of this competition. Four years ago, you were here in Lanzarote. You were trying to get to Tokyo to be at your second Olympic Games for Finland. You didn't quite make it. That's one of the toughest days that you could feel in an Olympic campaign, I would think. I would say so, definitely. It's, you, you think about it. You have like trained for at least four years or probably eight years even more for this day to come. Like you're, plan you're in your head, you're already like, yeah, I'm gonna qualify. But when that doesn't happen or does happen, it's like, just feels like, yeah, empty. If if it doesn't happen, especially for me, it happened like because I didn't qualify at that moment. So we're getting into Gold Fleet now, and we're going to see um, a, a lot of tears of joy and a few tears of sorrow at the end of the week. You always do in any sporting contest, but t yesterday was sort of um, end of part one, and and for some it was it was pretty much the end of the road of uh, for their Olympic campaign. Not making it through into Gold Fleet was was a really critical moment and understandable that we saw so many tears of sorrow and a few of joy yesterday. Yeah, and uh, especially even though we're halfway through the event, 
uh, it changes because it it makes a difference. You can't if you end up in the silver fleet or gold fleet, you it can't you can't climb up anymore. Like if you're in the gold fleet, you're like, yes, okay, now I can focus on the rest of the event. But if you didn't make it to the gold fleet, it's basically well, if it's end of your trials or something, you can't climb up anymore. So there so. are lots of different scenarios um, and we will talk you through those um, as we go. There, there we've got the uh, the World Championship standings in the, the men at the moment and Erwan Fischer and Clement Pican absolutely sailing out of their skin. The, the French are in a selection trial at the moment to see who's going to represent them at home waters for Paris 2024. And then winners of the last three World Championships Bart Lambriax and Floris van der Verken close behind in second place. And then a bit of a points gap to the top Polish, uh, Mikos Staniel and Jakub Storch. They're in a, they're in a selection trial. And uh, the, the British, Grummet and Hawes in fourth place, absolutely jump out performance for them. And uh, Stevie, uh, these are uh, exciting moments in, in any Olympic career. And really exciting, for example, to see the Uruguayans in sixth place from a, from a small nation punching with, with the big guns. Yeah, it's brilliant to see them up in the top 10. And uh, often you can see this in qualifying. I think today will be a really defining day on the scoreboard. I think for a team like, like Bart, and Floris up there in the front place, that 20th in the last race of qualifying, I see that as a really big mistake by them. I think they tried to play it down, but they'll be they'll be disappointed. That's some wasted points. As you go into the Gold Fleet Series, you won't be racing a lot of your big competitors during qualifying now that every point is effectively doubled up. So big mistake by them yesterday. And uh, for Vilma and Rebecca, you know, what a fantastic start to the racing here. And again, they sailed a solid series without a bad throwaway from their qualifying. So I think they'll be pretty happy, but they've yet to race their big rivals, the Dutch girls. So today really is a moving day. Yeah, now we get to find out which of these uh, world champion teams is, is going to get the upper hand. I, 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 we're, I'm sort of billing this in my mind as very much a, a battle between uh, Sweden and the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands having won in 2021 and 2022, then beaten to the punch. They were second last year, second to the Swedes, who were the fastest by far in the, the world's in The Hague. Uh, but of course, uh, Germany and Batutzi from Italy in a selection trial, um, they will obviously want to have something to say about getting into the to the top two. And Laura Harding and Annie Wilmot, um, really a great surprise to see that particular Australian team uh, doing so well. And uh, it comes back to what we are just saying just now, Nora, because the, the team that was third at the Worlds last year, L Olivia Price and Evie Hazeldean from Australia, finished qualifying in 29th. They're not going to have a chance to go any further in gold fleet. So a really surprising switch around in Australian fortunes. Yeah, exactly. And it's the three days that determined, but this is the race, so... This is it. And, yeah. and amazing performance by them to be ahead of uh, experienced teams like the former world champions, Echegoyen and Barcelo from Spain, who are currently in fifth. Uh, so, so that's the uh, scenario. We've got a lot of teams to talk about today. 25 in the men, but firstly, 25 in the women, because they're going to be first up this morning here in Lanzarote. Uh, but this is such an exciting boat. I remember the first time I got in a 49er back in the late 1990s. It, it, it was an absolute breakthrough. It, it was it was like going from a propeller-driven aeroplane to to a jet-powered airplane. And uh, Stevie, can you can you remember that first time you got on a 49er? Yeah, I do. I mean, I certainly remember plenty of stories about the first time you got into it, Andy. But I believe most of the boat <laughs> came back in one piece after that, didn't it? But uh, no, I I, uh, I think they're just superb boats. They've evolved over time. I think what's so interesting to look at is the is the size of the sailors from when we started back then. You know, when I was when I was campaigning, I was kind of seventy three kilos and. Um, and I'm uh, one meter 78 tall, whereas you look at you look at someone, you know, like like, uh, you know, like Bart, for example. I mean, he he is a big, tall lad stood at the back of the boat helming that now. And he'll be well up 85 kilos. And uh, and just there's a lot more horsepower on offer out there. They're driving the boat harder. The technique's a lot better than when we used to do it. Um, but, you know, it's still going to come back to can we get off the start line? Well, can we pick the first wind shift? Um, because it's pretty tricky out there on the course today. OK, well, let's find out a little bit more about these amazing boats, the 49er and the 49er FX, the Olympic skiffs. Specifically 
definitely the 49er. I like it a lot. The, um, the boat speed and the tactics and the, the whole fleet is super close. Um, so it really c comes down to the, all the small de details and that's a lot of fun, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, as I was growing up, I always wanted to say 49er. So yeah, I, this was my always my dream. Yeah, the, boat is, the boat is fast, it's fun. It's more fun, obviously, in the big breeze and the waves. So yeah. Nora, what I love about the 49er and, and your FX is that even when you've had a bad day in the results, you've still had a great day of sailing, haven't you? It's such a nice boat. Oh, yeah. It's, it's glorious. It's so much fun to sail these boats. And I actually miss it a lot now after having sailed it myself in a few years. Well, you're a high-speed kiter, so you, you're very much in the, the, the high-speed game doing what you're doing now, <laughs> aiming at the coming Olympics. But these are still amongst uh, some of the fastest sailing boats that you can find. And look at the swell. You can see the swell rolling across. The, the great thing about sailing, Stevie, is, is that the, the racetrack, it, it's not the same 400-meter racetrack that you get in athletics. Um, it, you know, it, it, this, is, this, is, this is not a, a level playing field. It's quite a lumpy one that we see here in Lanzarote. It's a really bumpy one, and that's a great view upwind. If you look to the right-hand side of your screen there, you can see a range of mountains or hills, volcanoes. There's one to the top left. There's another volcano. And I think what we're going to learn through the day is, does it tend to pay to go towards the right of our screen on those upwind legs? As we see the course here in front of us, it's a simple upwind, downwind course. And the boats, we can see it's gusty, it's shifty out there. So whilst, yes, there will be opportunities for different teams, everyone starts on the same start line. Everyone's got to go around the same mark. So in that sense, it is equal opportunity, but no, Ricey, it's definitely not a case of uh, get in your lane, hear the gun go and run as fast as you can in a straight line. It's a lot more complexity to that. And there's going to be a lot more uh, emotional roller coasters out there for the crews, because ultimately, when it's this gusty, this shifty, there's going to be a lot of mistakes made. And uh, you're going to be able to get some real good opportunities to overtake and pass boats ahead of you and lose those boats. Well, what an amazing view we have on the water and Marina Rubicon, where we're sailing out of, also quite a beautiful place. And Nora had a walk around the harbour to, uh, to see what was going on in the pit lane earlier. 49er FX Bow Park, watching the ladies get ready for today's racing, uh, day four. And uh, well, like the gold fleet racing today. How are you feeling, Paula, from the Spanish team? Um, I'm feeling very excited to go racing today. I think it's going to be a very challenging day like those we're having the past day. So we will see how it goes. We will give everything on the water. Oh, <laughs> exciting. Okay, I'm really looking forward to see you go today and send it, okay? <laughs> Thank you. And then after that, we'll have the, actually, the British ladies, British girls here. Saskia and Freya, how are you doing today? How are you excited for today? today's racing yeah well it's golfy racing today so it's exciting to go out and hopefully we have a good day today is it going to be different today than from yesterday and the other days um it might be a little bit lighter um we might be a bit closer to the shore yesterday we sailed quite a long way out so yeah well it, there's a bit more swell we think so it'll be interesting sea state okay cool well good luck for Thank today you very much. and then we'll go and see so the girls are getting ready for today we still have a bit over an hour or two actually for the racing so they have plenty of time putting on the last stickers and stuff preparing for well they already sailed for three days it's three three days so it's not that different today there here we have the belgian girls hey how are you feeling today are you excited and what's your strategy oh strategy i don't know it'll be a bit different than gold fleet today so it'll be quite exciting to see how it goes yeah We'll be ready to fight, I think, yeah. Yeah, ready to fight, like all in or? Yeah, I think so. I think we said we need to push a bit on the starts for sure in this type of wind. So we're excited to do that. Okay, we're going to be looking after you guys. <laughs> I'll see you. Okay, and that's for it. We're going to go back to the studio and then watch the live racing. So we are just a few minutes away from the first race start, um, about eight or nine minutes until we kick off with the first of our 49er FX races, the, the Gold Fleet just about to begin. Um, if we can have a, just a look at that weather forecast again, let's see if we can bring up that graphic. 
And Stevie, I want to ask you, um, what, what do you think? This It's a little bit lighter today. No, no real light wind days, but uh, what's the opportunity here? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it is interesting. The forecast I've got is even windier for tomorrow. So tomorrow could be some real harem scarum stuff out there. And I think for those crews, maybe, you know, we're looking at the French crew, France 95. They won a European championship in light winds. They're involved in trials. This is a big day for them. If they're going to have any hope to, to catch back up towards Erwin Fisher at the top of the fleet and get that French spot. They need a good result. And in the FX standings, well, who does that favour? Martine Grail, two-time Olympic gold medalist. You know, her and Kiana there, they're down in ninth, one of the smaller crews. So I think probably a day like today, they'd be feeling like they need to make a move as it's going to get windier going forward. But you can see on the camera angle we've got here, it's really gusty, really shifty. There's going to be some big holes out there, big gusts out there. If you can find yourself in the right place, you're going to be able to make some big, big gain so good start is going to be pretty key here to give yourself the opportunity of the first shift you say good start but Nora I'm wondering also um, with all those shifts maybe if you get a bad start there are still enough opportunities on this race course I would again I yeah I would say that definitely a good start you always need that to kind of play the fleet but since looking at the race course and it's offshore winds I think there's a lot of opportunities to like still do well at the first top mark after a bad start uh, it's you're gonna see the split fleet probably split in like two or even more and trying to find their own way to the top mark and for sure they will, we will see many many routes up to the top of like who's gonna be the first no idea is it gonna be corners or even in the middle, like it's so shifty and gusty, it could be possible to get from the middle of the race course up there. Uh, do you remember from your days in the FX, a lot of the girls that you raced against are still um, in the fleet, like the Brazilian double Olympic champions. Do, do, do you remember anyone who has a particular style of starting, whether they choose the left-hand pin end or the committee boat, um, that, you know, patterns of play to watch out for? Yeah, I would say, well... For sure, there's people that like to, let's say, the Norwegian girls would normally like to start from the pin in, and I think they still do that. But especially with the Brazilians, I say, um, I think they could be a strong team today because I think they're really, really talented. And even though they can see, like, looks like they're deep in the fleet and they're not having a great day, they always find a way to take the right shifts and do a bit, everything a bit better than the others. And I've seen that happen so many times and it used to frustrate me so much. I'm like, how are they so good <laughs> at finding the, like, the way top to the, up, back, back to the top of the fleet? They can be slow starters in championships, including in the Olympics, and somehow they yeah. keep on coming through. And um, I think it must be frustrating, the double Olympic champions, that they don't have much of that sense of invincibility about them that they did a few years ago. It does seem to be the story of the Swedes, who we see in picture now. Sweden won against the Dutch, uh, Netherlands too. It's, uh, the last number of world championships have gone either to the Dutch or the Swedes. So I, I'm sure that's gnawing away at the Brazilians. And, and this is their opportunity for the Brazilians to show that they're still very much world class, isn't it, Nora? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I will, yeah, I hope hope to see them at the top today. But we have there's some very very good sailors in there. Let's say the Swedes, as you said, the Dutch. I totally see them. I think actually Swedish, Dutch, and uh, Brazilians. I would see in the top ones today with the shifty and gusty weather. Uh, Stevie, you've done some 49er FX coaching as well. Just remind me who, who you were working with and, and who you're familiar with in this fleet. Uh, yeah, I mean, we worked a lot with uh, with Charlotte, Charlotte Dobson and Saskia Tidy. And we saw Nora interviewed Saskia there up to the Tokyo Olympics. And I've worked a little bit with Saskia and Freya, the, the British girls who had a pretty tough day yesterday. So they'll be they'll be looking for a serious bounce back. That's for sure. Um, and but you know yeah I mean we've had some training days with a lot of the crews Vilma and Rebecca have certainly raised the bar in in recent years but I think it's it's interesting the physicality these new rigs seem a little bit more powerful uh, the the crews are getting a little bit heavier and I think that could be one of the issues for the for the uh, Brazilian girls they're not the biggest of ladies and uh, and I think perhaps they're struggling to perhaps have the same boat speed as they used to so my eyes fall on Tamara Echelon and uh, Chagoyan sorry and Paula Barquello because. We worked a lot with them and they do like a bit of breeze. They like a shifty race course. And uh, so let's see what they can do today in golf. I'm expecting quite a good performance from them. From the Spanish. Yeah, yeah. They, they, I think they've won the, the Worlds twice before. And 
I think they won the, the Worlds this time four years ago, the same time in the Olympic cycle. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Stevie? Yeah, they always do, Ricey. They always seem to. They've won the Worlds in the Olympic year both times and yet to convert that into an uh, Olympic medal. Uh, in the 49er FX, of course, Tamara uh, did fantastically well in the match racing in the, in the London Olympics. But, um, you know, she's going to be hoping for great things. But there's a lot of crews out there that have got to put in a big day today. That's for sure. Steph Robel, Maggie Shear, 16th. They had Olympic trials that they uh, have got over. And they're probably now looking in a pretty strong position to go to the Olympics with the other American crew not in the gold fleet here. But they'll be wanting to stamp their authority on the fleet. So in less than four minutes to go to the start, really already the positioning's pretty crucial here i think the priority is having some space and being able to sail at speed off the gun and then yeah can i find that first patch of breeze because i think it's going to be opportunity aplenty nora interesting also to see two chinese teams uh, probably not teams that you raced against they're, they're relatively recent arrivals on the scene but who and shan who you can see middle left in in that grid they were leading the regatta for the first couple of days and they're still lying in six overall really impressive to see the chinese coming on so strong yeah i think it's super impressive and i heard they're uh, quite fast so i think that helps a lot and i I'm interested to see how it's going to go today with them. Like, how are they going to keep up the high level, stay in the top as they did in the first days? Now they fell a bit down, but I mean, they're still very close. Like, the points are so, so close that there's not really, you know, one or two boats are going to pass you in the racing and it's going to change the results, the ranking overall. Just under two minutes to the start. So that final lineup and Stevie, looking at what you see there now, where would you be choosing on the start line? I think it's pretty open, to be perfectly honest, where I'd want to be. I think I would want to just have enough space to get out and tack if I needed to. So I think up the line, probably first race of the day, wouldn't be a bad thing to do. But we'd like to know the start line bias. The crews will have done their homework, I'm sure, about that. But anywhere with a little bit of space to be able to sail your mode, and then can I tack soon? So as we look up towards the right-hand side of our screen, that's the windward end of the line. I think if you can get a good start from there, then if you're in a good shift, good pressure, with a good lane, you can go straight but you've got an easy attack out. These boats to the left-hand side of the screen, if they don't nail a good start, they're going to have to dip behind the whole fleet and try and find a way through if they do. So, yeah, I'm surprised to see these few boats down here, but it's all about hitting the line at pace when that gun goes that's crucial and who's going to be nervous. Are they going to be over the line early? Because at the moment, they look like they're pressing pretty close to the start line. Looking at the teams, uh, you can see most of the teams are like closer to the committee and boat and there's actually a few lining up hoping to drift in. Uh, I was surprised to see the Sw Swedish were just in the middle of the starting line so I guess they just were looking for a start to somewhere to get free wins and then the final ones are now trying to look for a place just before we had like a roughly 20 seconds to the start. There's barely anyone at the pin end so it's interesting. Or maybe they need just more space to get over it. It's a bit wavy out there, so we need more space to get the boat going and like to make sure we get over the starting line. Final 10 seconds into the start. Five seconds to go. Still a clear line, but some really close. France 63, good acceleration, but great acceleration out the middle of the line also by the Spanish and China looking very strong, about five down from the committee boat. So great starts from them. And meanwhile, Italy 20 starts on Port Tack and blasting out to the right-hand side, straight out into clear air. Stevie, how's, how's it looking with the breeze, would you say? Yeah, it looks like uh, all the boats are pretty keen to hold on that starboard tack if they can. These boats coming across our screen here on port, well, they've not had great starts, so they're taking second pick on things at the moment. But what a start there out the middle of the line by Australia 47. If that was a clear start, then that's an absolute belter. They've now got any opportunity they want here. They can sail straight if they want to. We can see top of our screen, good patch of breeze on the left-hand side of the course there. It'd be lovely to be back behind the fleet and take a look at win. But yeah, look, this Italian boat early to tack back. I think most of the fleet will feel we're in a right shift at the minute. And for the Australians, what a start. They're in a great position. Yeah, I was really surprised to see the Italian team to take a port start behind everyone and just hit it to the right or 
Yeah, just for a short bit, and now they tacked back. But that's a pretty bold move, I'd say. Well, Stevie, that maybe plays back to what you were saying earlier, that with these shifty conditions, you want the freedom to be able to choose the shift when, when you want. And that's maybe why the committee boat was looking such a popular place to be. So, so what do you make of that Italian tactic? I mean, you, you won a world championships by mostly starting on port tack underneath the fleet. That very move, that, that was your key move winning the Worlds in 2007, wasn't it? Well, yeah, that's because it paid to go right, Andy. <laughs> so it was, just, it was a good way of getting us towards the right hand side of the, the right hand side of the racetrack. Um, I think it, you know, often you, what you want in this fleet is you want to be sailing at VMG at your maximum boat speed for as much of the race as possible. If you're ever sailing slow, well, that's something you could control that you should be able to avoid. So by starting on port, what the Italians have done is give themselves a clear lane early. They've lost some meters early to be free and sailing at speed. If you're in the pack. Now, if you nail the start like the Australians did, which comes with a certain level of risk, were they over, were they not? Hopefully they were behind the line. We'll find that out, no doubt. Then you get a clear lane. But if you're a little bit back on the start, you've got someone tight to lured of you. You're not a VMG. And I think the Italians have prioritised sailing the boat fast. And here we go. Look at this camera angle. Top right-hand side of the screen, massive push, puff of pressure coming down the course. Italians right in the middle of our screen. They've got a good angle at the moment. And I think they might well have positioned themselves nicely for that but again i think the priority for them is can we be at vmg at the gun and uh, and then sailing fast for as much of the upwind leg as possible already some gaps opening up but nora nice gust coming down the course now yeah it's looking good and i'm actually looking at the tracking right now it's really difficult to tell who's here uh leading at the moment but in the tracking it says the italian team that are currently third place that they're overall uh they're currently leading this upwind and uh, but it keeps on changing like rubble and shade the u.s girls some german australians as we saw they had the incredible start but i if i would personally if i look at this race i think it's better to be in the like mid right the left bottom left i'm not sure how well they're going to come from there yeah, it, it does look a bit soft on the far left of our screen. And I agree with you, Nora. It, it, the gust looks a little bit better. The, the darker water looks a little bit stronger in the middle of our screen. Um, Stevie, looks like uh, some are dropping back just out of picture. Um, it looks like middle left is in our picture is the right place to be at the moment, do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I certainly see in plenty of breeze coming down out of the, the Marina Rubicon there. That looks like there's some good gusts and I'd be worried. Top left looks like it might get a little bit affected by that volcano. And traditionally, the wind here tends to become between the volcano to the left and the volcano off our screen to the right. So I think that top right could well come in good up here. But I think I'd be quite happy to be somewhere near the middle of the racetrack right now and then take another look. We're sort of halfway on this upwind leg. Now I'm going to make my final decision big decision about the approach as we get in the boats on the left hand side of the course seem to have got back onto a decent angle again now and they're looking stronger it's shifty day ricey patience 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 it looks like the seeing here in the bottom of our uh screen that the british girls uh were pretty like i think they're a bit over ley line almost to the top mark pushing it all the way to the left maybe they just want to get like the best breeze you can see from the screen there's a lot of gusts here so maybe just try to get the final advantage but they're really pushing it all the way to the left which is like going as you said we want to sail the vmg i'm not sure if that's going to work today it, that, that seems to be a little bit too early up on that ley line uh, effectively if you've gone over ley line you've, you've sailed extra distance that you didn't need to but stevie in a dynamic boat like the 49er fx can you still make that work if you sell the extra distance um, beyond what you needed to yeah i think that the difference in pressure out there andy is so great that um, if you find a bit more breeze, you're going to be going two, three knots faster than those boats around you. And actually, when you look at the tracker there, I think they've ended up overlay because they all sailed into a huge left-hand shift. Now, I'd be nervous about being on the lay line that early, I think, because the wind is swinging around. We'll get a feel for how often is the breeze shifting. But I quite like the position of Joe Alley, the Kiwi boat, in the middle of the racetrack. The Dutch girls, well, there's no surprise to see them quite well positioned. They're just that little bit down, more towards the middle of the course. So they've got the opportunity to get one or two more shifts. I think it's quite quick move in the breeze here. So getting to the ley line early is not going to be a particularly good thing. 
And a couple of days ago, well, actually on, on day one of the competition, uh, people were saying that, uh, that they were aiming for breeze that they could see, but by the time they got there, it, it, wasn't, um, it, it wasn't what it appeared to be. So the, you sort of had to sail with the breeze that you had in the moment. So it's, it's always surprising to me how different the behavior of the breeze can be. And Nora, you've done a lot of sailing here and in Fuerteventura just across the water. Um, it seems like even when they've trained as much as they have done here, this race course still always has surprises in store. I don't understand how that could be. Yeah, I think definitely when the wind comes from like offshore, it you just can't know. You know, you just have to position yourself to the fleet and be ready for everything. That's why going far up on the ley line early, I think, would be risky because you never know if it's going to shift and stuff like that. But even though, yeah, I mean, a bunch of the girls have been training here for months and now three winters in a row. So it's a familiar place for many of them. Of course, we have some new teams as well that probably haven't traveled here and stayed the winter in like Villamora or some other places in Europe and not come all the way to this island. Because once you come here, it's a commitment to stay here a couple of months. That's what the teams normally do. Yeah, it's a long way to get here, but it's well worth it when you do. Absolutely beautiful weather conditions, con considering it's still a European winter. Germany, 55, looks like they've just got across the front of the Belgian boat. Germany, 55, won three races in light winds in the Europeans in Villamora just three or four months ago and looking good as they come out to this side. But Stevie, there's a bunch of boats up to windward of them and it looks like maybe Brazil is, is in the hunt here. Yeah, Brazil have positioned themselves well. It's going to be really tight. Gulf Fleet Racing, it's always going to be tight into this top mark here. It's going to be absolutely crucial about the next shift as we see a lot of boats have made their decision. Now, Germany tack there up towards the ley line. We've got a couple of Spanish boats and the Brazilians expect them to spin the boat fairly soon as we get up towards this ley line. Who's going to find the first gust? And then it's all about the exit out of this top mark as well. Joe Alley, the Kiwi boat, still well positioned, but it's really, really tight in there. The Australians, they're putting in heck of a performance here a bit like sydney harbour i guess few shifts to be found and they're performing well who's judged it right as we come in towards this top mark it looks like it's fairly actually light when you see the teams are now like really hunched over or like more squatted in a position it's not that much breeze i think we can see more gust and then they're like more straight on the trapeze but Wow, now actually the Spanish are doing, they're getting a good lane and the Brazilians, I'm impressed. The French approached from the left side of the race course and they pretty much did the whole ley line all the way, uh, Garnier and Rue. So they found a nice lane, they could stay on their own lane and did a simple, basically a simple strategy as that normally works. When you're in the top, it's easy. <laughs> but the teams are so close, like this is, it's... It's hard. If you get a bit of like dirty air from someone, you're stuck. Like you really want to be careful with that. Interesting to see the first jibe setters amongst the first jibe setters going the opposite direction is Netherlands two somewhere just outside the top 10 and Sweden one yet to go round the mark. So a really bad start for Vilma Bobek and Rebecca Netzler currently leading overall in this competition but with a lot of catching up to do well it's Granier and Rio with the Red Jenica that's currently leading for France chased by Echegoyen and Barcelo on the starboard tack. On a day like today you can see there's a lot of like stronger wings coming from behind and once you're in the top uh, going downwind you obviously it's nice to be in the front but then from it's a problematic because from the back the wind comes from behind so everyone else will get the wind before you uh, so I think we will see a lot of speed differences in this race especially now where you could see in the previous screen how the wind is approaching a uh, stronger wind from behind. Um, so Stevie, we've seen some going for the jibe set. Is, is that uh, uh, tactical reasons or it, is it sometimes desperation because you're, f you're further back? I think if you're at the back of the pack and you do it, it's often a desperation move. But I think what we saw on that first upwind was actually the race course is pretty open. No, no one side, the, the leading boat came from the left, some boats in the top four or five came from the right, and there was only a matter of 15 seconds in it. So it's a pretty open course. We can see how gusty and shifty it is. So a lot depends on what the wind you've got at that top mark. I think it's often safer to go for the straight set because you're likely to be in clear wind, whereas for the 
for the Dutch girls. They've jibed through a lot of dirty wind. But if when they got there, there was a right shift in a gust and it was absolutely the right move. She's not known for uh, sitting on the fence, Adil. She uh, tends to make a brave decision. She tends to be aggressive um, and, and that's done her proud. So she will have backed herself. And I like seeing someone that's willing to back themselves. But yeah, no surprise to see the leader go straight as they'd come from the left. But it is an open racetrack, which is which is great news for the Swedish because they've got a lot of work to do to work their way back up the fleet. That's very true. And yesterday, Bobek and Netzler were very keen on the jibe set manoeuvre. Even when they were third going around the Wimbledon mark for the final time yesterday afternoon, they went for the jibe set. I, I wondered whether it was the right call for them, but, but they made it work and they ended up just getting ahead of the young German team to win that race. Um, and uh, uh, Bobek told me afterwards that the, the jibe set had worked six out of eight times yesterday obviously different day to day the patterns change uh but it but it has been a winning move so um yeah interesting to see how much that's being used already now we can see that there was there's way more breeze down when the boats come down towards the bottom bottom mark uh it looks actually pretty glorious and you can also see the swell here on the screen that they can actually surf on the swell you see the the french team now surf with the orange spinnaker, uh, they're surfing as well, and I think they get a lot of advantage from that. It must be absolutely glorious. It, it, it's like um, King Neptune is shaking this blue rug, and and uh, if, you can <laughs> if you can just catch the, the right side of, of the ruffle of the rug, it, it gives you an extra few knots of speed. And, and then if you're the wrong side of it, well, on a 49er FX in these conditions, you still go fast enough to climb up the little hill and, and get down the other side. But you get these surges of acceleration and deceleration, which makes it much harder to judge on a port starboard cross whether you're actually going to get safely across. So um, there, there's, there's so much moving underneath these boats all the time. And that's the fun thing about sailing is you've got it's so multidimensional. I think um, I think if I was after my Greek dogs, I'd be a bit more focused on Zephyrus today, though, uh, Andy, because I think the wind is going to be a little bit more important than the swell out there. Um, it's finding these patches of breeze is going to be fairly definitive. And, and it'll be interesting when we look as the boats come back together. This bottom gate is absolutely crucial. Now, if you're in the lead, you're going to get a first look at it. You're going to get a chance to take a little breath, have a look upwind and say, where's the next gust of breeze? But if you're in the pack, it's how do I get in and out of here as quick as possible? Because it's basically a parking lot, a rush hour coming up here. And the camera angle at the minute looks to me like the jibe setters have done pretty well. Be interesting when they come back together. But they've got the right of way, those boats towards the right hand side of our screen. And the French, it doesn't look good for them at the minute. They look like those boats that jibe set have found more breeze. It does look, but when the French are approaching from the left side of the course, they're going to have advantage of mark space. If we're that close to the mark, though, I'm not sure. Yeah, there, now we can see the marks, the bottom marks on the right side of the screen. And yeah, as you said, Stevie, they're a bit late, actually. It, they, it just it took them way longer to get to the bottom mark. Uh, so the jibe setters did a good job here. It is a massive loss for the French on the left. They're just getting their Jenica down now. I think they've overlaid, actually. They, did. they, they seem to be getting their Jenicas down way early. So I think Brazil and France have misjudged their ley line. And that's been an absolute... Oh, who's Ooh, in the water on, there? <laughs> Stevie, what happened there? Oh, no, that's a big mistake coming in at the lured mark. You get slow, the boat loads up a bit. I think that's Joe Allais, the Kiwis. Not 100% sure we'll get a confirmation on that, but disaster for them. Simple boat handling error got tied up in this swell. You get slow at the bottom and the load comes into the boat and things get hairy. We can see there was this big gust coming in and it like messed up everything. And now it's like full on rush hour at the bottom mark gate. And people are not even... Like, even though it would be better for them to do a jibe and go around the mark, on the, go around the left bottom mark, they all chose to take the easier way and to keep the speed. Some really funky stuff has certainly happened because I've seen Sweden one, bearing in mind how far back they were. They've actually gone round the bottom of the course sooner than Spain 23, who were pretty much vying for the lead round the top mark. So uh, Barcelona and Eschelgoyen had an absolute disaster of a run. I'm not quite sure what happened to them. 
Uh, but meanwhile, Sweden, as, as we partially predicted, they, they, they had some catch-up opportunities. And the way this race course is going with Neptune and Zephyros having their input, I mean, there are many opportunities <laughs> for, for comeback. And the Swedes are taking full advantage of it in, in middle of our picture there, actually. Looking at the tracking, yeah, we the now Swedish have... Sorry, we now have the, actually, the, oh yeah, here we're going to have the live results. There we are, call, call it for us. Yes, so. we have the Germans, uh, Netherlands, Australia, GBR and French. Oh, it keeps on changing a bit, Brazilians even squeezed in. I'm surprised though, coming into the bottom mark, it looked like some of the teams like Brazilians were really far down and the French, but they're now back up in the top, top five boats. Top six boats. Yeah, a lot changed. I mean, we, we could. It would be lovely to to look back at that whole lure mark rounding in a little bit more detail after this after this race is finished. Um, but there were big moving opportunities, Stevie. It it, it is always a, a traffic jam down there, and it looks like Sweden managed to uh, to to nip round the uh, the wrong way down a one way street. Well, and I think what it highlights, Andy, which is such a great lesson for, for any youngsters watching today, is the simple things matter. So the French and the Spanish missed the ley line. They completely misjudged it. They sailed probably an extra 150, 200 metres. Now, yeah, OK, we can say it's gusty, it's shifty. That's fine. It is. It's not easy. No one's saying it's easy out there. But the ley lines are the ley lines. And you've got to be accurate when you're sailing around these courses. We can try and be clever. But if we get the basics wrong, things happen here. As we come back to a bit of a replay, we can see the Dutch girls here. They managed to go left and right. But New Zealand, Joa Lea, are tricky. She's had to do a double jibe at the bottom of the course here. So jibe, then as she goes for the second jibe, just got really slow and a lot of load coming in there. Didn't execute the manoeuvre well. They'll be disappointed with that. But yeah, bottom marks, it gets really, really busy. But a lot of teams wasted a lot of distance sailing up over ley lines. Simple mistakes. And the Swedish got those basics right. And they've made a huge gain back through the fleet. And that'll be worrying for their rivals how quickly they're able to chomp back through. Yeah, looking back at the downwind we had, I would have definitely kept my eyes out and like looked back and what gusts are coming and not going too close to the ley lines because you never know what's happening and you want to, you know, keep more space and opportunities for yourself if there's a gust or a shift. So leave a little bit of ley line in the bank is what we're talking about, both going upwind and downwind. Um, but what I'm hearing about these kites, certainly in the 49er men, I don't know if it's the same for the FX women, the, these kites are flat. They're designed to go um, for speed and that doesn't give you a lot of um, variability in, in, in the angle. There, there is a certain angle these kites like to be sailed at downwind and if the gust hits or if a shift hits or, or both hit at the same time, then suddenly you're, you're, you're on an angle way below where your original ley line was. So it, it seems like um, we've got to leave a bit in the bank in, on this variable race course. Do you think that's the, the lesson we're learning? Yeah, that's the lesson, especially today with these uh, weather conditions. So, Stevie, we see the Australians doing very well front of picture, and it looks like they're coming back on the Dutch. I thought the Dutch were in a bit of a higher angle for a bit. They're actually, the Dutch tack away now. Um, what, uh, what do you make of the, the relative tactics of Australia and the Netherlands? Well, I think they both, the Australian got the first pick at the bottom gate, took the right turn and Netherlands took the left turn to be clear and then tacked pretty early on to follow them. So I think they'll all be trying to stay in phase with the shift early on in the leg to make sure they're setting up well. But a little bit, Nora made a great point earlier that there's often a little bit more wind at the bottom of the course. So I think the crews will be make that decision early and then stretch out. But right now, what I was surprised about was the Australian boat didn't tack with the Dutch. And we can see the Dutch heading back across towards the top right. And that last camera angle from the, from the drone looked like there was plenty of breeze coming out of that Marina Rubicon area where uh, the 49er fleet will be getting ready for racing. And these Dutch girls, they don't tend to, to make a lot of mistakes tactically. So I quite like where they're positioning themselves, dragging themselves back towards the middle of the race course. And it looked like back towards good pressure. Australia, well, they're perhaps rolling the dice, but they picked it well on the first upwind leg. And meanwhile, Sweden, if you bear in mind that they were 19th around the top market and now they are vying for the, the, the top three or four spots in this race, that, that run they executed absolutely brilliantly. And it, it goes to show what opportunities there are in this race course. Yeah, and like even looking at the starting, like I think 
whatever happened in the start feels like it's so last year, miles ago. It does, doesn't <laughs> it? it, it, it the, the start, we, we always love to get a good start, but as, as you said earlier, Nora, it's, it's not the be-all and end-all on such a, a variable race course. There, there are some race courses where um, you absolutely need to nail the start because there's not many passing lanes. Well, we're seeing so many passing lanes here. And I would say, Stevie, quite a difficult race to defend. Yeah, I think you've got to sell your own race. It's a head out the boat day, so it'll really benefit those crews where where the you know the helm's got a fairly clear defined role for looking out, looking for pressure. The crews are going to be driving the boat for boat speed, trying to keep things going fast out there on board. And I think it is you've got to sell what you're in at the time, and that's what the Dutch did fantastically at the top of that last leg. They made a bold decision. They jibe set from the top five right through the middle of the fleet. And uh, and right now, again, the Dutch still quite nicely positioned, but they're going to need to tack fairly soon or they're going to sail all the way through that gust, I'd say, right now. And it's going to be tight when we get into the top. No doubt about that. There go the Dutch. They tack in under the fleet here and we can see they're well positioned last tack. They've got no more manoeuvres to do before the windward mark here. And it's going to be interesting who's gained out of them and the Australians. I'm really surprised the, the Germans, German 55, came all the way from basically the right and just suddenly now they're in the top. I didn't, I didn't see them coming from there, actually. No. They did a long ley line on starboard. So, so the Germans are slightly over ley line, is that what we think, on the, coming in from starboard? Um, and then just tacking underneath them, as you said, Stevie, it was, it was the Dutch, Netherlands too. So it, it does look like... Uh, Netherlands holds the lead with, with Germany 55, not too far behind. Um, and uh, G Great Britain also with a, with a pretty good upwind leg here. I'm just trying to work out where the Swedes are. Anyone see the Swedes? Oh, there they are. Just left a picture, just going out of picture. So, so the Swedes actually have dropped back a little bit from where they were, but they're, they're inside the top 10. And now we see the, the US girl, Rubble and Shays also. They climbed up to the top. They were 14 in the first top mark, and then they did a good bottom mark rounding. They were fourth, and now currently they're on sitting on third. So look at this decision to go straight for the jibe set. Obviously, whatever worked for, for them on the upwind, on the right-hand side of the course, the Dutch very much wanted to enjoy the, that same breeze. They've, they've gone for the, for the unusual decision to go for the early jibe set, and they've been followed by Germany. And it looks like most of the fleet is going to go for that option. Yeah, I think what we saw, Andy, there was at the top of the course, we had a big right shift. And if you've got a big right shift coming in at the top of the mark, you want to jibe set and get early on it. So again, it's just another example of a deal doing a good job of backing herself to sail what she's in at the time. She's done a fairly simple job of trying to stay on the lifted tack as much as possible and uh, and sail towards pressure so yeah whilst the jive set can often be risky it's shifty really shifty conditions out here and she's just put herself on well downwind you want to be on the headed jibe so she's put herself gone from a lift upwind jibe set straight into that good right hand pressure and it'd be surprising to see her make a loss from here but it's definitely been a pretty up and down racetrack can we enjoy, take a moment to enjoy these amazing camera, camera angles or the drone videos? Uh, it looks so nice. Honestly, I wish I would be on the boat. Like, that it just looks dreamy. Which boat would you like to be on right now, Nora? Uh, I'd, uh, on the Dutch boat. <laughs> <laughs> the one we see here in the front. <laughs> yeah. Where all the all black sails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, they, they are such an amazing team, these two. And they are always having fun even when they've had a bad day they seem like they're having fun a deal van anhalt and annette dutz um such a solid team they carried an injury last year in the world so we didn't see the best of them and even then they managed to f finish second in the world championship so uh, one of the favorites for a medal at, at paris 2024 this year um, and and maybe possibly the best all-round team because the the swedish won um in predominantly strong wins in the hague last year now that they're not slow in any conditions but I, I wonder if the Dutch are slightly more the uh, the better all-round team bet between the, the Dutch and the Swedes. I understood the Swedes are speed-wise, they have their own game, kind of. like they That's their advantage. And I think the Dutch are maybe, let's say, a bit stronger in the tactical and strategical side, uh, just the sailing part. But I think that will, will play, the, yeah, depending on the conditions and... Uh, yeah, how well they play the course. 
Stevie, if you if you had to choose uh, going being fast or being smart, which would you choose? I'd choose being fast personally because you don't have to be very smart if you're faster than everyone else to to deal with it. Um, I think a race course like today where it's a bit gusty and shifty probably it's not a bad thing to be smart but overall i think let's uh if i've got the boat speed in there then it shouldn't take much to uh, be able to just follow them and overtake them when you need to yeah and that's what i heard from uh speaking with the teams now these like let's say the new sails with the black sails we used to have the see-through sails and now we had these for uh a year uh, no about two, two about two years now yeah and they just like the sails provide a bit more power to the boat, so we can definitely see that the bigger teams are fast, w faster, and that's a nice advantage to have. I would agree with Stevie, I'd prefer to be fast, because then you don't really have to solve too many problems, because if you're fast, you're in the front. I'm a little bit concerned that the Germans are going faster than the Dutch. I'm wondering if the Dutch have overstood the ley line, uh, the Germans went for a slightly earlier jai point, and have the Dutch made the, the mistake we've been talking about, which is going to ley line too early? Will the Dutch be able to hold on, or will the Germans be able to roll them? I think that there is a bit of a battle developing here, but we've only got a couple of hundred metres, if that, towards the finish. Yeah, you're absolutely looks... right, Andy. They definitely did overlay, but but right now they look like they're bow forward enough and we're just 50 metres to go. I think they've managed to nail it. So great work by the Dutch crew. And someone nipping in from the other end. So it, it is a race win to the Dutch, followed by the Germans. Germany, 55. And whoever came in from the other end, was that Robel and Shea from the USA, possibly? I think we'll see them just in a moment on the screen. But it looks like they just squeezed in. Yes, they're finishing there. So, very good sailing by the Americans as well. They've, they've struggled by their high standards. Uh, they, I think they got a bronze medal four years ago at this stage of the Olympic cycle. They, they've always been knocking on the door of greatness, um, but they've been struggling this week. Like Looking at the fleet now uh, from the drone videos, we can see that three first boats just finished. And look at the lead. Like, Where's the rest? Where, where's the racing? What's, what, what's it's happened? It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> wow. I mean, when you think that Harding and Wilmot from Australia were, were vying for the lead with the Dutch at, at the halfway point, it's almost that the Aussies had overtaken the Dutch halfway up that last beat. And then the Dutch uh, tacked away. They found something really good on, on the right. And, and the Aussies got a little bit left behind further to the left of that that uh, that leg but there's so many passing opportunities and losing opportunities on the upwinds and downwinds and that's great britain with the red jenica coming across in fifth um and it looks like uh we are well, that's the uh, the dutch with their with their coach and uh just replenishing with a with a bit of uh, liquid intake what what will they be um oh actually no let's call a few few more across the line we've got Who's this coming across the uh, line? The Bobic British, and Netzler? Uh, yeah, the British just crossed the li line. Uh, Flack and Tidy. And then the Swedish are coming in. I think they saved it. Wait, the Swedish? Yeah. It's still... No, actually. I'm so sorry. It's the wrong one. It's the Italians. Just finished. Uh, on Germania and Batuzzi. Yes, on 6th. And then the Swedish and the Germans are battling now. They still have to do a job. The Swedes are pushing it all the way to the... Just to the, to get into the to finish line, we can't see from this angle. I think the Germans finished just before the Swedes. Yeah, it looks like that. So the Swedes came back to I think maybe third or fourth at one point in the race, and and then they've slipped back to possibly seventh by crossing crossing the finish line just now. And Brazil also doing really well earlier on in the race, and a bit of a surprise, Stevie, to see. Brazil get up there and, and then let it slip again. We I, I tend to tend to think that uh, they're not one of the faster sailors, but they're one of the smarter ones. But it seems like uh, they didn't quite make sense of that race. I think you're right. I think you you know some days you can have a flow, and uh, you know some day you're a rooster and some day you're a feather duster. Some uh, famous sailor once said that I think out there, and and unfortunately it, yeah you get out of phase with things. We see here 
Helen and Marie, the Norwegian crew, I mean, they're coming across the line. European champions, but struggling clearly here in Lanzarote for whatever reasons. Tamara coming across the line way at the back of the pack. And you compare to someone like Tamara, who went round the woman mark second uh, and has come in and finished back in 18th to the Italians, Germani and Batuzzi, 21st they were at the bottom gate and they pulled their way back up to sixth. You know, so that's a 15-point gain for them, huge in the context of the regatta. Um, and, you know, for, for the race winners, well, they sailed a very consistent race, kept themselves in it the whole way round. I think what was nice, what would be nice if you were sat in the coach boat with the Dutch now, is the fact that they didn't do anything special. They kept themselves, they started relatively up the line, which meant you had the opportunity to take the first shift when you wanted to, stayed quite near the middle of the course. So with about a third of the upwind leg left to do, they could make a positive decision. Is the next gust coming from the right or the left? And we're going to attack that last third of the beat. And they just sailed solid, trusted their compass numbers and uh, and did the simple things well. Yes, they were slightly over ley line on that last downwind, but my guess is they probably matched jibes with the Germans. So were maybe a little bit more in control than, uh, than perhaps we thought saw. And really good sailing for Marla Bergman and Hannah Wiel from Germany. Bear in mind that uh, despite getting, I think it was a silver medal uh, for Germany in the FX in in Rio and, and also getting a bronze in the 49er, um, Germany, a great powerhouse of Olympic skiff racing, hasn't yet qualified a spot in either the men's or the women's skiff competition for Paris 2024. So, so while there's a trial going on to work out who's going to be top German, they've also got to try and actually grab the spot, which comes up. The last opportunity is in here at Semen Olympic Francaise at the end of April when they, those are the, the last few spots available and Germany has yet to get one in men or women. Okay, so I understand we may be going to an interview on the water. Let's see if we can go across to them now. And hi, it so we like got a deal. A deal. Can you hear us? A deal. Like them breathing. <laughs> Not sure if a deal can hear us. Hi, a deal. Can you hear me? It's Andy. Hi, deal. Okay. Not to worry, not to worry. So we were, we're hoping to get a, 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 our race winners, Adil and Annette, on the line. Maybe we'll be able to get back to um, some of the interviews a little bit later on. Um, Nora. But I'd like to say, uh, especially as you, you mentioned earlier, the Dutch, uh, I love it. They're always so happy and like ease, in ease somehow. I saw their coach and he just like, let, yeah, helped me out and just like really just happy and seeing, look, look yeah saying hi to everyone and just have a good flow. Very, very different atmosphere going from uh, from team to team, Stevie. Uh, and especially when you get to the Olympic Games as well. But let's just analyse this start. I, I saw a really good start from Malta coming out the middle of the line. And anything you want to observe, Stevie? Well, no, I just think the Australians up here, I think that position is something to look for, for for the day, really. That top third of the line on starboard tack, I think just gives you good opportunities there. A lot of the boats, I mean, the, you know, the, the level of the fleet's fantastic, as we'd expect, really. But when you see this camera angle looking over the whole racetrack, we can see that there's you've got a lot of changing dynamics. If those gusts come down and you're not in a position to take advantage of that, it's going to make it hard. So I think where the Australians started was a really nice, safe position. They did a fantastic job with their trigger. But yeah. It ain't all over till the fat lady th sings would be the other thing to note because when you see the boats that went round first, second and third, they were absolutely nowhere when it came to the finish. So you've got to keep your head in the game. You've got to sail positively. You've got to sail aggressively. And, uh, and the Australians did that. The Dutch did that. They put in a good performance. And then, yeah, if you are in the back of the pack, like the German, Germany and Putuzzi, the Italians were, there's opportunity to get through the fleet. But I'd still rather get to win with Mark first and, uh, and be making my choices from there. Nora, you've got some interesting stats in front of you. I'd be interested to know um, who who did well, who did badly, what, what Stevie and I would call the snakes and ladders of of the competition, and who managed to more or less be consistent. Wow, well, okay. That's a, yeah, you, as we saw this, a lot of people were climbing and falling, and like it, everything happened. Like the Kiwis, for example, capsized in the bottom mark, and that was brutal for them. Uh, but let's say I was actually looking at the Malta because they did a good start, as you said, but uh, they were around the 20, 20, 
22 positions, and then they finished 11th. So I was very surprised. I'm good to, happy to see them around and have like more like new countries and different countries than the big power powerhouses we have. <laughs> uh, but let's say I could say the most consistent was the Australians, Harding and Wilmot. They were four one four four in all the laps or in the mark roundings, and yeah. that's the most consistent of the whole race. If looking at everyone else had like fourteen four, you know, nineteen eight twenty one, like these crazy positions just kept on changing, and no one had a good series like them. And, and the top three are, are really interesting, aren't they? So just just give us the stats on the top three and 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 where yes. they started with the first mark rounding and where they ended up. So uh, the yeah, yeah, okay. So the Dutch were actually around, they were eighth on the first mark rounding, and after that they were second and first first, so that was pretty okay. Uh, the Germans came second, they started 11th on the first mark rounding, and then after that they were 3 2 2. Uh, the US girls, they were 14th in the first top mark. And after that, they were also 4-3-3, three, three, so they just kept staying in the top. And then we have Harding and Wilma, who were four in the top mark, in the first top mark, and then they had one four four. So they kept their lane, uh, kept the same position. Uh, and then we have f the fifth um, the British team. They were 13 in the top mark, and after that, 7-7-5. Seven, seven, so... Just overall, I can say the first top mark was tricky for all of the teams, the first teams, and then they climbed up slowly, step by step throughout the race. So we got just under four minutes until the start of the next race. Um, Stevie, what words, if any, would you be having with your sailors if you were the if you were the coach out there? Do you let them make their own conclusions, or, or do you pass information across to them? Uh, I always been pretty terrible at not having an opinion probably you shouldn't <laughs> you should probably talk talk through it a bit but I, I think i'd have an opinion it would just be interesting to discuss how they saw the race i think uh you know if, if you're coaching someone that's won the race it's maybe demonstrating some of the pitfalls of the boats that were leading like the french girls and the spanish doing the simple things well with the ley lines being accurate and for those crews that were in the pack it's perhaps clarifying the fact that it's not magic that's happening out there ultimately the leaders are managing to get themselves on the lifted tack as much as possible find the pressure when they can and try and keep themselves with opportunities as far up the course as possible don't get don't get too stuck in the corner early um so yeah let's start a leg on a lifted tack would probably be my uh, main point of advice start the leg on a lifted tack okay um, that that means getting getting the first shift right. So so most people are going to start on starboard because that that gives you the right of way. But we saw the Italians start on port underneath the fleet. Uh, Nora, what what are, what are your thoughts? Uh, my thought was as uh, a sailor, uh, I would say it's always fun to like. Of course, every sailor wants different uh, feedback from their coaches, but. Overall, we normally like, as Stevie said, just keeping it like simple, giving us like something to work on, you know, focus on, let's say, being on a lifting tack in the first uh, first leg. And that's why I'm like, okay, well, it keeps, it makes your like head, seem, everything a bit more simple. Because in your head as an athlete, you're going through all these things of like where you want to start, what's the, how was the last race, what do we want to focus on the next one? And just trying to like guide, guide through that helps a lot. And meanwhile, we see that big stack up at the committee boat end at the bottom of our picture. Seems like that's going to be the popular place for people to try and start. And that comes back to what Stevie said earlier in the build up to the first race is if you start at this end, you probably have a higher chance of being able to tack out and and get into phase with those shifts. So that's probably why we're seeing such a, a stack up at this end. Stevie, looking at bottom left, I see Denmark 10 is down there to windward of start line, um, to windward of the ley line for the start. Is, is that a cause for concern or do, do you think with a minute to go that things <laughs> shake out? Uh, 
uh, I think, you know, they'll they'll be making a judgment call of that. It's definitely a cause for concern because you've suddenly lost control of your environment. So unless they know that actually they're inside the ley line when the boats rotate a little bit, I think with the 49ers, the boat handling's got so good in the pre-start. They're all holding really high and close to the wind. We can see how close they are to the start line. They can all hold the boat really well. But yeah, your positioning really at two minutes is going to be quite definitive. So where we are now, we're just 44 seconds or so until the start. It's absolutely important that you're clear and interesting to see down at the bottom end here, Lara and Amelie Ryu, the French there, they led at the top mark last time and they're keen to be off the pin. What they're going to do from that position is they will be at full speed. That's for sure. They're going to have a clear lane, but wow, they need it to be good on the left by starting this far down the line. So that's a com commitment to going to the left of the French. And, and as Stevie says, they will be hoping that the, the first shift and the best breeze comes from the left-hand side. With five seconds to go, we're just about to get launched. Belgium pretty poked out. Will, will it be an even start? Very bad start for Norway. Norway looked like they held back. Did they think that others were starting too soon? We will have to wait and find out if anyone had broke the start line early and if they're going to be disqualified. But assuming that everyone started fairly, then those are fantastic starts for France 63 on the right and a really nice start for Belgium 4. And also looking good, Spain 73 further up the racetrack. And we see there's a couple of boats uh, that probably couldn't find the lane to to go with uh, near the committee boat on the right side. They have tacked away. Uh, let's see if that works. That worked from the, for the Australian team in the previous race. So it will be interesting to see. You have always like, you know, the second choice of like, if you can't keep your lane, at least you can tack away. Uh, absolutely. Um, we saw Malta get a great start in the previous race. They've got a great start in this race as well. One, one of the strongest starters. So Antonia and Victoria Schulteis, the, the sisters from the small island of, of Malta, they, they say they feel comfortable here being uh, living island life, it, albeit it's a different island um, and uh, not in the Mediterranean where they're from, but they, they seem to be pretty in tune with the conditions here. So sailors from a small nation doing really well and, and out punching the bigger sailing nations, certainly off the start line. Yeah, now we can see this, the, yeah, team, the fleet. It. Sorry, just go, Stevie. Oh, no, I was just going to say, as we see the fleet moving up here, they've done a great job. They're really tight tack by the French. Oh, that was pretty Ooh. punchy. But we saw the wind start to rotate to the left. So it's no surprise to see boats wanting to take attack across. There's already a big split in the two sides of the fleet. And again, I think once you get to this Gulf Fleet racing, you're going to find the fleet makes a little bit of a decision. Are we going to be towards the left side of the fleet or to the right side of the fleet? Because if you're getting bounced around too much, it can go hard. But to see the French there, it was an aggressive move, but they've got themselves onto the lifted tack. They're now heading across with the rest of the fleet. And I think it starts to play out. That aggressive move at the start did go well for the French. And how will they make it work further up the leg? And now Belgium has the freedom to tack away if it chooses to. But Belgium just sailing out the bottom of our screen. Just tacking now, actually. So consolidating what, what they've got. And it looks like in these early stages, Belgium is, is looking good on the left-hand side of the racetrack. So uh, great for, for those girls. Uh, Isura Mainholt and uh, Gertz sailing for Belgium. And I can't remember if they've qualified for the games yet or not. But they, they're pretty much the only team from Belgium to campaign the FX. China 121 also doing well. They were, that's uh, Hu and Shan who were leading for the first couple of days of the competition. We haven't had much to say about them so far today, but Chinese going well in these conditions. I think they tend to prefer the slightly lighter breezes and it, it looks a little bit softer at the moment, do you think, Nora? Yeah, it looks a bit softer, but there's, there's moments. And uh, so, yeah, if you can get everything out of the gust you get that's good but i would say overall it does look soft and stevie that possibly the uh, boats will have changed their rig settings maybe loosen the rigging put a bit more power back into the into the mast and and deepen up the sails uh, do you think there's there's enough reason to be changing setup today 
Uh, I think it'd be a really hard day setup wise. I think you're going to be constantly feeling compromised. I guess overall, you're probably going to choose to be setting yourself up a little bit more for the lulls than you are the gust. Because normally if you're in the gust, everything feels pretty good because you're gaining anyway. And when you're in a lull, it feels like the absolute end of the world. So you'd like the boat to feel a little bit better for you and a little bit more powered up under you. But that last camera angle we had, it showed just how gusty and shifty it is. And the Belgians there, you can see they just stayed a little bit long their first tack. So they've now had to tack back again. And I think they've lost some meters. Looks to me like you need to be relatively early on the shift today. You're slow with the shift. You're then behind because the breeze is moving quickly. So here we go. We've got more pressure coming down from the top right hand side of the course, but it is going to fill in fairly evenly over the racetrack. And I think that the whole fleet looks like it's all pretty much held together by a short piece of string at the moment. But yeah, early on the shift seems to be quite important. Otherwise, you're going to end up sailing back at people's transoms. Yeah, you see some of the teams here in the bottom right of the screen. They really taken a big risk of like going away from the pack because there's no control of whatsoever what can happen. Uh, but I guess it's the Polish actually Poland 14 going all the way there. We saw then on the opposite side of the course we have uh, the Chinese team went all the way to the left to together with uh, some of the the German teams. So I would say it's pretty risky i'd be way more in the middle where the pack is and just sail focus on the shift you have and do the best you can for yeah what you have at the moment so yeah we are talking about not getting out to the ley lines too early and keeping those tactical calls going so the the question is if that's what they should be doing why isn't it why is it that they're doing something different why is it that people are tempted out to the corners more than we're saying they ought to be Oh, 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 there is the question, Andy. Why is that? Well, I think because often you're compromised and, and you're trying to minimise. Every time they tack the boat, they're going to lose quite a lot of distance in these conditions. And especially if you end up having to do that in a lull, that's going to be a huge loss. So firstly, can we manoeuvre while we're in pressure? And, and they're always you've always got that way up of, you know, how many manoeuvres am I doing here versus trying to keep it a bit more simple and, and get going. But yeah, I mean, I think ultimately people get desperate. This is a world championship. This matters. It's nerves on the line here. And they think they see something. They hope they have, you know, uh, I think it was Ken Reed for North Sales got the great line of, you know, hope is not a good strategy. And I, and I think some people do get drawn into that. As soon as you're back in the pack, it's all very well to say you've got to sail on the lifted tack. But if sailing on the lifted tack means sailing in dirty breeze, well, that's a lot less appealing. So for these boats on the front row, we can see here, New Zealand, we can see the Dutch again, some German crews, and the, uh, you know, are, are up in that front position, Grail and Kunz back up there as well. They're able to make those decisions that we're talking about, all these basics that we talk about. But as soon as you're in the boats towards the left-hand side of our screen, compromise. So then, yeah, you're clutching at straws a little bit, and clutching at straws is never great. Uh, yeah, as you said, it's the World Championships and today is the, well, the first day of the Gulf Fleet Racing. So I think depending on your trials or what these worlds mean to you, uh, how well you're doing currently overall, you want to go into maybe a different kind of strategy. Some might be, you know, taking it more safe and conservative today if they're happy where they are and try and go with that. And some are like, okay, let's do risky things. Let's bang the right side. <laughs> See if we find something from there, some wind and go from there. So we never know what's going through in their head because everyone have their own, you know, background and goals. Yeah, I, I I think I feel like it's still too early in the competition to be starting to gamble but there, there i guess there's a point in every race and uh, and every championship where things do get desperate enough that gambling becomes the sensible decision because it's it's pretty much the the last throw of the dice but but surely at just the just past the halfway stage of this competition the, these sailors even the ones down at 20th to 25th in the overall standings have to be thinking um of sailing sensibly and letting other people lose their heads now we can see on the screen, we see the French team, they've been pretty much staying on this same port tack for a very long time. They kept it simple and it, they actually have nailed, it looks it, like. It looks like they're in twice <laughs> as much breeze as anybody else yeah. from that. It looks like everyone else is sitting in the boat absolutely parked up. So um, what, what did you make of that, Stevie? 
Well, yeah, I think I think uh, you, you know you made a really good point. Is is you've got to keep yourself in the race. I mean, what we saw from that first race is this: absolutely, the race is not over until the fat lady sings, and and the final whistle is a long way away here. Of course, they've now led at the top mark twice in a row. Hopefully, they're going to be able to do a better job of keeping that together. But that is a massive lead, and they yeah Incredible. they they made a confident decision at the start. They've got a clear strategy. They like what they saw on the left. Seem punchy to me to be that brave, but they've got it absolutely right. So hats off to them. Great job. But if you're back in the pack, it's all about minimising metres because, again, a lead like that's fantastic. And if they get go on to take the race win, then that's brilliant. But how much risk did they dial in to get that race win? Whereas what I would be wanting on a day like today is consistency. Chip away. Let's not get a big score if we can because there's a lot of golf left in this hole. Plenty more racing to be done over the weekend. And we see so many boats front of picture breaking our golden rule of sailing over the ley line, but they don't care because they're in breeze as they tack around the mark and the boats on the right-hand side or the left as we see them on, on this screen, well, they're picking up some breeze now, but you look at the boats in the middle of picture and they're really struggling to find any kind of breeze so that the patches of breeze are very localised. And, and Stevie, I, I don't know, like you, whether whether the French at the front of this fleet have been lucky or, or whether that was by design. But what I did like about what they did was they, they saw a shift, they wanted to tack and they were prepared to duck a couple of transoms to do that. Right, so you nailed it there. Yeah, they were so aggressive with that first decision and, and it just looks like they've got, a, they've got a strategy. Let's tack when the when the boat heads and let's be aggressive about it let's be early on the shift and then they've taken further up the course they've thought right we've got a third of the leg to go let's make a big move out towards the left they did that they're just sailing positively and they're sailing their own race as we see a lot of the boats back in the pack now the winds clearly come back in from the right now as we can see everyone jive setting that could make it hard for the french because the breeze they went round in was for a straight set but hopefully a big enough lead for them as we see the Sweden and the Swedish and the Dutch are back in the pack. What are they going to be able to do from here? But they're already all jibe setting and we can see just how shifty it is. Well, we got a great shot there with the Dutch on the far left who did a beautiful jibe set so close to the windward mark and then top right a picture Way in the far distance, you can see that red Jenica. So that is the French. And so, yes, they did do a straight set, but they jibed relatively soon afterwards. And the rest of the fleet that did the straight jibe set are more or less falling into line behind the French leaders. So it still looks... Well, actually, I, I don't know if that is correct. Maybe Great Britain has moved into the lead. So it, I may be looking at the wrong red Jenica because I think both of the... It could be the French are the other red Jenica. So we've got two red Jenicas and possibly it's um, uh, two, two sailors that you've coached, black and tidy, that might be in the lead now, Stevie. Well, they've done the... Yeah, it looks certainly on the tracker, that's what it's showing as. A, and again, that's one of the advantages if you do do come round and the breeze is just about to change. You've got that pick of it. Freya's not afraid to make a positive decision herself. So, so that will have been a nice move if they have it. And sometimes being that far out in front can give you a hard, tricky decision to make. But I think, you know... They'll be happy on board the French boat to stick to their strategy if they can get themselves back across it. But yeah, it just highlights how this race is never over. So keep yourself in it. Don't play all your chips too soon because if you can stay tight, there's a lot of opportunity to make some gains. It looks like the, um, actually the Danish that are currently third, uh, they went a bit further, continued going downwind and didn't do the jibe set. So they're approaching more from the left side of the course and trying to like challenge the French who who were winning actually I think they had even 200 meters of lead in just when they went around the top mark but now it looks like they lost a lot of um a lot of distance on this downwind uh, the for the French have lost a lot of distance yeah yeah they had yeah. a bigger lead okay well Someone out there, um, it, it, uh, it's quite difficult to match up the tracking sometimes with what we're seeing in the picture, but, but someone looks like they've got an enormous lead way out there. And just trying to home in on, on who this is. Stevie, any clues as to who we're looking at there? Is that the, that's the French there, isn't it? That's the French. That is the French, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, it's going to be interesting how they manage to piece together the bottom of this downwind leg. They look quite nicely positioned at the moment, but it's so gusty 
that actually getting an accurate ley line is going to be not super easy. But if you miss the ley line from close, so I've not got such a problem with that, just a little one. It's when you put yourself on the ley line a long, long way out on the leg. That's where you've got the opportunity to lose meters and meters here as we go. And I think perhaps the problem we're having is a bit of a dip out on our tracker at the moment, Ricey is making the French not show up as we can see them coming downwind towards us. But it's light. Look, there's only one on the trapeze there. It's definitely getting pretty light at the bottom of the course. When you are in a lull, you're going an awful lot slower than those other boats. So the distance can change massively here. The angles are going to be really hard to sail and it's a technique change. Here we go. Perhaps no surprise to see the French setting up to turn towards the right hand side of the course. They've come down in right hand pressure. And they're still in the lead. Nice job on that downwind. French fans at home will be able to relax a little bit here. But for Laura Granier, Amélie Rieu, of course, the chance to have a home Olympics must be such a huge honour and opportunity, but also um, a real pressure. So they'll be wanting to make this rake stick to making that happen. Good rounding, nice and tidy. But look, they're crouching on the wire here. It's now a case of getting the boat flat, fast. And in fact, no, they've obviously decided the wind shifted to the right. Early tack and get themselves moving up the fleet. But it looked pretty calm. That was a nice, smooth set of footsteps across the boat there. Nothing too rushed. And again, we can see it's really light, really tricky conditions. Get the boat flat. Try and get in sync. Good range of knee movement for Amelie Ryu, the crew there, to make sure she can keep the boat fast and flat. Yeah, talking about if I would like to be in the boat, uh, it, it looked tricky. That bottom mark rounding and the tack and everything was light wind. But now they got going, so it looks better. But uh, looking at the boat, you see the, the Danish just in a picture and then GBR. It's not easy to get around, go around those bottom marks. You'd think there's more wind, but it, it yeah, it's not that much. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. What? That's Ooh. not a great <laughs> rounding. I, I, I don't know what Saskia had to do in the middle of the boat, but without Saskia, I mean, she's very much the bigger of those two sailors. So Freya by herself doesn't amount to a lot of writing moments. She really needs Saskia out on the, on the rack as well. And I don't know if she was still putting the kite away, but that was a bit of a giveaway by Great Britain there. Yeah, it could be it got stuck yeah, or something. Yeah, she just turned up a fraction, turned up a fraction early there. And uh, Chris Draper pretty well-known 49er sailor. He, he likes to call them tiny and tidy, uh, actually. So uh, <laughs> Freya at the back is uh, is pretty pretty tiny. Um, but I think, yeah, she got a little bit greedy, turned up a fraction early for the mark there. And, and again, few metres gone. It's those sort of controllable things. It's very, very hard to guarantee the metres, but can we sail accurately? I thought the French did a nice job of the rounding. And there you go again. They're not really looking back. They're sailing the breeze that they're in. And what a beautiful sight that is for the French crew at the moment. Big, big lead. And uh, they obviously feel like they've got a decent bit of pressure to start heading back across. That's an absolutely monster lead for them. Uh, Granier and Ryu, the French team, started the day in 20 seconds. So they, they only just got into gold fleet but they're absolutely dominating this race right now and um, with a, a race finish like this you wonder how far that's going to lift them up the rankings it should, should certainly lift them up into the teens and 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 maybe start knocking on the door of the top 10 so breakout performances like this can transform your championship yeah and that's what we could see i think they did the attack to kind of consolidate and like stay on top of the fleet not just going alone to one corner, more like yeah, being in front of them because as we've seen, anything can happen in this race. Uh, so they really, they have a good lead though. That is They're going to be calm. <laughs> that is a lovely lead. And um, when you haven't got any other boats to, to gauge off, I'm thinking that the compass, looking at the compass, looking at the numbers to, to help tell you whether you're on the lifted shift or the headed shift, that's that's got to get more and more important, I would imagine, Stevie. I think it's pretty pretty crucial. I think the shifts today are, are really quite big. So I think if I'm stood at the back of the boat making the decisions, my biggest thing is, am I sailing towards pressure? Am I in pressure? So I'm going to be looking for those darker patches. And then from that, the shift is probably secondary and, and then will dictate. I think you're, you're assuming that the wind's going to be shifting left and then right. So uh, ultimately, if you put yourself on a lifted tack early on on the leg, your light, chances are it's going to come back at some point up there. So my priority is getting the head out, look for the pressure on the race course. And if I'm in pressure, well, then I've got options. If you're in no wind, it doesn't matter if you're almost pointing straight at the mark in no wind because you're going to be going so slow. So if I can be in pressure, that's my priority. And I think that's why on the upwind leg, 
I'm a little bit less worried about the boats if they do go over the ley line. Because if they are going over the ley line to get breeze, they're going to go an awful lot quicker uh, and make that happen. It's downwind when you miss the ley lines that you can hemorrhage massive amounts of distance because you have to drop the Jenica earlier. Yeah, that's very true. And we've seen that today in the, the first race. Uh, but it does seem like the breeze has dropped off quite a bit compared with the conditions that we had in race one. But now the French fully stretched. Looks like the boat's beginning to plane up wind again and some good white wakes coming off the back of the boats that we can see from this picture as well. Yeah, so going through of who's, who's where, uh, it looks like, well, we have the French in the lead. Uh, then I'd say actually Malta looks like they're really close. Belgium, Malta and Denmark and GBR is one of the top boats now. They're a bit split with like Let's say Belgians are all the way to the left, uh, and then we have GBR, Malta, Denmark, more to the right of the race course. So it will be really interesting to see who's coming better. But looking at the tracker, uh, the Belgians have a bit more speed, so maybe they have more wind. They're around 9.5 knots, and uh, GBR is like 8, 7 right now on the right side of the course. It's interesting that you highlight Belgium and Malta and then you put them together with France as well. And, and all of those three teams came off our end of the start line, sort of middle to pin end of the line. So all that battle for the committee boat end and all that congestion up there, actually the front three or three out of the, the front four came off the middle to left-hand end of the line. And I guess, Stevie, that's because the, the first shift came from the left. I think they must have started in a right shift, yeah. And then the first shift to come in was that lefty. The French, we saw, were really aggressive with that first tack, got themselves on it. But yeah, I think it is. It's positioning yourself with an opportunity to take to take that first shift. I think as the breeze, the, the land's heating up. Lanzarote's getting hotter right now. So as the wind's coming over Lanzarote at the moment, it's going to be getting more turbulent. We're going to be getting more mixing. So bigger lulls, possibly bigger gusts. Um, certainly some of the gusts do look quite different, but do look quite decent. They look quite big, but the lulls are really quite big now. And I think as that wind starts to mix and get more unstable, it just gets harder to, to read things and it makes bigger changes happen out there. So really, I think positive decisions are the key. And yeah, I guess the boats at the top of the line, then when there's that much of a bundle and that much of a fight for it, they just all ended up sailing a little bit slow early on in the leg and the French and, uh, and the Maltese and, and the Belgians just got their he hammer down and, and started to go for it. Um, Nora, what, what are you seeing in terms of who's made gains since the beginning of the race? We, we saw massive gains and losses in race one. Is it, is it more stable and consistent in this one? I would say it's more stable and consistent, yeah. Um, I unfortunately can't see the French in the tracking right now, but the Belgian, GBR and Bra Belgian and GBR have been stable. They'd be like fourth in the top first top mark, second kept the position pretty much all the way. Uh, then we have the, actually the Australians were pretty deep in the beginning. They were 17 in the first top mark, but now they're up to second place. And we saw them doing well last race. So I think they they might like this these conditions. Yeah, okay. So. So, so the Australians, like you said earlier, Stevie, maybe it's a little bit like Sydney Harbour, these kind of conditions, um, very unpredictable, got a got to sail with very variable gusts and lulls and, and shifts all over the place. Maybe that's making them feel relatively comfortable. But there's also that big swell going on underneath them as well, which you wouldn't get in Sydney Harbour, but you could get out in, in Sydney Heads, I suppose. But... Um, you know, that, that, that factor of, of sailing in swell probably affects the way that you set up the boat, do you think? I think getting in tune with the swell is really hard. Certainly sailing on port tack uh, with the swell underneath you. So at the moment, the, the French crew here are sailing pretty much straight into the swell. I don't think that's too hard. The hard bit about that is just having the boat nicely set up and reacting well to the to the gusts and lulls as they come but they should be able to do we still look at that boom movement there amelie some really accurate sharp movements there and lara um she's doing a lot of steering as well so that's just a basic technique thing to try and keep the boat flat i think uh you know it's obviously not easy conditions they're relatively jerky with their movements on that i wonder if they could smooth that out but certainly when you're on port tack and you've got the swell rolling over your left-hand shoulder. The boat's going to be powering up and depowering a lot. 
that's going to be really, really hard. But I think ultimately, if you can put yourself in a gust, the boat's going to be feeling so good and the gain's going to be good. We've got a tight moment here. The French and the Belgians right away with France. Belgium, I don't know if they'll try and tack underneath. No, I think that's a good decision. Keep it simple. It's tack coming soon for the Belgians and they're going to be right on the French hammer as we head off downwind. Uh, so it's really, really tight in there. And we can see our trackers changing all the time. In this gusty wind, the, uh, the, the, the leaderboard is changing an awful lot. So it's the mark roundings that count. French are going to go round in first. But the Belgians, they've sailed a good upwind leg there. Yeah, the Belgian picked up a lot of uh, the distance to the French. It looked for a long time that the French were very alone uh, in the lead, but now they have someone to actually like keep behind and compete with. Uh, it's so cool of the French to yeah, be in the top there. They've been doing well the whole race, but just now they're like even closer. Maybe they got a bit better shifts or then speed-wise picked, well, picked it, up. It, yeah, Azura, Mohnhal and Anouk Gertz, they must have made up 200 metres or so. I mean, they, they weren't in the top three round the round the bottom mark. I, I, I don't know where they've come. To, yeah, they were fourth round the, the, the bottom mark. Now we can see the French are doing a, a normal set, not the jibe set, as many were doing jibe sets in the begin, the first, around the first top mark. Uh, so it's interesting to see, I think... That it's more like more wind on the left side, but now, wow, <laughs> look at this view. We see a lot of gusts kind of coming in, but they're moving super slow. Like, you can see them up there, but they're not really uh, they're approaching so slow, the gusts. Those gusts look enormous, just 100 metres away from where this wind would mark is, so it's, it's not doing these teams any good at the moment, but they must be looking up there thinking, oh, if only that gust could just come down a little bit further. Uh, especially going downwind when you're going like away from it and it's approaching super slowly. Then you're like, oh, come on. <laughs> doing, come on they'd be doing nuclear speed if that if that breeze and that gust does come down. It does look like it's drifting a little bit closer to the wind of mark. And, and if that does manage to hit the wind of mark when some of the back markers are going around, maybe this is an opportunity for catch up. Yeah, but also I wanted to continue about the gust. You can see it's not really moving as like a one like normally it would move, move downwind uh, as a certain area. It's a bit like split, you know. So it's, see, like it's difficult to understand where it goes. What do you think, Stevie? I think yeah, it looks definitely look like it's moving down slowly. And for this group here, well, they've you know they've lucked in if you like. They've arrived as the gust got there, so it's going to be chance for them to gain on the leaders. Definite jibe set on the race course right now, and the leaders I think probably did the right thing that they were in. But as you said, Nora, that that what's really hard if you are in the lead. The breeze is going to come back from you. If you go around the Wimmer Mart in a good gust of wind, then it's fantastic to be in the lead because you often get to stretch away. But in that situation, it was light when the leaders went round and this jibe set's only really just presented itself. So I like what the Italians did. They were aggressive. They saw it coming and they probably took a little loss jibing early um, before it had actually got there. But we'll see how it plays out further down the race course. As you can see now, it's no decision. The wind shifted well to the right. There's good pressure. No problem with a jibe set for all these boats. And in some ways, they're a little bit limited in terms of what they can do. This reminds me very much of the, the first race where we saw that the top, the first boats did a, yeah, a straight set and they didn't do a jibe set. They continued. Wow, did we have a capsize there? We did have a capsize. I, I couldn't identify who it was but they just didn't get the boat borne away enough for that gust as it was hitting. And there were a couple of boats that looked like they might be on the edge and, and they really caught that one out. Yeah, but to continue about the downwind, like you had the first boat doing a straight uh, lift or a hoist going left and then the boats behind approaching and doing a jibe set going to the right side. I think this is going to make very interest the whole race super interesting because I think they can actually like pressure the top boats because they're going to come in now as you see with a really really nice speed and they're going around 16 knots downwind which is incredible compared to i see denmark on the left side is doing 11 knots and gbr right side is doing 15 16 so that that gust has really filled in across the course now they're going so much faster than they were just two or three minutes ago and belgium with the red jennica in the middle of screen Looking pretty strong. We, we know that they rounded the, the last win of Mark in second place. And they're still looking good now. But I, I'm not quite sure where the French team is that was leading. 
Um, so we'll have to try and work out where, where the French are and have the Belgians managed to overtake them. But um, this is a great opportunity, as Steve was saying earlier, to, to overtake. Oh, but there are the French coming down towards the finish. And so the French have stretched away from wow. Belgium again. And, and whilst they were caught by, by Belgium, the French have absolutely managed to nail this race. Wow, so incredible of them. I'm amazed. They kept the lead the whole way and now... We lost them for a moment and now we see them, yeah, because they've been clearly le leading so much that we couldn't even see them on the screen. So congratulations uh, to Lara Granier and Amelie Ryu. Amazing performance by them and not afraid to make some brave, brave decisions. They won that race by starting furthest left towards the pin um, and coming off the, the line with speed, but taking some transoms to tack on to the uh, to port tack early now you see this red jenica to the left of our screen i think that's great britain looking stretched the way that they're stretched stevie looks like they've overstood the ley line they do look a little bit pushed out to this side of the course they're going to be fast at the bottom i think what i like about their position now is if they're not too over overlaid then that group up there will potentially slow themselves down it's all going to depend on how much it is. But if you have got no more manoeuvres to do, that's well positioned. Here we go. Martine Grail, she's done good work down here as well. The Brazilian, that's a little bit more what we're used to seeing. But yeah, look at the distances that have changed. When you think how close Belgium and France were at the top of the mark, it shows you quite how frightening these downwind legs are, to be frank. It's really scary, the distance changing. And they've done a nice job there. Uh, Mahoud and Kurtz on board the Belgian boat. They look like they're going to get this second place. Solid result for them. Amelie Rieu and Lara Granier. Wow, that was two firsts at the Wimbledon Mark. But of course, what a day it would have been if they'd have had two firsts at this stage. But anyway, they'll be positive for the next race. Nice work by the Belgium girls. Lovely tidy jibe there. But yeah, it's so hard at the bottom of this course to judge things accurately. But that just means real opportunity. Oh, well, we've, ju we've just heard actually that the boat that we thought um, we'd seen crossing the line it wasn't the French. Apparently, Belgium, we've just been told, did win that race. Um, so I, I think we need to check on that. I, I, I think we need some verification on that. I felt we'd seen visual confirmation on, on the screen that, that France had won. Um, but uh, we, we need to check on that. Whoa, look how tight it is at the finish oh. there, Ricey. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The Germans, New Zealand, oh my word, it's a blanket finish. We're going to want to get some uh, some comeback stuff there. The Swedish come across slightly out the back of the pack, a tricky race for them. But wow, that got so, so tight at the pin end of the finish line there. No room. Don't think we got any collisions, which is good news. But yeah, tight action and it's just all on right the way to the finish. And so just those two or three seconds at the finish, that could be the difference between winning or losing this championship. Those kind of moments, so many boats all at once, all across the line. And Stevie, this is not the Tour de France, is it? You don't get the same time across the line when, when the whole of the no. Tour de France peloton is overlapped. No, those meters are just points here and there, points everywhere. And in fact, right now, it's the Dutch girls. They're finding themselves sat in kind of 11th, 12th position at the moment. So quite costly for them. Swedes as well, they've dropped some points. So it shows for all the crews, it doesn't matter how good you are or how good you've been over the week so far. This is a challenging race course and it's going to show no mercy. So there's a lot of points up for grabs with one race left today. You'll be starting to be tired, brain a bit frazzled. Are you feeling confident as to how you're reading the race course or is your confidence a bit down with your decision making? So big few minutes for the coaches here to get them reset and looking forward for the next race. Well, what a race for the French. Uh, what a race for the Belgians. And, and uh, let's, uh, uh, let's see if we can get some confirmation one way or the other, whether it was France or Belgium that won that race. We're hearing that it's Belgium, but what happened to the French? They seem to disappear off the, the race course. Um, I can only think that they were pulled out of the race because they've been over the line or something. I, I don't know what's happened to the French. Yeah, but they normally don't pull out. You Even though you would be over, you wouldn't be pulled out from the race. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to see what happened. But uh, anyway, wait, great race for the Belgians. If and if not, they won, but like second at least. <laughs> so, certainly, certainly well up there. <laughs> and also looking at the stats, like uh, Brazilians, what? Where did they come from? They they got you don't know. They were after Belgians, and they were 16th on the first top mark, and then they just climbed up 10th, 6th, and second. 
that's more like the Brazilians we expect to see, isn't it? Okay, so I understand that we may get an interview with the Belgians, uh, Maynard and Gertz. Um, so let's see if we can speak to these Belgians very shortly. And, and here we have Isora and Anouk. Go with me. Just grabbing a drink. Oh, they can hear me. Isora, can you hear me? It's Andy Rice here. Can you hear me? Just checking that you can hear me from Andy Rice. It says the host is all right. connected or unable to connect. No, oh, I don't. I don't. I don't think we can get them. So um, yes, if our interviewer can tell us, if we can, if we can get some feedback from Rafa, who's who's um, working out there with our team, if we can find out what happened down that final leg between Belgium and France, that would be really useful intel. And um, so if there's anyone else we can get some news from from the water, that would be great to get. But the girls looked super happy, so I think they're pretty... Right, so body language says that they were the winners, you think, yeah, Nora? Yeah, <laughs> I would say so. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready to... They were just opening their jails, like fueling up for the next race. That, that's why we need you here. You can, you can read body language in, in, in ways that I certainly can't. So there we have it. So Granier and Ryu finish in second place behind Belgium. So, so what a, a great last couple of legs the Belgians sailed to, to come and win that race. And really good racing by Grail and Kunz. And Stevie can be assured that that was a good final run into the finish by the British. They, they managed not to overstand that ley line. They get fourth. Eshegoyen and Barcelona from Spain in fifth. Germani and Bertuzzi from Italy in sixth. Schiel and Felke in seventh for Germany. Uh, the Schultheis sisters from Malta in eighth. Harding and Wilmot in ninth. And I think that was Norway that I saw in tenth. So um, it's uh, one more race to go for the 49er FX women. And then it will be a switch over to the 49er men later on this afternoon. So I'm not sure who the top performer of the day has been so far. But as Stevie has pointed out, winners of the start has certainly been those French, Grenier and Ryu. So, Stevie, based on what they've done so far, what do you think the French will do for this next start? Well, you'd be pretty surprised to not see them be down towards that pin end of the line and, and making a positive move out towards the left. I think, I think uh, you know, you are getting some big right-hand shifts come through. Um, and so I still think it's a pretty open racetrack and it will depend on the timing. But for sure, the French are sailing aggressively and positively, which I like. Uh, it doesn't seem a day to be caught two in the middle of the course and two sat back as we see the start here. And you see just how congested the top of the line was. Pretty blanket start by a lot of the boats. Sweden, good start out of the middle. Brazil, Australia, again. And the French were actually a couple of metres back here, Andy, but they're right on this left-hand side of the fleet. So it was a positive decision. And it was their next decision right here where they were the first attack, dived out across. It was pretty punchy. But again, just that positive mindset, attacking the shift, being aggressive. And, uh, and then that gives you opportunities further up the track. And that beautiful view of Lanzarote there. This is where we are way down at the in the Atlantic. Same latitude as the Sahara and why this place is such an amazing place to come year round. Um, Nora, you spend a lot of time here, so uh, you, you know the conditions here so well. And I, I can see why you choose to spend a good part of the winter here. Yeah, this is a place where it's incredible. Like we're still in Europe, but uh, just like it's just in every day is sunny, so beautiful. The water is like perfect, like blue turquoise. It's just incredible to be here and makes the training so so much nicer, actually. <laughs> yeah, and you you come from Finland. What what would the weather be like in Finland right now? Oh, in Finland it's like midwinter. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't sail there necessarily. Our defense mostly it's just snowy and cold, which is perfect for winter sports but not for not for sailing just coming back to this this replay this is the moment where belgium must have felt they had a, a sniff of the lead now we didn't manage to see how the belgians got past the french but maybe it was that straight set maybe the maybe the french carrying on a little bit too long stevie what's your take on it I just think that those first two boats came round and left shift. So for them, the right thing to do was a straight set. But then we saw the breeze coming in. And I think it just was a, the French were a little bit of a sitting duck. They they could have led the jibe, but they would have been going against the shift. Hindsight's, uh, 
hindsight's a beautiful thing if you can have it uh, if you can have it in real time and of course we're sat here looking back but I think it was really hard for the French because they went round I think they made the right decision as did the Belgians to straight set but but then clearly the wind filled in down and it would have been a fairly easy decision for the Belgians to lead the jive back towards that shift so I suspect all that happened was that simple as that the right shift came in Belgians could lead the jive and and they were then on the long tack over the top it looks like the biggest gains were made maybe like in the downwind and the bottom mark roundings would you say that Stevie yeah, I think so. I think downwind the boats are going so much faster when you get one of these gusts and you stay with the gusts so long as well. Your point really, Nora, the gusts aren't moving down massively quickly, but when you're in one, you can stick in it. These boats are going pretty much at wind speed downwind in this breeze. So if you get in a good gust of wind, you'll stay in it for most of the downwind leg. Whereas when you're going upwind, of course, you're going through the gusts and into the next lull, into the next gust. So you're always going to get those transitions. Whereas I think downwind you have far less transition. So if you pick a good gust and a good shift, the gain from it's going to be, I don't know, two thirds of the leg, you'll be sat in that gain. Um, it's a much longer burn. And likewise, if you're in a bad position, it's just going to hurt a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's really cool with these boats. Like they're, they're super fast to be like dinghies. Uh, of course, we have foiling boats as well, but like just being a, a normal dinghy, this is incredible. The skiff is you know, goes the same speed as the wind and just accelerates so quickly and also just, I mean, looks athletic and it is athletic, honestly. A lot of technical skills required to do the maneuvers. And as we can see, even though the level is super high, we still see capsizes in the bottom mark and top mark roundings. Even though the wind is even not that, it's, it's not that tricky. Like, yeah, the wind is tricky, but it's not crazy windy or, you know, big, huge waves that make it even worse, more difficult. Well, I, I was wondering, could it be the swell? Does it, does the swell, uh, it, maybe if you accelerate or decelerate at the wrong time because of the swell, does does that make you do cap sizes that when we look at them, they think they look they look like beginners. You know, they they look like they're cap sizing when they shouldn't be, and I'm just wondering <laughs> why. Is it is it the swell? I I I think it's this not so much the swell, maybe more okay the swell and the wind combination because it looked like there's moments when they're like on the swell they lose a bit of the tension in the sails or like there's no no air in the sails and then suddenly there's a little shift and more wind from another direction and that's enough to tip someone over. Uh, Stevie, any thoughts of this? It doesn't look crazy difficult, but still we see them struggling. Yeah, I think as soon as you're kind of in the pack and, and compromised, then you can be focused on on other things. And a 49er, you know, fundamentally, if there was no one on the boat and you put it in the water, it'd fall over. So if someone hasn't got their attention on it to keep the boat, it just wants to tip over. And I think at the bottom gate, firstly, there's a lot of distraction. So there's a lot of other things to focus on. The gusts, when they come, are pretty massive. So if you are a bit slow, you're not focused on the gust. Uh, it comes up and bites you in the backside pretty quickly. And that's what's happened to a few of them. Um, let's go to a quick break. We'll be back with you very shortly.
Two races down in the 49er FX Gold Fleet Racing today. One race to go for the women before we switch over to the men's 49er competition later on this afternoon here in Marina Rubicon in the south of Lanzarote. I'm Andy Rice and I'm with Nora Ruskula and Stevie Morrison and we are about to get into commentary for the third of the races this afternoon and we're going to see whose chance it is to win a race this time round. We've seen the French win the start on both occasions, France 63. And Stevie, we see a bit more of an even spread of the boats all the way along the line. So it seems like the fleet is waking up to the potential of the left-hand end of the line. Yeah, good good spread along there. And, and I think the course has opened up a little bit more of that being able to be at full speed when the gun goes really hard. But look how close everyone is. You don't want to be getting yourself an over the line this early on in the Gold Fleet Series, if you can help it. But we've seen if you're not right up pressed on this start line at go, you've got a lot of potential to lose here. Under five seconds to the start. It's now about the acceleration. Denmark's really tight. France in the middle of the line looks tight. There was a few boats that were pushing the line hard there. And Sweden, bottom of our screen. Well, they're in a tricky, tricky position there. As we see Germany and Italy, they're pushed out. And it looks an awful lot lighter on the racetrack at the moment. They're struggling to build speed in these lighter conditions. Yeah, it also looked like almost a bit of a left shift uh, starting because some really struggled to keep the lane and the boats are just angled a bit more towards the pin end. So let's see, surely the teams that are now like in the front, we see Germany, Italy, Brazil, uh, Belgium, and yeah, they're going to have a good lane and just be able to get like every meter they, they need to stay in front of the others. And yeah, this is crucial because if you get a good lane out of here, you have more options of tacking away early. And if you see the boats just behind like Canada, Polish, uh, Spanish, for example, they really struggle to find a lane. So I don't think they're going to manage to stay there for long. Yeah, and, and as you say, Nora, you can see a number of the boats already tacking out onto, onto port and a, a good chunk of boats that we see now on port tack, including our reigning world champions from Sweden in the middle of the picture, Sweden 1. And uh, quite a split developing here between the go writers that we're looking at front of picture and in the far distance, the go lefters. It looks like, uh, Stevie, there's a bit more gust for the ones going out further to the left. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I guess what's interesting is it looked like there was, as Nora said, a bit of a left shift at the start line. So that should favour the boats being fairly early on to Port Tack, which no surprise to see the Dutch in this group here, the Swedish in this group, the American Steph Robel and team, Helen, the uh, Norwegian crew there. They're early on the shift. But yeah, the question that we unfortunately can't really answer from this camera angle is what pressure they're in. So I think they're on a good shift, but the Dutch to the left-hand side of our screen, they've tacked back. They're heading back up towards that left-hand side. And I think I'd be a little nervous if I was the Swedes here because they're not here through choice. They're here through being forced to off a slightly bad start. And, uh, and they're going to be hoping to find pressure out that size. I think they're not on a bad shift, but are they in pressure? Belgium has the option to tack here, but Belgium choosing to carry on on starboard. Um, we, we saw them make a similar move in the last race, but they're looking quite exposed here. They must really like what they've got and want to stay on, on starboard tack. 
Yeah. Or, or what do you think, Nora? Is it the opposite, that they're on the outside of something and they can't get back across? No, I think it looks like they, they're going for the left side, like on a mission. But they're actually now looking at the tracker. They did tack, so now, yeah, coming closer to the, te the fleet again. You don't want to go all the way too far, but maybe they were also just waiting. You know, the boats can be in different uh, different angles, as in like it, some might have a lift and some might have a knock, and you don't even know which one. So, as in, we can't see it from here. <laughs> so maybe they were just waiting for that shift to come so that they could tack with it. Actually, as they draw back closer to this, oh yeah, they obviously didn't like what they had too much. They, they've tacked back again, so maybe Belgium feel a bit stuck on the outside of something that's coming in from the right. Uh, the, the boats in the middle, like New Zealand and Great Britain, are maybe in a better position, but maybe on the far side, closer towards the Lanzarote shoreline. What do you think about the, the boats out on the far right, Stevie? Well, this camera angle looks pretty good for them at the moment. I feel they're in good left pressure. pressure sorry. Uh, helicopter view. Well, it looks like they're sailing into decent breeze on this right-hand side. If they've sailed a lift, the whole way out here they've not been in bad bad pressure and they're going to get pressure then it should be fairly good news for them but yeah the belgians tacking back is not a great sign for the belgian crew they're now going to be committed very hard to the left hand side of the track and they're going to be hoping that the wind stays in the left hand shift and uh, i just feel it's unlikely looking at, at that coming out of the harbor there it's going to want to come to the right hand side of that volcano overall so it should be good news for this group down here but just look how gusty it is. There's absolutely metres and metres to be played with right now. And to be honest, I think I'd be pretty nervous wherever I was right now <laughs> and just trusted that I was in the pressure, best pressure I could be in, sailing the boat as fast as I can and hopefully sailing it towards pressure as we see two-time Olympic gold medalist tacking right-hand side of our screen there and they're really struggling. As, as the Belgians are as well. I mean, it was just getting worse and worse for the Belgians in that shot that we saw just then. There just didn't seem to be any way back from the left for them. No, and once you're there, you're committed. So you just have to, like Stevie said, like wish for the best almost. Like do everything you can do on your side of the course and control that fleet if you can. But otherwise, it's just, you see, it's incredible. The fleet has split in two, in half, and looks like, the right side is the way to go right now. They got a good lift and they're just going like with nice speed up towards the top mark. So it really just depends on if they're going to be able to come back from there. Yes, I mean, they, they need a header actually to ideally where they are now, I would have thought. And it looks like, as we say that, that might be happening. So maybe things are playing into the hands of, of the boats uh, top right of, of picture on the tracking. Um, so ESP73 amongst those. Uh, that are now tacking on to close to the starboard ley line. So maybe it will be that bunch that comes out ahead. But it's interesting to see that Netherlands 2 is, is part of the pack um, further bottom left because they were one of the boats earlier on, Stevie, that you highlighted going out to the right. So at some point, Netherlands must have made a break further over to the left again. Well, I think so far today, the leaders have come in from the left and that's going to be in the back of their mind of like, oh, this is a big decision here. So I expect a deal was thinking, OK, I've sailed a bit of a lift. I don't want to get too greedy. Let's get back across. But ultimately, if, if you can be sailing good numbers, uh, don't be distracted by some of these boats to the right hand side there. I think that's the 49er men's fleet coming out for the racing. But it's really got light and funky. The Dutch, look at that. They're absolutely Ooh. parked in the water. Big, big transition, massive left shift on the Dutch there. So that's not going to be a bad thing. But the fact they've got no breeze is a big problem. So coming back to your point, Andy, that the people on the right will want a righty, probably, but I'd be more desperate to have pressure. I think I just want pressure. And even if I'm going to sail a bit of extra distance, if I can actually sail that in pressure, it's good as we see the Dutch powering up. That swell's starting to have effect. It's really, really getting funky. So this next bit of beat a lot could change very very quickly but i think the right has been the place to be they've just stayed on the lifted tack so it's looking a little bit better for the dutch on the left of screen now they're into some breeze they're back on the trapeze and maybe as you said a couple of minutes ago stevie that the left has tended to be the place to be towards the top of the race course maybe that's why the dutch chose to to go that way and it does seem like despite those painful moments a minute or so ago when the Dutch tacked, that things are coming good for Netherlands too, yet again. 
I would also say, like, even though it looks like oh, scary or the right side is better, it definitely does depend on the final gust and the shift just before the top mark. And it's like a gamble. You don't know where it's going to come from 100%. And you just hope it's, it's for your benefit, <laughs> depending yeah. on which side you're on, right yeah. or left. We saw the gamble of the gust in, in the previous race. And just to remind you that this is day four of the 49er and 49er FX World Championships. We're in Olympic year. This is the second most important event of the season right after the Olympic Games themselves this July uh, with the Olympic regatta taking place in Marseille in the south of France. And there's a number of teams out here racing to try and qualify their nation, um, but, but also to qualify themselves for the, uh, for the spot. But these, this boat we're looking at now, a deal and Annette from the Netherlands, they're confirmed to go to the Olympic Games uh, representing the Netherlands and they are one of the hot prospects for a gold medal this summer. Yeah, as we can see with the sale numbers, they're number two. So they got second at the previous Worlds and the Swedes were the first, or they won the previous Worlds. But also coming to the sale numbers, all the top 10 have uh, the results they had from the previous Worlds. So one, two, three, four, five. And then... The double digit numbers are gold fleeters and then the triple digit numbers are the ones that have not made it to the gold fleet yet. That's, That's very useful to know that. So so here we have a single digit going round the first markets, Netherlands 2, followed by a triple digit, Germany 772. So that's a really good performance by Germany 772, who I just have to remind myself who they are. Um, about the top mark rounding, it looked like nothing was happening. You know, they were just standing on the boat. Like there, I think there was just a moment of no wind. Uh, I think now there's a bit more breeze, so you can see the top marks are like the roundings are way nicer after the the Dutch were standing still and they lost a bit there. Uh, to the Germans. Did you find about the Germans? Yes, I did. We haven't mentioned them all day, actually. And um, it is Sophie Steinlein and Jill Parland who are around 15th overall. Um, and we haven't seen them featured in, in the racing so far today, but having a really good race against the Dutch uh, with a bit of a stretch back to the next bunch of boats. I would think they're a bit like nervous at this point. Like you're, wow, <laughs> in golf fleet racing, doing second right now. Okay, okay, what's Ooh, happening oh, here, Stevie, Stevie? what's going on here? This is oh, a disaster. Oh, oh. Oh, they've just sailed They're off parked. the front of a puff of breeze. These two boats, no. they've got really, really slow and caught up in no wind. And this is just going to be so hard, helicopter gusts. I think they both came round. They had a bit less breeze, but the decisions are going to be really, really tough. Again, big left-hand shift. So the straight set was the right call when they made it. But the problem is that can change really, really quickly. And the boats behind have the advantage. They get to see what you're sailing in a deal here, being very confident still on board that Dutch boat. But I'm surprised that she hasn't jived. I'd expect her to jive back across fairly soon to try and block off anything she can with the rest of the fleet. But yeah, the wind's got super gusty out there. And they just got into a big, big light spot, parked up, and the boat's behind. Well, look at that. They're seeing a roadblock ahead, and they're moving down really, really quick. It's going to get messy for the Dutch from here, I think. And like you said, Stevie, they haven't really done anything wrong. They, they worked with the best that they had available to them. And that, this is all amplified with asymmetric spinnakers like you have with the 49er. You, you can only really sail in, in one direction with, a, with an asymmetric spinnaker. So if someone gets the gust behind you, it's very difficult to respond. But having said that, Nora, it looks like it's coming back in their favour. Yeah, actually, Stevie, you had something to say. I did. I just think I think what, what they could have done, Andy, in that situation was sometimes you've got to cut your losses. So we'll see how this plays out. They're now back in good pressure again, and it could well turn out to be the right decision. But sometimes on a day like this, you've got to say, OK, I was first. I've lost a bit of distance. The right thing to do. What's the next right move? Well, maybe. And look at this camera angle. And that's why a deal's out there. And I'm sat here talking about it because I make bad decisions nowadays. But she's made a brave decision to do that. She's cut across and she stayed out. But yes, yeah, sometimes on a day like today, you've got to cut your losses and be brave. So Yes, it's not your fault that you lose distance, but you've got to know when to make it. But right now, these two, the deal here and the German crew, have made a strong decision and, uh, and they've managed to sort of hold on to things. I thought it was going to get pretty hard for them. But yeah, patience has paid off in the end. Yeah, you've got to keep your head cool. But wow, I think <laughs> there was so much happening that downwind. Uh, so it's exciting. I'm really like, keen to see what else is going to happen this downwind. Like how the 
the bottom mark normally a running is going to be a bit yeah crazy as we've seen in the previous two races it's so patchy and gusty, yeah. isn't it? So so there are going to be so many other opportunities for gains or losses for the for the remaining part of this final 49er FX Gold Fleet race today. But it looks like the Dutch Netherlands too are hanging on by the skin of their teeth. But now a gust for Germany 772 that possibly has launched them into the lead ahead of the Dutch. So uh, is this the moment for the Germans Sophie Steinlein and Jill Parland to take the lead ahead of the uh, the double world champions from the Netherlands. They have a good position, as in like when they approach the, the mark, depending on which mark round they're deciding to go around, uh, they might get a good, like stay ahead of the Dutch or just be next to them. I think these two are going to be battling for sure. Can't see from, now we see in the screen, uh, we see a bunch of other boats as well, the, the 49er men waiting to start their race after the FXs. But we see on the screen also approaching from the left side. I think that's the, anyway, Brazilians are third currently. So we would see them coming to the screen shortly. Okay, now we have a better view actually of the two bottom marks, the right and the left side. So it's really interesting who, to see they're a bit far from each other, actually. So depending on which one you take, it's going to determine like, it a lot. Of it it looks it pretty clear which one you want right now with the benefit of our helicopter view. It looks like the best breeze for the next leg is going to be on the right-hand side. But of course, we can see that from up here. It's much less obvious down there when you're in the heat of battle. And we got three boats, possibly four boats, all vying for the lead and this is actually really tightening up and it looks like Brazil now have taken the lead. Finally we see the reigning Olympic champions take the lead in a race and things are really tightening up as the Dutch go round the opposite side and I have to say Stevie I fancy where the Dutch are headed towards. They're on a really big lifted tack on port tack as some of the others are coming down on starboard struggling to hold their kite. Suddenly the, the breeze is up, the gust is in but Stevie which side of this course do you want? Well, yeah, I think you're right, Andy. I think uh, the obvious choice there was the, was the left turn. The Dutch were well set, but they've just sailed into that right breeze there, looking absolutely parked. They've stopped again on board the Dutch boat, and you can just see how bandy the wind's got. It is really, really gusty and shifty out there. So a few metres lost technique-wise for the Dutch. They didn't read that wind, and they're still not up and sailing properly. So whilst I think sailing towards that on the right was good, they've just hit an absolute hole in the wind, parked up, and the Germans are nearly straight up and over the top. But yeah, and th was, was that a loss? Pretty early. Was that a loss of technique, or was that just pure bad luck for the Dutch again? It just feels like the breeze is is not playing their way. But w was it more than that, Nora? What's what's your thought? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that the this it's the other German team actually. The Germans that were next to the Dutch, uh, Stein and Poland, they uh, are still next to the Dutch. And then we have the German fifty five that we can see now on top of the the Dutch. So uh, okay. they changed. We, we mixed up the German teams. Right. There's a lot of Germans <laughs> out there. Um, but yes, mate, as you say, it's Marla Bergman and Hannah Veal, the, the Germans that are fighting with the Dutch. Oh, but there's, I don't know what Germany 55 are doing. It looks like they're taking a spin. So there must have been an incident further back. And if they are taking that spin now, it seems a little bit late in the day if that was something that happened back at the leeward gate. A bit of a strange move there. Yeah, the results, the results, the rules say you should take the penalty turn right after the events, or right after what has happened. And this is, this is a bit long after. It, it looks like they're, they're putting one in the bank in case someone protests them, Stevie, but you, you, you could, well, I, I'm speculating because I, I don't know where that incident occurred, but I'm assuming it must have been close contact with another boat, which would have had to have been at the, the lower mark. But uh, it, that's let the Dutch off the hook to some extent. At least the Dutch are the best of the boats on the right again, Stevie. Yeah, again, like we said, you, if we can win your side, that's going to not be a bad start. We can see there is breeze up on that Lanzarote shoreline, but how quickly is it moving down is the question. Feels like it's not a bad right shift at the moment. So that should be good news for the for the uh, boats here. But here we go. Tight moment at the bottom of the course. And I guess there was a protest from the Spanish boat on the Germans asking for room at the mark. So I think that's why the Germans will have taken their penalty. They'll argue that they were trying to get clear of the gate for the safety of the fleet to take their penalty safely. 
Uh, I'm not entirely sure that they'd get away with that, but it would have been a pretty subjective one as we see now. Wind shifted back to the left. Martine Grail, two-time gold medalist. Well, she's on a good shift there. Well lined up with the Danish crew as well. They seem to be sailing in a good angle. And the Dutch, well, does a good job again of cutting her losses a deal when she makes a bit of an error. And you said about whether or not it was luck. Well, I think, is it luck? I don't know that it is luck. The wind is shifty and gusty. If you're sailing the boat right on the edge, maybe that's a bad decision. Maybe you should be sailing with a little bit margin in the bank to catch up. But that's definitely not a deal style. She is all or nothing. She drives the boat hard all the time. And that leaves you open to, to having a few little moments like that. But she's got herself back up and running back in phase with the shifts, back in phase with the fleet. And again, if she can come out of today, looking at the overall points right now, she's showing as being on 37 points collectively. And if we remember the Swedish were the biggest challengers at the beginning of the day, they're now on 51 points. So that's a huge day at the office for the Dutch if things stay as it is right now. Yeah, a huge day, a good day for the Dutch and, and a difficult day for the Swedes. Uh, Nora, what, what are you making of the race at this stage? Actually, I, I wanted to speak about the Danish. Um, they're, they were the final, they qualified at the previous Worlds to, for Olympic spots. And now also by making the goal fleet, they have basically qualified their internal, well, oh, they secured the spot within their country. So that's incredible. And they're doing so well right now. It's crazy. That's the, uh, the Danish sisters, uh, Johan and Andrea Schmidt. And uh, as you just said, Nora, they were the only Danes to get into Goldfleet. And by doing that, by getting into Goldfleet and the rest of the, the Danish FX sailors not managing that, that has effectively sealed um, the, the Schmidt sisters' uh, bid for Paris 2024. They know they're going to the Games, which must have been an absolutely amazing feeling for them yesterday. And now they're in the thick of Goldfleet racing at the, the sharp end of, of race three of, of Goldfleet. Yeah, and they so they were, I think, 10th at the Worlds, at least in the top 10 in the previous Worlds. And that was a bit of a surprise, let's say, for many, many teams to see them there. And now it seems like, yeah, they're on it. They're, they're going to be serious about this and trying to push in back to the top 10. I'm sure they are. The Danes have done really well over the years in the 49er and the 49er FX. Um, so they, they, they've, won, they've won medals in, in both the men's and the, the women's skiff. Here we are with Australia 47. I would say one of the surprise packages of these world championships so far, Laura Harding and Annie Wilmot. And uh, I'm sure you know this, Stevie, but Annie Wilmot, that's a famous surname in Australia. She's the cousin of Nathan Wilmot, the, uh, the 470 Olympic champion from Beijing 2008. Yeah, Nathan worked. Uh, lucky enough to have Nathan coach me for a little while. Certainly, uh, one of the one of the top sailors uh, in in the world scene, really. And uh, and he knows his way around a racetrack. So that Wilmot family's done a lot of winning. I'm sure she's uh, she's not going to be short of feedback, knowing what Nathan's like. He's uh, not one to keep his opinions to himself, but generally speaking, pretty good feedback. And yeah, I think they've sailed superbly so far. But big moment in their regatta right now. They're punching out towards this left hand side. Of course, that did very well for the Dutch on the last uh, upwind leg that we saw. But the Aussies here, they'll be wanting a good race to finish the day with because they've had a very good day out there so far. Really got themselves in the hunt for a medal in this first day of finals racing. But with that much exposure on the left-hand side of the course, you'd be pretty hopeful that you've seen Breeze out there to get you back across. Also, looking at the the picture right now of the camera angle, you can see how, for example, they, the angles are crazy with the boats. You see the Norwegians and Brazilians are keeping, they're in a nice lane, they have a nice gusts, but the boats behind them just can't keep up with them. I don't know, is it the camera angle that's lying, but it looks like they're just in totally different breezes and it's like where, I'm just confused of where they're going, you know? It's almost like, it's just so shifty and gusty that you can't tell it's, it's all over the place, isn't it? But uh, we're, we're seeing some of the more expected teams up here now. Some, some of the older, more experienced teams, Martin Grail and Kayana Kunz, the double Olympic champions from Brazil, now in the lead. Um, and the Dutch still hanging in there. look like they're possibly second or third uh, with Denmark 10, the, the Schmidt sisters, one, one of the, uh, the, the lesser expected teams up there, but having a, a really good race right now. It's also uh, the Brazilians really? are current. Yeah, Stevie, you go. 
I was just saying, yeah, it's really tight at the top of the course here as we're coming in. It's final moments as they approach this windward mark. And you can see the whole pack's built up. It's going to all be about where is the pressure on the exit from this top mark? As we're some way further back in the pack here, we see the Swedes. They're struggling a little bit. They've dug their way up to seventh at the moment, but they're showing as being a few metres back and they're well out towards this port ley line. So they're hoping for Breeze to come in. Top of our screen, that's the group, including two times gold medalist Martina Grail, Kiana Kuntz. And then uh, Adil is up in that group as well, the Dutch crew. She's done a fantastic job so far today. Uh, and they'll be looking, where's the breeze going to be on the exit from this mark? Because we've seen how much happens on this downwind. And right now, it doesn't actually look all that windy, which to me says, hang on, because we're about to get another big gust on the downwind. <laughs> that seems to be the pattern, doesn't it? Just when you think the breeze is disappearing for the day, down swoops another gust, uh, gust from the volcanoes of Lanzarote in the distance. <laughs> Looking at the Brazilians, uh, they were actually 10th in the top mark. And after that, they've just been winning. So all day had this trend of like starting a bit slow, a bit back in the fleet and then just like climbing up slowly. It's, it's going to be interesting to see who was top performer out of the day, actually. And I wonder, well, it's probably going to be Netherlands. I, I, I'm, I'm putting my money on the Netherlands as maybe having the, had the best day today. Uh, but Brazil, I, I wonder if they're a top three performer today. Bit of, oh, bit of a slow patch there. This this looks a little wow. bit uncomfortable for the Brazilians at the moment. Um, Very low mode. They like they're both in the boat, just like they're going so low. It's cr incredible, but there's no wind. It's, it's so light. This Stevie looks like another opportunity for a gust to hit from behind and for the Brazilians to have a have a sticky moment, a bit like the Dutch suffered a, a lap ago. Yeah, I think in this light winds, this is the sort of moment now the breeze has dropped. You know there's probably another hammer punch going to come later on in the race. I would imagine you're gripping the tiller fairly hard. The one thing that's made it a little bit easier is we've got a shift and we couldn't see any real breeze coming down from the right. So I think it's a slightly easier decision this time round in the sense that there's no gusts moving. The gusts are a long way upwind. But there you go, Martine. She's decided to jibe out try and put herself back across that pressure. But that breeze up on the Lanzarote shore is, is a long way up. That camera is foreshortening that distance quite a bit. So we can see it's probably going to be quite a light wind run. And I wouldn't be at all surprised to see the last third of this downwind leg. Things get really tense. So big decision from the Brazilians here. They've gone with the percentages of feeling those shifts coming off the right-hand shoreline. But yeah, looks like they're on their own in that decision at the moment. Well, the other thing is, where, when you're in that position that the Germans and the Dutch were the previous time round, you, you hoist on starboard and, and the fleet starts uh, going underneath you on a better gust. You're on starboard. If you jibe onto port, you, you don't have any rights, at least once you, you get this side of the rest of your rivals, like the Bra Brazilians have done. At least when you jibe back, you're on to starboard. You've got rights. Is, is that a factor at all? I think it's a factor in the close match on things but she's gone a long way here this is a bit here she goes jibing back looks like the breeze doesn't look bad for the straight so i think that she might end up ruining that decision in the long run here on board the brazilian boat i think that yeah the boat on boat thing becomes a bit more of a a bit more of an issue but ultimately i think when it's this shifty and gusty you're probably slightly less worried about those little intricacies than you would be on a steady day in Palmer Bay with the sea breeze and, and the metres counting for a lot. It's more about the tens of metres on a day like today and where the breeze is coming down. And, and you talked about the performer of the day. And I think Adil and Annette on board that Dutch boat, they've been pretty standout. They've made those good decisions a lot of the time. And, uh, and generally speaking, they've prioritised well because we can see, look, look, it's still light on that Brazilian both of them inside it and the boats up that have straight set and not done it look like they're twin trapezing in a little bit more breeze up there Nora that that was an amazing shot that we saw of the Swedes just now I mean if you were campaigning a, a 49er FX or thinking about doing so we, we, we're getting 
privileged view of of these uh, sailors and the way that they're sailing these boats so accurately. Um, but but coming coming back to uh, Stevie's point, it, oh, it's it looks like Brazil is just getting back on the trapeze again. They're just picking up the breeze, and and maybe it's redemption time. What do, what do you think, Nora? Uh, it's tricky. I've been looking at the Brazilians. Like I thought they would go further, right? Uh, because they chose to do the jibe set, but. They, I, I think they got a bit scared of seeing that the left side got, was doing way better. But now they're doing, it looks like they're doing a bit of a comeback. So I, I don't know. I'm like, I, my head, like my thoughts have been changing throughout this downwind of like, oh yeah, no, <laughs> now uh, there's a gust, now there's not a gust. <laughs> and, and we've got the privilege of seeing this from, from a bird's eye view as well. So whatever we're seeing, we're, we're getting a, a much better picture up here than they are from sea level. Uh, but it looks like Brazil have uh, held their nerve, just about managed to stay in the lead. Denmark 10 definitely threatening the Brazilian lead. But yeah, it's, it's a really close one to call, Stevie. I, I don't know who you would pick for, for winning this race across the finish line. Got any thoughts? Well, I think the Brazilians have done a nice job, if you put it, of cutting your losses. A little bit of what we talked about on the first downwind leg, where, where the Dutch were very brave. They chose not to cut their losses, but Brazil did. So I think that was the right move. But this boat way out here, as we see at the, towards the top of our screen in the corner there, that's the Schmidt sisters. And they're definitely exposed themselves, but they are really, really pressed. Both hammer down on the trapeze. Whole fleet lined up well. I think tactically still advantage with Brazil. They've positioned themselves very well down here, but it's ultimately going to come to the breeze you have in the next 30 seconds. If Brazil can get down to the Schmitz line, then I think they'll be safe. And the Schmitz look pretty pressed. They're well down towards the ley line. So, yeah, I'm going to go money on Martin at the moment. Yeah, certainly looking like they got a better gust and the Germans left a little bit high and dry as they're going out of picture with the Red Jenica, just not got that gust that the Bra Brazilians have got. So, Nora, the, the, there must be an element of luck. You've got to string your luck together and, and when you get the luck, go your way. You've just got to make the most of it. Yeah, especially since today with these uh, weather conditions, uh, you're just going to like yeah go with whatever you have and can't get too stuck on the fact to hear just the Germans, for, they were about to roll the Brazilians and they looked like they were going way faster, double trapezing a bit harder than the Brazilians. And then now they just fell out of, out of the wind, out of the gust. And you don't want to do too, like it's impossible to do a jibe and try to stay in the gust all the time because then you'll be doing a lot of jibes. So you just got to like, you know, pray and wait for and position yourself to the fleet. Obviously you can't just, you know, wait for things to happen. <laughs> no, but you still, you got to choose your lane and you stick but it, to it. Kind it's of. really close between the front four right now. We can't have long before we're seeing that finish line come into view and it looks like the Americans might even have a sniff of a top three here as well. We've hardly mentioned them lately, but look at America come across the front of the bow of Germany and Denmark and Brazil looking a little bit safer not really going to know until we see where that finish line is. So the top, uh, the top one came from the more left, and Brazilians also a bit left. But the US girls, they, they, yeah, they came a bit more from the right side, doing their own game, and now they're just like showing up to the party. We're amazing. <laughs> going ahead of people. So Robel and Shay, what an amazing comeback down this final run. I know they were somewhere up in the top 10, but they, they've made a really good game. But congratulations to the reigning Olympic champions, Martin Grell and Kayena Kunz. We predicted at the beginning of the day, I certainly remember you did, Stevie, that you thought this might be a kind of day that would suit them and winning this race. Oh, that was Nora, actually. I'm yeah, that was. Take the credit. Yeah, now. that was Nora, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, who who made the prediction that the Brazilians were were going to be a force to be reckoned with, and and that's certainly proven to be true. Second across the line for the USA. Uh, for Steph Robel and Maggie Shea and then looking very tight across the line with the next few Germany 55 coming across the line in third um, or possibly the Schmidt sisters very close between them Harding and Wilmot from Australia somewhere in amongst the front few and then Germany 772 who were vying for the lead with the Dutch uh, back in uh, the early stages of the race also up amongst them I'm, I'm not sure how they got a bit stuck though on the downwind the Germany and uh, the Dutch, or they were doing so well in the race in the beginning. Well, 
And, and the Dutch, I mean, we, we can see them on the left of picture there. There's Sweden still coming across the line with the blue Jenica, so not a great finish for Sweden. So Dutch have stayed ahead of Sweden, but I think the Dutch will be disappointed with that last part of the race. They, they, were, they were well up there, and it all seemed to fall apart for them towards the end. I'm going to say what I love about this, uh, specifically the FX, as I sailed it myself, that the racing is so close. Like you have teams that done this for a long time since the boat yeah, was introduced in 2013, I think it was. So it's a, yeah. it's a long way to go already. Some that sailed for 10 years and others been in the class for maybe like four years, which is the new teams i'd say so and you can see them all mixed together and like some are doing well in some races and it's not always the same boats you know the the competition is so tight it, it is really tight but we're, we're still seeing some of the originals some of some of the the first into the boat like the brazilians who were yeah. there from from year one from 2013 still doing really well here's the here's the replay of the start and the swedes already look buried the swedes as you said stevie earlier they had to tack out because they weren't able to to hold their spot as they launched off the start line so they were sort of forced out to the right along with a bunch of other boats really good start by germany 22 um middle left of the line and early on the norwegians and the dutch behind the the swedish mainsail looking good there are the dutch going round in the lead chased by Germans, uh, Germany 772. But look, they get left high and dry here. Nothing they could have done about it. Um, and then the, other fleet, the rest of the fleet come down on a better gust behind them. But the Dutch recover. They don't lose their nerve. They manage to get going again, as do Germany 772. And here's the battle between these two as they're um, back up to full speed again. And then a bit of place changing at the bottom as Brazil moves into the lead. This is the first time that Brazil takes the lead with the Dutch going round the far side. And you can see this incident between the Spanish and Germany 22, sorry, Germany 55, uh, which later leads to Germany 55 having to take a, a 360 penalty spin, believing that they might have infringed the Spanish. And back up the final windward leg. Still very difficult to to defend but brazil from leading around the bottom mark manages to hold on to lead around the top goes around in a bit of a soft patch and we'll see them do a couple of early jibes to try and consolidate looks like germany 55 the boat that took that penalty is back in the hunt for overtaking brazil but it doesn't stay that way and meanwhile on the far side the blue jennica of denmark 10 also looking like a contender for for winning this race here come Brazil across the finish line. They managed to hold on. So well done to Grail and Kunz for winning that race and a great comeback down the final run for the Americans to, to come into second with Germany 55, Bergman and Veal in third. And, and I said uh, Van Anhalt and Dutz had a bit of a cave on the last run. It wasn't that bad, actually. They, they still finished fifth. So, so pretty good for them. So, Stevie, we got uh, we got some 49er men's races coming up. Um, how much knowledge transfer will there be from from one to the other? Do you think? I think the teams will make sure they they get across what they can. But I think uh, you know, from what we saw of the racing there, Martin and Kayana on the screen in front of us right now, it, you know, it, it's pretty harem scarum, snakes and ladders style racing. You know, there's there's a lot out there. I'm not sure there's too many golden rules. Uh, to be found. I think trying to get on the shifts as early as you can, sail towards pressure, and you won't be able to get an awful lot more information than that. Um, you, you know, I think the girls' fleet, the, the, you know, the ladies that have put in, a, put in a fantastic shift out there, but they'll be pretty glad to have a day like today over and done with because there's plenty of opportunity for things to go fairly pear-shaped fairly quickly. And I imagine, yeah, there'll be that little bit of knowledge transferred, but then possibly a final sign-off of rather you than me because it definitely feels like it's getting a little bit trickier out there. Um, it's getting bigger holes in it, bigger gusts in it. So there's more ups and downs to be had. And uh, I think there'll be a few few tense crews on board those 49er male teams as they get ready for racing. 
Nora, um, we'll probably go to a break fairly soon, but just um, who, who stood out for you today? Who impressed you? Not necessarily the, the Dutch, because we know they're the best, but, but anyone <laughs> else that you, you want to mention as well? Well, the Dutch did an amazing job today, but I think the Brazilians, I'm just looking at the results and trying to figure out who did the best out of today. And it looks like there's a lot of double-digit numbers, but... In terms of the leader, it, it is it is the Dutch. It's the Dutch, but the Brazilians did a good job, definitely very good today. I think they were consistent, not in the actual racing, but they were consistent overall over the day with the finishes. Uh, but a lot of shockers today, as in you can see. I think the the final, like so much happened in the final downwind and just before the finish line as well, and I think that affected a lot of on the results. Stevie, um, you said that we're in for a bit more breeze from the forecast that you've seen tomorrow. Um, there's an 11-point gap now between the Dutch in first place and the, the Swedes, who are now down to second. That will probably be good news for Sweden in their bid to fight back against the Dutch, their extra breeze, do you think? I think so. Um, one thing I would say from my time coaching was that I think Adil and Net have probably got, if not the best, certainly amongst the best boat handling in the fleet. And, and I think these gusty, shifty conditions is, uh, you know, is ultimately boat handling conditions. So I think they've got good gains they can make there. They definitely know how to sail the boat really nicely around the course. And I think a standout performance for me, really, yeah, Martine and Kiana, of course, we expect them to come back a little bit. But, but for Laura Harding, Anna Wilmot in fourth, you know, it's possibly their first time at the front of a world championship fleet and they've sailed back through the fleet quite well. I think, you know, Australians normally like a bit of breeze, so they could uh, be looking forward to tomorrow pretty hopefully. But yeah, the whole fleet's congested a little bit. Um, what a good day is. I don't know what a good day is really because the points are really high. So I think for tomorrow, yes, Vilma will be happy, but a deal and, uh, and Annette as well. They, they sailed very, very well today and I think they'll be confident of, uh, of stretching out further. Thanks, Stevie. Uh, we'll go to a quick break and back to you shortly before we get into the 49er men's racing. Everything I know will be gone in a minute And that's 
Welcome back to our coverage of the 49er and 49er FX World Championships here out of Marina Rubicon in the south of Lanzarote in the Canary Islands, deep in the Atlantic Ocean, same latitude as the Sahara. So uh, uh, really lovely weather all year round here. And that's why sailors choose to train here. And that's why it's an obvious place to have a world championship here. Um, uh, my name is Andy Rice, uh, Stevie Morrison. Uh, former winner of the 49er World Championships. We're, we're about to get right into the centre of your expertise. We're going to be talking about some sailors that you probably raced against. I'm not sure if there's too many of those left because we're going back a few years, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you still know you still know a lot of the guys out there. Your um, your old mucker. Ben Rhodes, you went to two Olympics with him, you won a world championship with him. He's uh, out there coaching the Brits. Um, uh, have you managed to check in with Ben? And, and if so, what's he telling you? Yeah, unfortunately nowadays, Andy, I think I, uh, I know a lot more of the coaches than the sailors. Uh, but there, uh, Erwin Fisher there, I, I actually raced against him in the, the Tour de France out of Wales. So uh, try Morans and, and he, was a, he was a pretty young guy bit of a young upstart but he's had a fantastic start to proceedings and uh, no I've had a bit of a check in with Ben they certainly said it's been hard conditions out there very shifty bandy wind much like we saw in the FX racing really it was a case of you needed to make a pretty bold decision and and commit to that decision fairly hard so hard racing I think the 49ers here it's potentially going to be even tighter than the FX racing I think so the margins is going to be a lot lot smaller and, uh, and it's going to come down to those details. But the French crew, renowned for being very brave in their decision making, they like a bit more breeze. You can <laughs> have a little look there at the size of Clement. He's an absolute man, mountain crew in that boat. And they're renowned when there's a bit of breeze around for being pretty fast. So they'll be looking forward to tomorrow and perhaps hoping to just survive today if it is a bit lighter and shiftier. But, but certainly for what we've seen of their scorecard so far, um, it's um, very much an A-star performance, having done a great job in qualifying. Yeah, Erwan Fischer and Clement Picard certainly setting the pace at this stage. And Erwan uh, was out of action for a few months uh, with, a, with a back injury. And we just got one minute to go to the start of our first uh, men's golf fleet race today. We're going to go for three of them this afternoon, if we manage to get it all in there. The, um, uh, the flag comes down. The U flag comes down, we're into the last minute. But yeah, Fisher had to take a few months out, recovering from back injury, but they seem to be coming in with, with a lot of speed, a lot of commitment. The French in a selection process, no one has been chosen to represent France at their home games at Paris 2024, but certainly Fisher and Pekan are throwing down the gauntlet to the other French, saying, well, look, you've got to be world-class if you're going to represent France at this forthcoming Olympic Games. And they're ahead of Lambriex and Van der Verken, the three-time world champions. Now, we see the in the final 20 seconds, pretty even spread across the start line. The advantages starting at this end is potentially you, you get to tack out earlier if you believe that you, you want to get out to the right-hand side. If you choose the left-hand end, well, that seems to be the more popular end with two seconds to go. Very busy at the pin end. So maybe a bit of bias that they were going for and some port tack starters able to come out the middle of the line. Stevie, that's a, that's a classic Stevie Morrison move in, in certain situations. <laughs> uh, what, what do you make of it so far? Classic Stevie Morrison move if it's the right thing to do, Ricey, is what I'd say there. And by the look of it, we've got a pretty big left shift at the start. So I'd say it is the right thing to do. We've seen how important it is to be on that lifted tack early on the leg. And for these boats that have managed to get at full speed and launching out into the first shift, they're going to be pretty happy. But look, left-hand side of our screen, they're already sailing into less breeze. So they'll be wary of these boats early out on port tack here. Can they stay in the pressure? It's definitely changed a little bit since the earlier racing. I think the wind earlier, there was more shifts to the right. It feels to me like there's good press, pressure sorry, coming around the left-hand side of the island now. So potentially... Those boats are really going to attack that on the left-hand side. And don't be surprised to see a big split in the fleet on this upwind leg. Nora yeah. Ruskula, uh, FX sailor. We've just seen three FX races now. We're into the to the men's 49er racing. Um, have you ever sailed a 49er, the, 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 the big rig? 
Yeah, I have. I actually sailed for the Niner for the first year oh, <laughs> before right. the FX rig came. Uh, I think, it, believe it was 2012. We were tiny, but somehow we managed to. We sailed in the Finnish Grand Prix, the 49er rig, and it was it was ridiculous thinking back that we have done that. But that's how yeah. I was introduced to basically from the 29er to the 49er rig, and then FX. But it's different though; it's bigger. I mean, so, it's not that much bigger, but it's still like a square meter bigger mainsail than. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty powered up, isn't it, this boat? And it, and it doesn't take a lot of wind uh, to get both sailors on the trapeze and, and fully stretched. Uh, but at the moment, Stevie, it, it, looks, it looks like it's got its soft patches still. You were saying a few minutes ago, you, you think maybe the FX uh, fleet had the, the better of the conditions today. You think it's going to get a little bit softer as the afternoon wears on? It wasn't what the forecast was, but it just seemed to get really unstable. And I just wonder if maybe that was a cue for it doing a bit of a shift to the left and coming around the left hand side of that volcano. We'll, I guess we'll find out in the next little bit of time here. But we can see some of the, the early leaders in the fleet are pushing out towards this side of the course. And of course, there's no shortage of talent out there. Australia 25, that's Tom Burton, laser gold medalist from the Rio Olympics. So he's back in the pack. He really needs a good day, I'd say, today. And a shifty day like this, you'd think, would favour an ex-laser world champion, or laser gold medalist, um, picking those shifts up the course. But yeah, look, massive split in the fleet. Very different ideas on what's going to happen out here on the race course. And uh, at the moment, the breeze looks a little bit steadier across the course. But... Um, We'll see. It's definitely not going to be easy, Andy. Stevie, what's your take on the yeah people, uh, sailors that change classes from like laser to the forty nine er, and uh, what do you think of that? Is it similar? Do you think it works? I think yeah. I think um, I mean I think they do a fantastic job of it. We actually had Robert Scheidt, uh came into the forty nine er class for a little bit, so it's definitely not an not an easy transition. Some people have. Uh, done it more or less successfully. Peter Burling, of course, was a 470 crew in the Beijing Olympics, and he's gone on to, uh, well, I think we've heard of him, haven't we? He's done all right, old Pete. Um, but uh, it's definitely not an easy transition. Tom's doing okay. Uh, he's had some good performances. It'll be interesting to get his own uh, report card on it. But I think at this level of sport, it's fine, fine margins. So just your body shape, your mindset. Tom will be used to making decisions at a different speed, more decisions. I think in a 49er, you've got less decisions to make. And uh, But, you know, still comes down to those basic skills. And Tom, we know, is going to have those. So we'll see what he does. But at the moment, Erwin Fisher uh, on board that French boat, France 16, stretching out towards the left. He likes what he sees on this side of the course, and it's a brave, brave decision because he doesn't appear to be looking at the boats on the right too much just yet. Yeah, uh, Erwin Fisher and Clement Picano, current series leaders, looking very good, winning their side of the course at the moment. France 16 ahead of Australia 25 uh, with Tom Burton, the laser Olympic champion that we were just talking about. Um, I, I, oh, there goes Tom Burton, and as soon as they go, so so the French tack as well. So now's the moment of truth as as they're on converging courses. James Peters and Finn Sterrett uh, from Great Britain also tacking, um, and uh, Peters and Sterrett in 11th overall at the moment. They will be hoping for better, and um, they're certainly capable of better. So a day like today could be a big moving day. We've already seen that with the 49er FX. There's huge opportunities in this Gold Fleet racing to make big leaps up the leaderboard. We've sort of seen the Brazilian Olympic champions do really well today and haul themselves back into podium contention. And there's a lot of sailors out here on the 49er course hoping to do the same. I, I think you're a little bit soft on the uh, laser sailors, actually, Stevie. I, I don't think we've really seen a jump out transition from a laser sailor into 49er skiff racing. Um, I, uh, Robert Scheidt wasn't able to do it. Absolute legend in the, in the laser. Maybe he didn't give it long enough. Maybe he was getting too old by the time he had made the transition. Um, and Tom Burton, absolutely amazing sailor. Any, anyone that wins an Olympic gold medal in the laser has to be. But it's a very different type of sailing. You say there are fewer decisions to make in the 49er, and that's because of manoeuvre loss, tack loss, and 
Um, the ability of uh, the, the laser, uh, by contrast, you can tack pretty much whenever you want. It means that every decision that you make, you have to make stick. It has to be made at the right time, and it, it, every decision has more importance hanging on it. Would you agree with that, Stevie? Oh, I, I so agree with that, Andy. I think that's the thing. I, I, you know, I, I used to sail boats like Fireballs, which many of our listeners might not have heard of, but, but a national class in, in the UK and, and Australia, some places around the world. And and I always thought I was quite good at that, but I was really good at that in the sense that when I tacked in the wrong place, I knew I'd got it wrong straight away and could tack back. And and I think the difference when you come to this Olympic level racing is not that anyone's hugely better or, or worse. It's just that if you do make a mistake, you are absolutely hammered for it. So, yeah, a tack loss in a laser. Um, is is way way less than it is in these boats and, and you end up having less decisions to make so when you make them they've got to count uh, and they've got to count a lot and I've got to say that where these boats Tom the French James Peters I think they missed that big left shift at the start so the fact they found themselves on the left hand side of the course I wouldn't think to be great news at the moment it'll be interesting where they come back in with the rest of the fleet they are sailing in clear breeze that's a real positive but I'm interested that they missed that shift at the beginning. And I think they could well be behind things. I think potentially it's the leaders are coming from the right hand side of the course. The tracker is showing at the moment of Julian, Julian de Tolly and Noe Del Pesce. Well, now they are actually a couple of sailors that I know. They're a bit more in my age group. They've come back trying to gain a spot for a home Olympics. Um, and yeah, look at the breeze they've got on this right hand side of the course. Fantastic breeze. And I think potentially for our overall leaders, could be a tricky first race at the moment. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, um, it looks like France 16, who were winning their side of the group, are are way at the back. So the left really hasn't paid, and and um, uh, that really pays into the hands of Dortoli and Delpec, who who remember are also in French selection for Paris 2024, and and they they really need to start attacking their their fellow Frenchmen if if they're going to be considered for Olympic selection for the home games. Nora, it looks like starboard side is is working out pretty nicely as they come in towards the, the top mark. And uh, Bildstein and Hussel, Austria 29, who we can see in the middle of the picture, also doing really nicely here. So it, it, it looks like on this occasion, the right-hand side is working out. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, yeah, on this occasion, exactly. I'm just waiting for, like, the final. Give it two minutes and it'll uh -huh. change. <laughs> One minute. No, but uh, definitely, they, I think they're going to go around the top mark now and the right side came a bit better here. Definitely, the start made a huge difference. Gosh, there's so much happening here. And you're going to be, like, when there's a shift, you have to react right away and just get the best out of it to just get that nose as, as close towards the top mark as possible and sail your own lane. But it looks like they have good breeze. Like, it, it looks p powered, like decent, okay champagne sailing almost. Good, good is it almost that good? <laughs> <laughs> it's getting there. I mean, well, that view is, is champagne, isn't it? Amazing. Exactly. Absolutely beautiful view of the volcanoes in the background. Ar around go the French, Dortoli and Delpec in the lead. So where one French team falters, another steps up, followed by Bildstein and Hussel from Austria, also in a trial to try and qualify to represent uh, Austria at the Games. And then Mollerus and McDermott, um, who briefly lead, uh, led the series earlier on in, the, in this competition, early on in qualifying, they're also doing very well in this race. I believe the, the US teams already actually chose uh, that uh, Henk and Abaros are going for the... Yeah, for you're, the Olympics. You're right. You're and right. So, so, so it's interesting to see now they're still so close to each other and how it like changes the dynamic. I don't know. Does it change anything from one is already of the teams chosen to go? We'll just come back to that in a moment. There's Ooh. New Zealand for uh, the the, uh, the McKeewees. What did you see, Stevie? Just saw a late tack in by Seb Schneider on the Swiss boat there. I wouldn't be at all surprised if that ended up in the protest room later. Coming in on port tack, tacking in underneath. It was pretty tight. He'll argue he got it done in time, and I'm sure there'll be a difference of opinion on that. But yeah, tight racing, and that's what I think we can expect. In that pack from 5th back to 15th, there's going to be just metres in it and a lot to change. But right now, look at that. Fisher, Clement Pican at the back of the pack, and their country mates, rivals for that Olympic spot. Noé Del Pesce stretching out, and there we go. Looking back upwind, 
Looks like the French will be able to jive across some good pressure from here. Here we go. Look, back in helicopter view, the Swiss come in. They need to tack, get onto the starboard tack before the Belgians have to order, alter course. I think possibly they were OK because the Belgians were slightly over the ley line there, but absolutely pushing the limits. I Spen think that's incredible. It looked so tight, but I think it looked clean. Like, just textbook perfect, basically, if you want to squeeze in. Okay, well, uh, we'll see if the Belgians have anything to say whether they agree with it being textbook perfect. <laughs> but, but it is only day one of Golf Fleet. I, I suspect if it was the, the final day or if it was the, the, the cut-off day for qualifying like it was yesterday, we'd probably see that being protested. But maybe they're going to go a little bit softer on them, the Belgians, and, and, and let the Swiss off the hook on this occasion. Yeah, but they also, like, being the Swiss, they really had to go in there because that's the only way I, they could, like, keep that level of sailing. Otherwise, they would have needed to duck four boats or even more than that, and they would have been deep. Yeah, it would so, have been a long way around, that's yeah. for sure. That's for sure. So, so here's our front pack of four and then a bit of a gap back to the next. But as we saw with the F 49er FX racing, it looks like the pack from behind have got a slightly better gust that's carrying them deeper. A double jibe there oh. for, the, for the, the boat in third place. I guess they went to jibe and saw the Americans and thought, oh, no, we can't actually do that. So that was an expensive double jibe executed there. Yeah, you don't normally see that, uh, the, this part of the course, because it costs so much. Maybe they, they must have missed the Americans or something. Yeah, they I must mean, have sometimes been in their blind spot or something. Sales, yeah, you can't just see. Like, even though you try your best and to, to look around and know who's where, of course, there's times when you just lose someone. <laughs> And, and Stevie, that is a big thing. You know, there is a, there's a lot of blind spots with asymmetric racing. Um, really, you, you can't see much to lure at times. So it, it's quite possible that they just, the, the, the Polish didn't realise the Americans were down there, do you reckon? I think so. I mean, it's, uh, you'd have a bit of an idea of it and maybe they felt they could have got across in front. I don't know what they were, what they were thinking exactly. But yeah, there's plenty of blind spots. You've got to keep the picture of what's happening around you constantly in your head. And, and it's nothing more so than when you get to the bottom of the course. We're approaching gate, the gate at the bottom of the racetrack now. We know how tight and congested that can be. But it's when you're coming downwind and there's other boats going upwind, that's when things start to happen really really quickly but now look at this perfect conditions here absolutely flat to the knots on the wire pressing with this big swell behind you so there'll be some interesting technique here as you accelerate down the wave trimming the sails on trying to get the boat going fast and then coming up the other side of the wave we can see the austrians there look like they could swing a little bit harder on the trapeze potentially but they're about to get a bit more breeze and they will roll forward on the french and it's going to be now about the decision which way do you take at the bottom do you turn left or do you turn right and we, um, we really can't say that even after we've watched three races with the 49er FX. It's really, really hard to, to make that call, isn't it? it I, I'm still none the wiser. I mean, looking at the, <laughs> the fleet going, <laughs> going downwind right now, I, it just feels like it's... Okay, it's been crazy, but it's a bit more simple now. Like, the wind is steady, I, I would say. It like, looks like it's a bit more even when it's been... Oh, possibly, possibly. possibly. I, I think I think you're just about to call the commentator's curse on the breeze there, Nora. No. Just as it was getting looking like it was going to get steadier, it's all going to go funky again because that's been oh, how it's been all day today. That would be exciting, though. <laughs> it is. We love it, and I love this view. I oh mean, my! Fantastic drone shot view of watching the Americans charging downwind, and uh, these these are. A privileged moments to be able to see this so close up. It's absolutely incredible to see and have that drone view so close. I mean, you bet you saw the sailors. They're looking back and they're like, "Oh, what is what is this <laughs> thing here following us?" <laughs> I think that, and they were probably looking for the ley line as well. There, we're getting towards the ley line time. So for the helm, there, you're looking through the boom. You'll have a fixed mark on your boom that you use as a reference to try and line things up for this ley line in here. As we see, Julian has decided to take the right-hand turn. It doesn't look a lot of breeze out that side at the moment, so it's interesting to see what he's done. I think I'd be trying to get myself on the lifted tack out of here. We saw, of course, the left-hand side of the racetrack got hammered on that first upwind leg, a lot of places lost. But what was key was getting that lift early. We saw the big left shift at the start, and it was those boats on the shift that really did well. Maybe a little bit more even at the bottom of the course here, and we can see what it is for sure is quite light. 
Isn't it light? It, it looks really soft going around this skate mark, but you can see the darker gusts further up the race course and maybe the back markers will carry that breeze down with them and, and close the gap. And meanwhile, the French have tacked on to port, so they're, they're coming back to consolidate and try and defend their lead. And a good gain by McCarty and McKenzie, the McKiwis from New Zealand, um, now up to second place. They were fourth in last year's World Championship. Uh, that's why they've got NZL4 on their sail. And uh, they've really got some catching up to do because they've, they've not had a great regatta by their standards. Um, a bit of a strange scenario. Logan Dunning Beck and Oscar Gunn not able to compete here. Uh, Dunning Beck injuring himself, a foot injury just a couple of days beforehand during training meant that he had to fly home early uh, to go back to New Zealand. This was going to be a, a trials event uh, to decide who was going to represent New Zealand at the Olympic Games. And I'm, I'm not sure what uh, what the scenario is now um, because Dunning Beck and Gunn not able to, to compete here. So does that mean that they're out of the trials or uh, does that effectively hand it to New Zealand for uh, McCarty and McKenzie? I'm not quite sure, but devastating for them and also for Shimo Fantella who... Um, got uh, it sounds like he's he's uh, got some fairly debilitating illness as well so the croatian sailor had to fly home without competing in these worlds but shime and mihavil his brother fantello i think they're already confirmed for representing croatia at the olympics so uh, as long as I, I texted him the other day and wished him well and he said well you know the second half of the year matters more than the first half of the year. So if he has to miss the Worlds, he can cope with that as long as he, he's back in time for the Games. Yeah, and I think what we see here, as we come back to the screen, it was a good decision at the bottom of the course by uh, by uh, the French crew there because they found themselves in a lot of breeze and those boats that left out of that bottom gate have really run into some light breeze there. Look at this. We're really on board with the US crew. US seem to be loving the drone. And look at the two helm and crew working together, bending those knees. Jib looks a little bit loose. Probably sheet that in a bit, boys. But um, yeah, right now, look, they're just working hard there, bending the knees, trying to keep that boat absolutely flat. But with it being so gusty, they want to be low enough on the trapeze to be able to move forward. And I think physically for the crews in these conditions, thankfully not something I ever had to do. Really, really hard work, working in that forward triangle, hard, hard work on the legs. But you're trying to keep the sails optimised, maximum power, and work your legs around it. And there we go. As soon as you do find the breeze, Julian de Toli there, bit of age and experience out on the trapeze with this French crew. And they've absolutely picked this race course together so far they're nailing it good breeze good pressure moving nicely up the middle of the course so they'll love what they see in race one here but look it, <laughs> i think nora absolutely stitched up the 49ers with her call of saying the breeze is a bit steadier because this second upwind has turned into a bit of jungle ball by the look of it it's really getting crazy and hectic out there and we've got to see what we can do to maximize things look how quickly you can lose distance there the u.s getting rolled over the top of by that kiwi crew Looking at the tracker, it looks like they're uh, like everyone is. They're all on the um, on the port tack, uh, going. They, it looks like they have a left shift and they're kind of following each other. But the speed differences are huge. But see, the the fleet is so close to each other. Like they're not split like the FX. This is just very different right now. And I think definitely the speed differences, as we saw, and how you work the boat is going to make a huge difference. Uh, really interesting to see also what's the next, what's what's next, you know? Are we gonna are we gonna continue like this all the way to the starboard ley line, or will we have something crazy happening, or will they just be like, uh, you know, racing, following each other around the race course? Yeah, I mean, that's the last thing you want to do, of course. If you, if you have any opportunity to split away from the leader, that's what you do. But but the fact that uh, the, the back markers are pretty much following the leaders, we, ha we haven't really seen that, as you just said, Nora. It's, it, it's, it's a different style of sailing, and it just must be so obvious what they need to do at the moment, get out to the right-hand side, that everyone is doing it. Well, yeah, and I think, Ricey, the, the other thing to remember, though, is is you don't deliberately do the wrong thing. <laughs> so every point really counts here. And, and if following the person in front of you is the right thing to do, then it's the right thing to do. Nora said the whole fleet was on a big port lift. They were really sailing the long tack up the course. So I think the right thing to do is probably 
to do that, wait for the next opportunity to make a good tactical decision. If you deliberately do the wrong thing trying to force something, especially this early in the regatta, you're going to come to regret it, I think. So be patient. Wait for your opportunity. If you can turn a 15th into a 12th, that still can be a good result at the end of the week. If you turn an 8th into a 10th, that's pretty stupid. But if the decisions are that obvious, it is all playing into the hands of Dortoli and Del Peck if, it, if it's becoming much more obvious which, to, which way to go up the racetrack. I, I think we can only expect the French to extend. Let's also mention that France has uh, got another boat in second place now. That's Ruel and Amaros, who managed to win a light wind Europeans in Villamora, Portugal, just a few months back at the end of 2023. Yeah. Uh, so uh, another team that we haven't seen the best of this week, uh, but they are coming back into consideration as they lie second in this race at the moment. Also, I'm wondering, where do we have the Dutchies? They have their, yeah, it looks like That's they're deep. That's a very good point. They're very deep. We haven't seen them since the start. They did a start from the from the right side, a bit alone. They tucked away, but maybe they just couldn't get to back to the game or even, like, yeah, get to the game, it seemed like. They, uh, the from Dutch, the, beginning. The, the, the leaders, oh, sorry, second in this Current competition world so far. Yeah. Three-time world champions. They, they are back in about uh, 19th or 20th place at the moment. So, so they are suffering. They're hurting at the moment. That tells a lot about the racing, though. It's, it's not easy. Like, even though you're three-time world champion, sometimes you just can't read the wind. You're just not on top of your game. And then you're sitting 20th or, yeah. And wow. those, those other French who are leading overall um, in the overall regatta, Fisher and Pecum, well, they, they were way at the back. They are now up to about 15th or 16th, but still with a lot of work to do. That's France 16, who you can see in the middle of your picture there. So maybe this yeah, French trial... Yeah, the middle of the picture, Andy. Sorry, sorry you go, to Stevie. interrupt you there, but I... Yeah, sorry to interrupt. The, uh, I think the French trials will very much be all on. There's such a high calibre in that squad. Absolutely. And, and I think it's races like this that's going to make the Dutch crew rue that 20th in the last race of qualifying yesterday. For me, that was a big mistake by them. A bit of an error. We're coming back here on board. On board is that Julienne. It looks like Julienne and Noah. Here we go. Let's watch them set up for attack, maybe. They're sailing into good pressure there. Fantastic camera angle right on board and you see once they're out in front in clear breeze they're not having to bend their legs they've just got the boat going really fast rig looks well set up mainsail looks nicely powered up there and look how flat they sail the boat again absolute lesson for people watching this julian just with his head slightly up on the tiller there keeping his eyes forward no way looking around constant communications between the crew there and they're trying to drive that boat as fast as possible all the time but it's all about are we working in the future or are we work working in the now because right now if you can be looking ahead at the breeze coming down that's absolutely crucial and yeah once you're back in the pack it doesn't matter who you are whether you're a three-time world champion or not it's proven really hard to get through the fleet i think looking there one of the big performers who perhaps needs to be a big performer james peters finn sterrett they've moved from 20th up to 11th so they've had a reasonable move up through the fleet don't think they'll get anywhere near the french team out in front here as we just executed a really nice tack yeah, I was thinking about the communication with uh, within the team. Uh, I saw the crew was looking around a lot, but I think he was looking off the top mark. But normally the skipper would would do that. Uh, what do you think, do you, Stevie? Are there big differences on how they do with the comms within the team? Skippers doing the decisions and looking out for the race course, the big picture, and crew does the speed. Yeah, I think it tends to tends to work out that way. I know for a fact that that Noe is uh, is quite a sort of big tactical influence in that boat. He certainly always was in the racing I I did against him back in the day. So you know, it's definitely it does change crew for crew and team for team. Um, but for sure, it tends to be the crew that takes that boat speed role, slightly more head in the boat, managing that. That'll free up the, the helmsman, the skipper, to actually look out and make the tactical decisions. And someone that's made really good tactical decisions through this race so far is uh, is the, is the, um, the boat in the middle of our screen there, Seb Schneider, the Swiss boat. They've worked really hard. They had that really tight rounding, of course, uh, um, at the top mark first time where they dived inside the Belgians. But they've worked up through the fleet. And it feels like now, is he going to make the good decision? 
Well, I suspect a jibe set coming from the Swiss here. Yeah, I think they did a good job. They weren't looking too good. Oh, they were. They fell. They were like seventh around the bottom mark, and now I was surprised to see them, or eighth, I think. And now I'm surprised to see them in on second place. And we really saw the uh, the Swiss make a step forward last year, getting a medal at the Olympic Test Regatta in Marseille, and then second at the Worlds in the Hague last year. So really turning into a, a world class team. Uh, Sebastian Schneider and Arno de Planta. Around go for the they go for the jibe set. That's Poland 64. They were pretty well up there earlier on, and then the two USA teams really locked together right now. Mollerus and McDermott in USA five, right next to the other USA team. Um, that is uh, Hans Henken. Coming into the the final uh, downwind leg. It's interesting to see that we had a bit of a split within the first first five teams. Like some are going just normal hoist and some are doing the jibe hoist. So I think that will change things up a bit. <laughs> but right now it's really tricky to say what's what's gaining and what works, what doesn't work. But look at this. Wow. I just love it. It looks so pretty. It, it, well, so it, nice. And we couldn't have done this five or ten years ago, certainly ten years ago, because uh, helicopter downwash, you didn't want anywhere near the boat, but a drone you can take so close to the action and it doesn't affect the sails. Yeah, with the helicopter you can, can't even hear your own thoughts, but drone is different. Go, Stevie. Yeah, I just think it was a great camera angle. It showed us how flat these new spinnakers are, and, and it does mean the boats are that bit quicker, but we're back in the pack now, and it doesn't really matter what shape your spinnaker is now. You're just trying to fight for some clear breeze. It's really tight, really messy when you are back in the pack there, and the world champions, the Dutch, they've just jibe set, but they are well back. They'll need some places on this downwind leg because they're sat in 16th right now. The young Uruguayan team, they're coming in, perhaps struggling in gold fleet all starts to happen a little bit quicker but of course this is only the first race of the day plenty left to work out two more races after this one if the breeze stays in for us and uh yeah it's not easy in the pack stevie what would you say of the the new spinnakers or the new sails as in like how powered the spinnaker is you said it was flat but what does that mean yeah I think it, it, it's just a, you have to push the boat. I think what it means is you don't have as many options for where you sail it. You have to kind of constantly be pressing it up towards the breeze and trying to keep the boat loaded. And, and what is interesting with these new rigs is, is, you know, the weight of the cruise has slowly crept up here. We're on board the French crew. We get a little view of their technique. They've got the yellow jerseys on. They won't be liking those yellow jerseys at the moment because they're uh, they're shining quite brightly towards the back of the pack and they'll be wanting to move up through. But yeah, I think these new rigs are a bit more powerful. The crew weights have crept up. So when I was sailing in the boat, an average crew weight of maybe one, four, eight kilos. Then when I did the London Olympics, it had maybe got up to nearer 158, something like that. And nowadays, I think the average two person crew weight is about 165 kilos. So just that little bit more horsepower. You've got to drive the boat fast all the time. And the French have done a pretty good job of that so far. You're giving away some key numbers there, Stevie. I'm, I'm sure those were jealously guarded uh, numbers. I've retired, uh, Ricey, so it doesn't matter, mate. <laughs> no, it's great. I love it. I, I absolutely <laughs> love it. I mean, everyone was always trying to guess what, what the, the leading team uh, were weighing at the time. And Pete Burling and Blair Chuk really shifted the, the trend, I think. We didn't used to think of the 49er as, as having big helms, but he, he's a tall guy that was able to get around the boat really smoothly. And, and, and you see that trend of tall helm and slightly shorter crew is a, a lot more common these days than, than in the early days of 49er racing. Beautiful swell yeah, there for so. the leaders. Sorry, sorry, Stevie. Yeah, you go. No, that's all right. It's beautiful. So I know I was just saying, I think it is, a, it is a trend, but it's a natural trend, really. The helms are constantly out on the trapeze, really. It's a, it's a good place to have that weight towards the back of the boat. And it then allows you to have a real powerhouse around the front. But yeah, as you say, I mean, when I was sailing 49ers, I was almost big for a helm. Um, so things have definitely changed as we see the French coming in here, just missing out on that lured gate. There's going to be one more manoeuvre for them to do before the finish. And it's tightened up at the bottom, but I think they're going to hang on and take the race win. First race win in finals here 
And that's going to be good news on the overall for Dortoli and Depeche. That's going to put them right back in the mix. Absolutely. A very important gain when you think about those French selections. And second across the line is Swiss number two. Very good gain for them during the course of that race. And then it's the, the European champions, uh, uh, Lucas Ruel and Emile Amoros, third across the line. So good races for the French, but not the French that have been leading so far. Good for New Zealand and for the Belgians. Austri that was a tight finish, though, with the New Zealand and Belgians. They were coming exactly at the same time. Right, OK. So we're a photo finish for them, followed by the Austrians, who, who were right up there early on and still had a pretty good finish. And then Diego Botin and Florian Trittel just going into a jibe. Uh, these guys finished second in the Worlds a couple of years ago um, and uh, didn't have such a good Worlds last year, but really keen to show what they can do on home waters. Here comes Poland, 64 across the line, but still no sign of the Dutch quite yet. Um, USA, 84 coming across the line, close to screen. That's Poland, 7. Where is Netherlands 1? We still can't see Netherlands 1. So I believe Netherlands 1 is with the black spinnaker all the way in the behind there. Their rank, uh, what are they now? 15? So, so 15. They, they couldn't find a way throughout the fleet to gain any, any, any rank, <laughs> gain the ranking, <laughs> climb the ladder <laughs> in this race at all. Peters and Sterrett just across the line, GBR 30, then Italy 23, and then uh, the other, James Grummet, Ros Hawes, uh, GBR 12, having a great regatta so far, coming into the day in fourth. And then finally, Bart Lambriex and Van der Verken come across in a very lowly, by their standards, 15th place. So there's a picture of our race winners, Dortoli and Del Peck from France, very well sailed by them. And we will update you at some point with, with how that brings them up the leaderboard and, and show us the points gap back to France 16. France 16 still crossing somewhere near the back of this race. So things really being shaken up in these lighter breezes today. They have, but looking at the stats from this, this race, it, it looks pretty like even. The, fir the French kept the lead the whole way. Uh, the Swiss did a bit of a yeah, a bit of a climb in that top mark rounding, squeezed in, <laughs> and uh, after that, looking at the, it's you know the ones who rounded fourth stayed around fourth or fifth, not nothing crazy. So a bit more consistent, yeah, a bit more stability in that race than than what we saw with the up and down racing in the 49er FX. And I'm also surprised with the weather because I thought. It was looking like it's going to get super soft and not much wind. And I'm already thinking like, wow, do the 49ers, will they have any wind at this race? But it, it picked up. So. And luckily, they don't, they don't seem to need a lot of breeze uh, to keep them going. So that's one of the great things about the 49er is you can still keep the races going in, in not that much breeze. So Fisher and Pecan, they were 18th across the finish line. So... Pretty disastrous for them, but it but it makes things interesting with the French trials with uh, Dortoli and Del Peck possibly up into the top five with with that race win, and uh, Lam Lambrix and Van der Verken now down to uh, well still in second place, but but a bit more of a gap now to the uh, to the leaders. But uh, we hear that we have a, a chance of speaking to our race winners or certainly hearing some answers from them. I'm not sure we can speak to them directly, but we can certainly find out what Julian and Noah have to say about the way that they won that race just now. Hi. Um, yes, of course, the uh, start on the first shift are always uh, very important, uh, especially when you're in this kind of uh, condition with uh, onshore wind. Uh, well, we managed to get the first uh, left shift uh, quite well and we we were the first on tack, and uh, then we go straight. Uh, the, the shift uh, stayed quite long, so we did a big, uh, a very long uh, port, uh, port leg on the first, uh, on the first leg, and uh, then we were on first, and we just tried to control the other. So when you when you run on first, then it's quite uh, the life is a bit more more easier, easier. Uh, well, about the next race, 
I think every race will be quite different. So the wind is quite uh, is very tricky. There's some uh, some low pressure on uh, quite high pressure. The difference on pressure are really really big. So we'll try to to take each race one each other, and uh, we'll see what happens. Thanks to Noé because he make an incredible job in the first up win, and then we after we was first, and uh, thanks for for the support uh, to our family, to our friend, and for sure the GTP. Thank you. There we have it, Julian and Noé, and uh, luckily for us, they speak great English as well. So, Stevie, how far back do you go with them? No, it's, I can't hear Stevie at the moment. We'll see if we can get him. See if we can get Stevie Sorry, back in Andy, again. Sorry, Andy, I back back now. I think hopefully, but uh, yeah, I've known them uh, known them a long time. They've been in the fleet a long time. They actually retired after the Rio Olympics, but of course, the chance of a home Olympics was too much to resist. So they came came back and uh, and they did a great job, as as he said. It's maybe something. Oh, here we go. Look at the Dutch at the top end of the line. That's why they were back in the pack. Big mistake on their trigger off the start line. Their boat rolled into windward. We didn't see that at the time. But, yeah, this was the moment here. Big rotation left in the wing. I think this may be something about the French accent that manages to make something sound very, very simple uh, because it was very easy. We just take the long tack and uh, we stay on this until it shifts back. Noé managed to uh, to make racing sound very, very simple. And that is ultimately what they did. Great use of the first shift, got out in front and then made some brilliant decisions from there on in. So uh, good to see them doing it. Good to see them doing it for the old guys. In the fleet, I still would love to think I could get back in a 49er, but unfortunately my body and my back tend to disagree with me. Um, and uh, it's just such fun racing. Look how tight it is. This goal fleet, always so close. Seb Schneider there, really tight decision. Probably okay. I think that'll get a clean decision. Probably won't end up in the protest room. But yeah, he did a nice job coming back through the fleet. And we saw, even if you're the best in the world, if you are at the back of the pack, it's pretty hard to find gaps past people there because you're just fighting around for scraps. Quite a lot of roll in that jibe we saw with USA 5 there, digging the wing in. Um, but great to, to have these drone shots that are taking us so close into the boats. Haven't seen anyone wave a drone out the way yet, so that's, that's good to see. I'd certainly be waving a helicopter out the way if it was anywhere as close as that. Beautiful tack there by the French who end up winning this race and lovely bear away into the jibe set keeping the momentum on the boat all the way through and pop bang goes the the green jenica and straight into acceleration mode and down the race course yeah this like the sailing of the guy it just makes it look everything so simple you know they the kite just flies up and suddenly they're on the trapeze and gosh like so much technique and training and uh, yeah, fitness that goes into these boats to make it look easy is incredible. Beautiful footwork, isn't it? And the the way they move from side to side across the boat. And well done to Sebastian Schneider, Arno de Plantas, number two on the sail, number two on the scoreboard in that race. So... We have two more races to go this afternoon. This is day four of the 49er and 49er FX uh, uh, World Championship in Lanzarote. We're racing out of Marina Rubicon, and there are our 25 competitors. And if you're enjoying this and you want to tell other people about it, well, um, please do pass on 49er.org. Subscribe to, to all your friends, to anyone that, would, that wants to... Uh, enjoy this as well. Um, sign up to the YouTube channel. Make sure that you get the coverage for the next couple of days as well because we've got more Gold Fleet racing on the next two days and on the final day on the Sunday we, we have our last Gold Fleet races before the top 10 of the women in the FX and the top 10 in the men go into the double point no discard medal series and that's where, sorry, medal race. That's where the uh, the, the medals will, will be finally decided and we will find out if Bart Lambrex and Floris van der Verken can win a fourth consecutive world title for the Netherlands or, or maybe the French or, or maybe any one of these other teams can go ahead and uh, take the, the world title, the last world championship title available before the Paris 2024 Games. So 
We've got five minutes. Let's go to a quick break and we will be back to you shortly. Welcome back to the 49er and 49er FX World Championships in Lanzarote. Hi, I'm Andy Rice and with Nora Ruskala and Stevie Morrison, we are bringing you more action from this afternoon. We've already had three 49er FX races for the women. Uh, we've just completed race one of Gold Fleet for the 49er men. And that was won by one of the French teams, uh, Julien de Tolly and Noé Del Peck. And we are about to get into race two. And whose turn will it be this time? Uh, Stevie Morrison, we saw a... Do you think the main sheet got dropped with the with the Dutch boat? Is that what happened? Really disastrous start for I them. Think, for the. Yeah, I think so, Andy. I think uh, it'll often be a transition between the helm and the crew in that in that moment for the pre-start there. And, it, and it's all... There's quite a lot happening. But yeah, if you... If you pull the trigger and then let go of the trigger at that moment in time it all gets pretty bad pretty quick and they were suddenly out the back door so certainly something they'll be kicking themselves about the hours and hours of practice to make sure that sort of thing doesn't happen but equally something you can easily resolve they won't normally do that silly mistake right okay wipe the slate clean and let's go and forward now as we see this was on the start here you see them start to accelerate and then bang boom just goes out they fall into windward and there the rest of the fleet are sailing off and they're sailing away from where they want to be going. So it was a costly error, but something they can definitely rectify. But look how tight this pre-race positioning is in the 49er fleet. I think that pre-race boat handling means that it is all a lot, lot tighter. And we saw how important the start was. 
both Fisher and Pekin here and Lambro and Workin didn't get good starts. And it doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't get off the start line and in a position to take the first shift, you're struggling. Well, the exciting thing for us is that that has closed up the gap um, on the leaderboard. We haven't got runaway leaders the way that it was looking a day or so ago. And here they are off the start line. Great start for Ireland 99 out of the middle of the track and also for Uruguay 14 who have started off the pin end. So, so great for them. And then you look to the right and there's a couple of teams, USA 84 and New Zealand 4, that have decided to start on Port Tack and that all looks a little bit ragged to me Nora I'm, I'm quite surprised that that doesn't look like an Olympic class start we've just seen there I don't know what you're referring to but yeah I did see uh, our, our Dutch team struggling again being a bit behind but uh, otherwise I think it was an okay start um, well, I, I just mean that already they're, they're, you don't see a clear line of boats all fighting neck and neck for, for front Andy. row there's Andy, yeah, yeah, I, just think, I think it's a great point you've made. And I think the, the point, the reason that you say that is there was a big wind shift just before the start, I think. So suddenly the line went from being relatively square to quite pin end bias really quickly. And then people are basically having to react on the hoof real fast. And I think that's why it does all look a little bit, a little bit scrappy in terms of the handling. They're all having to accelerate in a high mode because they're struggling to hold a lane at that pin end. And then they all desperately want to get onto port tack. They want to get onto that lifted tack as soon as possible. And we saw the French there were, uh, were early to manage to do that. These two down at the bottom here, the Dutch and, and, the, and the French that were leading overall, they're, they're on port tack early, but from a long way back in the fleet. So they were struggling early on in the race. But yeah, I think you're right. It did look a bit scrappy, but that's what happens. It's shifty, gusty wind. The dynamics changing. The race track is changing all the time. And when it changes with about five seconds to go, things tend to get a bit ragged. Now it really looks like the ones that could keep their clear lane are doing so good right now. Like Uruguay kept their lane. Ireland lost it a bit. They're falling falling into the Belgian here in front of us. But we have like clear leaders here from Uruguay for the le left side of the fleet. And then on the right side of the fleet are the wait, Dutch were there. I can't. Is it the French that are? They look like they're in the lead overall. Yes, the French is. They kept their right. They're going committed, going to the right. Let's see how far are they gonna go and push it all the way to the corner now, or uh, come back to the left. Especially there's a bit more, bit more boats going to the left, so that could be a bit risky. But they're already all in. The right side, so they absolutely are, aren't they, Nora? Committed. I mean, they they have all the options to to tack across onto starboard if they want to, but they're choosing not to take it. So, Erwin Fisher and Clement Pekin choosing to stick to their guns. And Stevie, you, you said they're not afraid of making some bold decisions. That's what we're seeing right now. Sorry, mate. That's uh, yeah. I think the French, you know, they've made some pretty big decisions. And they need a good re result here, but they are they are renowned for doing that, for taking a confident decision and looking for good races. I mean, if you look at their scorecard, they've got a lot of got a lot of race wins, but they have had the odds slip up. But um, I think ultimately a big decision and then committing to it is often a good way of going about things. But right now it looks like fairly good pressure on the left as we see the Irish and the Uruguayans. I would expect the Uruguayans to tack pretty soon. They're fairly exposed out here. But Belgium up the middle looks like he's got a good angle. And I'm not sure how it's going to look for the French on that top of our screen at the moment. They look pretty light and headed. Yeah, Belgium does look like the strongest right now, don't they? Not only in the middle of the pack, they, they look like they've tacked onto port into what's about to be a decent lifting gust on port tack. So let's see how Belgium manages to profit from what they're getting in the middle of the race course right now. Denmark 66 coming out this way. And uh, this is Frederik Rask and Jakob Pret Jensen. They didn't start the, uh, the Danish trials so well. They needed to make a good comeback here. Um, they're lying in about 14th place in this competition so far. And yeah, we expect a bit more of Rask and Jensen. So they're not f sailing up to full standard by, uh, by, by, their, by their typical high standards. Let's see if they can do something better during the, the final two and a half days of this competition. But Belgium, as we, as we were just talking about earlier, Nora, they look like they're doing pretty well coming out 
of the the middle of the course on Port Tack. They definitely look like they're leading the the pack, let's say, the fleet. Uh, it's not as split as it was in the previous race, where you saw clearly like pe- uh, boats on the right and on the left. Now it looks more congested, if I want to say from this point of view. Uh, and also it looks like they have a bit of a lift on, on this port, port tack. So that's good. It's actually, def- it looks so, so good for the Belgians. It like, does. I would love to be in that position right now. You, feel you have the control of the fleet, let's say so. And it'd be interesting to see how Netherlands won do uh, fare against France 16. France 16 went all the way out to the right. Netherlands won tacked off earlier. I don't think they're doing particularly great either, but maybe they've limited the damage a bit more than the French. It'll be interesting to see how the, those two come out against each other. Yeah, it looks like the Dutch, they were doing so well and now now they're actually a bit behind and in the middle. But I mean, we, It's hard to tell from this this angle, but I, I, I'm not sure what happened there. Did they get a bit stuck? Sometimes it can be that you you just don't want to tack away because there's no shift and then if you, yeah. They, they tacked away when they weren't forced away. They, they chose to tack on to starboard. And when they went back into the middle of the course, it didn't seem to be with particularly strong breeze. Um, so I, I wonder if they suffered for boat speed for, for a couple of minutes there. But Belgium, they, they look like it's going a little bit softer for them, bottom right of our screen now. Stevie, what do you make of Belgium's position now? Are they, they still safe? Oh, I'm not sure you're ever safe out here, that's for sure. But they they look like they're bow forward enough versus the boat in the top left-hand side of the screen there. We don't know who that is. I think it might be the French boat, actually, that's pushed out up there. But I think they're quite well positioned. It's going to depend a little bit on ley line. That's a good camera angle. It looks like they're right on the edge of the gust up there at the top of the Belgian boat. Um, they're just hanging in it. It's going to depend literally where they are on ley line. There's the French right-hand side of our screen. So they're in good breeze now, but the wind is staying fairly well to the left. So I think Belgium should be fine, but I'd be pretty keen to be sailing a fast mode and roll forward on everyone while I had that left pressure. There we are from the other angle. And so that's what it looks like from the Belgian perspective. It looks like Poland 7 is pushing forwards a little bit on Belgium, maybe slightly better pace from the Polish boat. And there um, in the middle is the French. The French just tacking on to starboard. So France 16, who have really enjoyed being on the right-hand side of this, still not doing too badly. It doesn't look like the French are going to lead around this first mile, but France 16 not doing too badly coming from the right. Also, it looks like they're pretty, like they have a lot of space now. Like each boat have their own lane, just like focusing on basically boat speed. I'd say, I don't know, Stevie, what do you think would go through your head right now? Yeah, I think the the, the decisions are made for those first few boats. They're pretty much into ley line from here. Uh, And I think the Polish just stayed slightly better in the breeze. That camera angle we had before showed that the Belgians were to the top of it. There you go. Belgium decide to tack before the Polish. Slightly surprising decision there. Maybe a big miss of the ley line by the Polish if the Belgians are right here. But it's light at the top of the race course. So we can expect this downwind to be pretty dynamic. I think, yeah, now we've made our decision to tack. It's time to get your head out of the boat. What was good on that last leg? Where's the breeze going to be for this exit from the windward mark? Because we've seen that ultimately this decision at mark one has been a really, really big decision to have to make. Looks to me like the poles are overlaid. That booms well down. Could be a bit of a mistake by the Polish. Open the door for the Belgium here. That was potentially an extra 150 metres sailed for no good reason at all by the Poles. They'll be kicking themselves, but they may just be able to get fast enough forward here over the top of the Belgians. Let's see. Yeah, they for sure lost a bit maybe, but like keeping the speed still okay with this, with these wins. And the Belgians were, I mean, I guess it was far away and they knew where the ley line is, so they do that early. Oh, you can actually see the Belgians were... Wait, they also kept some some space to the ley line. Yeah, so yeah, a big so a big miss by Poland really uh, to to give so much distance away to Belgium, but still very much in the hunt for leading this race, and it's going to be a jibe set from Poland. Yeah. Oh, not, not a great one. Yeah, no. Wow. What I wonder <laughs> what happened there. It definitely, that yeah, was a full a stop. Little, little bit slow into the turn there, I think, Nora. They didn't really commit to it. I wonder how the communication was on board there. And again, 
back to that first race, blind spots. As we see the Dutch, they've wiggled hard at the top here. Whoa. They've managed to get themselves back into it. But yeah, jibe setting when you're in this first mark and there's a lot of boats around, you can get pretty twitchy if you haven't seen all the boats. So I wonder if the Polish got a bit spooked, thought they saw a boat last minute and then didn't here as it's really tight at the top. Look at this, the Irish, oh my word, they're in Coffin Corner on board that Irish boat. They've got no right of way here. This is, could be a long couple oh, of minutes for this young Irish crew. Can they find a gap to tack back in? Maybe just, yes, oh, well worked. Brutal. But it's tight. They lost a lot there. Yeah, I mean, uh, when the boat slows down, you lose steerage because the rudders on these boats only work when they're actually moving forward. So you can't steer the boat unless you've actually got a bit of forward momentum. Beautiful shot of the Belgians there. Looking like they're in good breeze as they're charging downwind. But uh, yeah, it, they have a good breeze, but looking like the fleet behind them, all the boats, they're going even lower than them. That means that there has there's some new wind to the boats from behind. As we saw in the, all the races today, it's when you approach, when you go downwind, you kind of want to, you get the breeze from behind. So you're in advantage when you're in the behind and you have more options. As the one in the lead are actually, it's a bit scary to be there. Look, look who is bringing up the rear, Stevie. Can you believe it? Wow. Winners of the previous race now back in last position. What does that tell us about 49er Gold Fleet Racing? <laughs> it tells us, tells us that it's pretty tight and the mistakes are easily made, but it tells us a bit more perhaps about Julian and, and Noe's style. Quite aggressive. If you look at their results through the through Regatta, they've had a lot of first places, but they've had a lot of uh, 20th. So if you've ever watched the movie... Um, Talladega Knights. They've got a real bit of a Ricky Bobby about them at the moment. If you're not first, you're last on board that French boat. Um, but yeah, they're choosing to to sort of sail the boat aggressively, and uh, and and that, when that goes well, it's great, and when it doesn't, it gets pretty painful. And I think as we see now, we see in the middle of the pack, you've got Lambrou and Verkan and Fisher and Pecan, seventh and eighth, and that's really potentially a real world title battle here. They're in the middle of the pack. Who can gain a couple of places? Who can stay ahead of each other? As the Belgians, well, they've done a great job on this downwind. The jibe set did not go well for the Polish there. And it's a gain to Belgium. They'll be looking nicely set up for the bottom gate. Yannick Lefebvre and Ewan Bertin on the Belgium boat. They started the day in 21st, so they only just qualified inside of Gold Fleet, but this will do them the power of good. You just wonder what this will do if they manage to hold on to this race win. Where will this get them up to? It will certainly get them up into the teens and, and maybe even better than that. So uh, great race for Belgium so far and good for the Polish. And the Polish are in a selection battle. Um, it, it's not a, a points-based system for Poland. It, obviously, points matter, but it, it's actually a selection by a, a panel uh, from Poland. So you, you, it's, it's not just the results you get on the, on the water. It's, uh, it's whether people think you've got the right stuff for going to the Olympics. Well, that's a fairly hard decision to make, I'd say, Ricey. I'd quite like that to be <laughs> to be based on results rather than their thing here. But we see the Belgians, Yannick. He's hoping to qualify the nation for the Olympics, Yannick Lebeuf. He was actually sailing when I was sailing as well. So he's done a really long stint in the class. And, and word on the street is that this will be his last World Championships. Obviously, he'll be hoping to qualify for the Games to, to make it one last swan song representing his country at the Olympics. But right now, he's doing no harm in that challenge, leading the fleet here as we see the gust. And look at the size of that swell. That swell really is looking a lot bigger. And I think that's causing a few mistakes, especially downwind with the boat handling. Heel angle is absolutely crucial into these manoeuvres. You need the boat flat or even with a little click of windward heel before you set up for a jibe. And we're seeing the boats there. They're getting a little bit stuck into the manoeuvres, catching wings and... Uh, yeah, that's not something you'd want to see from a coaching perspective. So a lot of tidying up to be done, but I think we'll put it down to the swell. Okay, we're approaching now the bottom mark, the first first bottom mark of this race. And uh, I think this will, yeah, make it, you really see a difference of, uh, yeah, we have the two, two marks to round between and or choose between and which one will, will be the, one that has a bigger advantage of it's. I mean, it looks pretty like 50-50 right now. 
Well, the Belgians like the left. That's what we're looking at now, followed by Italy. And first out of the right-hand side, it's the British team, Grummet and Hawes. And uh, these guys are, are really showing a, a new side to themselves. They've, they've been up in the top four. They started the day in fourth. Um, but the Olympic selection for Great Britain's already gone to James Peters and Finn Sterrett a little bit further back in this race. But Grummet and Hawes putting a, a real marker down for, uh, of their intent for the Los Angeles 2028 campaign uh, four years from now. Yeah, Belgian they seem 24th. to have. They've sailed a, sailed a great start to things, haven't they, in, in their young career to sailing together. They're both a couple of human levers, really. They're both pretty tall lads. James is really in that mould of a, a tall helm uh, at the back of the boat there. And I think, you know, James Peters very deservedly got the Olympic spot, but it was selected a long way out. And that's a, a strategy that the British have chosen this time. They've selected them a year in advance, which, uh, you know, hopefully will give James the, the option to, to work on things specifically. But they're definitely struggling for form at the minute, back in 14th and 15th in this race. And James Grummet showing us in the lead. And, and I guess just that freedom and confidence of being a new team, Nuno, you know, lots to work on, but plenty to enjoy those gains as you get better. And it looked to me like early gain at that bottom gate was to the people that turned left. They were the first boat on the lift. Belgium, Yannick sailed on a bit of a header to start with out of the bottom gate. And so, yeah, James Grummet, Ross Hawes, they're up to first at the moment, working their way through the fleet nicely. We've seen some of the, or we are actually talking about like how some of the, some of the, especially the 49er teams have taken a couple of years off do you know, Stevie, which teams didn't the British team at least take a couple of years off as well, and the Dutch? <laughs> yeah, I know that the I know that certainly James Peters and, and Finn Sterrett after they you know they were beaten to selection by by Dylan Fletcher and, and Stu Biffle, who of course got the gold medal in Tokyo, um, and and so James and Finn took some time off. They've been sailing the 49er for a long time. James was in it. And Finn was in it back when I was sailing it. So they're, uh, they've done a lot of 49er sailing. And I guess you need to be mentally fresh. It's a big commitment, this Olympic sailing. It's a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, but it gets hard the longer you do it. You, you, you kind of tend to focus on your mistakes. That's how you get better. But, but after a while, there comes to be some things you can't, uh, you can't get better at. So I think perhaps for James, he needs to remember his RS200 sailing when he's racing around over here in the UK and, and just get back to enjoying his racing, which I think is what I'm seeing James Grummet and, uh, and Ross Hawes doing. They're just out there sailing freely, sailing relaxed, and, and in many ways performing well above their expectations. And as soon as you're doing that, it's a pretty nice thing. You don't feel like you need any time off. Enjoying your racing, when, when this is your job and, and this is how you earn a living and you have to keep on showing up with with world-class performances, I, I can see how the enjoyment can start to slip away. So, Stevie, what, what is the, what's the medicine for that? How, how do you keep on going and keep on enjoying it when actually you'd rather take a break? Well, yeah, that's the million dollar question, isn't it, Andy? I think you have to, you have to, you, know, you hear people talk about the process and, and making sure you've got specific areas to work on. I think uh, it's making sure you have those. I think at some point you need to actually feel like you're getting better at things and be positive and see, you know, look at your super strengths, look at the areas you're good at and pat yourself on the back because ultimately you can spend a lot of time criticizing yourself and saying where well, you're not good enough. And then secondly, that camera angle there does it justice, I see, Andy. You're out in Lanzarote, you're sailing a boat, and you're pretending to all your mates at home that that's your job. So, you know, sometimes a little <laughs> dose of realism needs to stick in that we're some of the luckiest people in the world to get to do that. Uh, and, and let's enjoy it while we can, because very soon you'll be like Stevie Morris and Andy Rice sat on a sofa, only able to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> every bad decision out here is just a first world problem isn't it it's only ever a exactly. first world problem <laughs> <laughs> now meanwhile james grummet and ros Hawes, they just tack on to port they've got lots of space around them i think is that the dutch boat that we see in the distance just beyond them Correct. so they're in seventh place nora so um it's uh it's pretty wide open racetrack right now isn't it up the front of this it is. We, oh, we can't see on the, on the tracking, we can see that they're, yeah, seventh, but on the, on the picture here, it looks like they're the third currently. We can't see the other boats, but this, you can see beautifully the split here. They're all the way, they're 
pretty far to the right, and then the Brits went all the way to the left here. Then you have the who's the team that like furthest right? It looks like Switzerland. Oh no, sorry, the one in the the That's middle the above yeah. the oh, British. It's the, That's the French. French. On yeah, the yeah. Furthest right. Yeah, they're so far away. I'm like, are we way over ley line, or does it just look like that? But they're really close to the land, actually. Now we can see here on the tracking. Yeah, the French have gone far. Uh, looks good right now, but as we know, the wind shifts. Not as crazy as it was in the morning. Way more stable now. So it could work for them, and they could just, yeah, maintain the lead. And it, it doesn't look great for Great Britain 12 on the left-hand side at the moment. If the angles were to stay that way, it really looks like Netherlands 1 has made good gains back on them. Um, and meanwhile, France 16 up in the lead on the right-hand side. Well, that's all well and good at the moment. But Stevie, they've broken that, uh, that golden rule of getting up onto ley line early, leaving themselves no tactical options. Would you agree? Well, they've got no tactical options, but if they're up there and the pressure, they've seen wind and they're going to stay in the breeze, then it won't matter for them. So ultimately, it's now in the hands of, uh, what was he called? Zephyrus, we talked about earlier, wasn't it? It's in the wind god's hands right now. And can we find pressure up there? So if the French, have, I think what they've done ultimately is they got a reasonable left shift at the bottom of the course. And we can see there the British, they're sailing in pressure coming down from the right. So that is good news for the French crew because it looks solid off the shore for me. So yes, no tactical options, but that means the French can just put their head down, think about nothing else other than going fast. And I think they could be quite well positioned up there. But, you know, the Dutch middle of our screen, they're well positioned as well in nice breeze. They're sailing across a great finger of pressure at the moment. And it could be a decent jump out for these first few boats. So yeah, French have got no more cards to play. They need to hope that the hand stays in their favour. But if it does, they'll be fine. I like where the Dutch are. I think they've given themselves options. They're probably going to definitely be in the top two. If it comes left, it's going to be good news for Grummet. If it goes right, it's going to be good news for Fisher. But if it goes either way, then I think the Dutch will still be in there. Yeah, the Dutch have definitely climbed up the leaderboard uh, since from the beginning of the race today. They were seventh and ninth in the two past uh, Mark roundings and currently, yeah, looks like they're first right now. So now we're not well talking sailed. about the, we're not talking about Belgium anymore, are we? I mean, no, considering that Belgium were, were leading a, around the uh, the left hand gate mark at the bottom of the course, and they seem to have fallen completely out of contention. While there's some others coming up into consideration up the the front of the fleet, and I, I think Peters and Sarah for example, have had a pretty good comeback. The other British team, GBR 30. So so there's a lot of place changing going on behind the front pack. Yeah, the Belgians are currently going towards the right, but they're behind a lot of boats that are on top of them windward. So they, they will struggle to get out from there. They're a bit of in a locked position. So they're down, down to about it was somewhere in the late teens, the, the Belgians. So that's been a massive fall from grace. Uh, for Belgium after leading this race in the early stages. It's shocking how quickly that's happened. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, what do you make of the positioning of Netherlands 1 here? They seem to be having a, a good beat here, Stevie. They've sailed it. They've sailed a really nice upwind leg. It was good to be a little bit to the right of the pack early on on the leg. I think that's where the Belgians lost out. They got left early and, and I think they ran into a bit less breeze. The the, the the Dutch really have come straight up the middle of the course uh, would be if you were to put a line pretty much as straight as you could hope for. And they've just kept themselves with options and in good pressure. Now, of course, you've got to get those opportunities, but they've certainly taken big advantage of them. Same with Diego Bortin, right hand side of our screen there. Him and Florian Trittle, they're up to six. They were 15th at the bottom gate. Sailing a nice wind shift up the middle of the course here. The French, well, they, they're, not, they're not scared, are they? They've hung it out there. Uh, and they're still pretty much in the match here, the French crew, that's for sure. But they've been a lot braver about it. And they've been happy to roll the dice. And at the moment, good pressure. They can see the Dutch are quite comfortably ahead of them. But the French will be happy just to get a solid race in today and chase him back through. Because they would have been heart in the mouth for a while. They were a long, long way out on that right-hand side, very exposed. It really looks like uh, the ones that have been going towards the right in the end, they approach, they take like, a, they go a bit over the ley line to give them more space. Maybe has been 
yeah, knocking by the time they're coming to the mark and there's a lot of changes. But a lot of them, I think, prefer to come with speed towards the mark and that has looked to be working. And then you have the opposites, like the Dutch that approached from the left side and just went around the, the top mark. Oh, that is magic. That That's the kind of stuff that freaks me out when, when someone j just manages to sneak through the middle and, and suddenly take the lead of a race like that. That is just phenomenal sailing and, and possibly one of the most important legs that the Dutch have sailed in this championship so far. Exactly. And especially as normally it looks, yeah, you have more opportunities to come from the sides and win the races. And when you, when you just sneak up, it's like, what, what, where did you come from? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Stevie, what's your take? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it, you don't win as many world championships as <laughs> these guys without having wow. those those sort of skills in the in the bag. And I, I think what it comes from is is they've got the ability to sail. They put the hours in. The reason we train so hard in these boats is to be able to sail the boat like they are there. Well, oh, I mean, I'm about to get seasick following that one at the moment. But uh, they're sailing the boat so flat, but they're doing that fast efficiently and then able to have their head out of the boat and as we see the spanish have done the same they put those hours in that you can sail the boat and then get your head out now is it luck of course it's not luck but you probably need the cards to fall your way that you get the wind shifts come come to you as they do but then having the head out of the boat and knowing that the boat's sailing still 98 percent of its potential top speed that comes from hard hard work and hours and hours on the water so yeah i think the french strategy was a lot more high risk. The Dutch was just good quality execution up the middle. Both have worked out pretty well for them. They'd be more than happy to get a fourth uh, or a first on a day like today, really, when there's such big banana skins out there. But yeah, just hard work that was, I think, by the Dutch. And then the, when the cards came their way, they were more than capable of taking advantage. So charging down the final run towards the finish, the, the Dutch certainly in position to win this race. We're looking at the French, France 16 and GBR 12. This is the battle at the moment for third and fourth place. Um, I think the French maybe will be regretting having been so extreme going out to the right um, and not being able to continue to lead this race because they seem to have the, the lead at some point during that windward leg. Uh, but still, if they can get a third or a fourth out of this race, that wouldn't be at all bad either. No, and they just rolled the Brits, so the Brits had to jibe away. That means that they basically made the Brits jibe. So they, I guess it looks like they really want to commit hard to the right side, looking from the bottom. And here we can see we, yeah, the French there, France 16, is still committed. Now they actually jibe, so yeah joining the fleet but I, I would say the left side gosh with the Dutch and the Spanish they're coming well <laughs> they are aren't they they, they look like the uh, the angle on Port Jibe in towards the finish is looking pretty good for the Dutch leaders and the Spanish in second so it looks at the moment like we can still expect the Dutch to continue to win this race maybe they're under a little bit of threat from Spain 74 from Botin and Trittle and France 16, GBR 12 also in contention. So very close between those front four boats right now. It's really interesting to see the boats in a trittle, the Spanish. They were 15th and 12th in the first marks. And now they're, they're second. And now, yeah, basically first or second. I don't know where they came from. They just appeared. Yeah, amazing. Wow. So, so this is, this is the, uh, the Spanish that... We're looking at, they're looking like, like they've got the yellow bibs of the leaders, but actually those are the, the Spanish Federation bibs. And charging along, just riding this massive swell. Must be beautiful conditions to be enjoying 49er racing. The Spanish going into a jibe, jibing down the face of a big wave, up over the top of that, just going past the gate mark, down towards the finish. And is this going to be a race win for Spain 74? It's going to be close, but it looks like Botin yeah. and Trittle have done enough. They've managed to overtake the Netherlands 
on the final. Oh, it's a bit of a shaky jibe by the Netherlands on the right-hand side. So it's a race win confirmed for Spain. It's going to be very close for second. It looks like the Dutch have done just enough to hold on to second place ahead of France 16 in third. And across the line come GBR 12 for fourth place. And then the next boat along, I think, is going to be one of the Polish boats followed by Italy and Australia and Austria somewhere in the mix just back from there. And Belgium 24, who were leading the race early on, maybe they've just managing to sneak back into the top 10. Stevie, uh, good game by the Spanish. We haven't said much about Botin and Trittle yet today, but they were second in the world two years ago and uh, definitely medal prospects. Botin, of course, being fourth at the, uh, the last Olympic Games and certainly wanting to put that right. Yeah, I mean, they sailed a great upwind leg then. They, they, they took a very similar track um, up the course. If you get on the SAP analytics, you can, you can change the length of their tail out the back of them and follow them around the race course. And they just did a nice job up the middle, much like the Dutch. And then given the opportunity on that downwind leg, they were able to, again, cut the corner, jive inside the Dutch, and then they controlled that starboard advantage into the finish. So nice tactical racing by the Spanish. There are a few points down on the overalls at the moment. Probably won't be entirely happy with where they are. They're nearly 20 points behind Fisher, but they've gained a couple back there and they'll be moving up into medal contention at this event. So good moment for that Spanish crew. And uh, I expect they'll be feeling confident going into this third race. Again, there's been a lot of points fly around out there on the racetrack today. Grummet and Hawes up to fourth in that race after a disappointing first race. So plenty of action. The start, again, pretty crucial. And look at that, how far back some of the boats were. The Dutch choosing to come out on Port Tack, we can see there. They were hoping to get out through the fleet. But yeah, definitely a bit of a scrappy start again. People struggling to hit the line on time. And I think looking back out to see from there, they'll be struggling to get a decent transit. And it's that little bit of accuracy that can really hurt you. The Polish here, they were right in the mix along with the Belgians and they missed their ley lines. But there's bigger, bigger problems than that to be found out there on the race course. There were just some moments in it where you could get really hung up, get out of phase with the shifts and lose an awful lot of distance very, very quickly. Belgium looked pretty much impeccable for the first lap. And, uh, and I think you'll probably want to forget the last lap because it didn't go too, too great for them. They slid all the way back down to 11th, which was, uh, which was disappointing for them, but easily, easily done. And also, I think um, I, I thought uh, Netherlands one had crossed the finish line in second. It looks like it was actually third and they were beaten across the line by France 16. So uh, for a team of such high standards to be leading around the top mark and then to, to give two away, uh, partly through a bad jibe. Their final jibe was, was pretty awful. Um, they'll be kicking themselves there a little bit, I would think. Yeah, I think so. I think it was, uh, you know, they were they were there to be shot at. And I think that's the hard thing. It was tight when you're out in the lead. Ultimately, I mean, yeah, let's see. Let's see what we're talking about on Sunday with, with one or two points, because I don't want to sound too flippant about one point. That was the jibe you were talking about there, right hand side of the screen, just on the top of the swell. So as they turn the boat, it unloads a lot because of the way the water's moving at that point on the wave. And they were caught out with that a little bit. Um, but, you know, mistakes can happen to the best of us. But I think right at this stage on such a gusty, shifty, wacky races kind of day, you'd be just thinking, let's get some decent results in, you know. And I, and I think the Dutch won't be too worried about those couple of points. They'll be looking at it and thinking, well, I'm glad it wasn't a 15th because that was pretty had out there. And, and, you know, like Diego Bortin, he's got a race win. But in the back of his mind, he'll be thinking, OK, we need to sharpen up here a bit because we were 15th at Mark 1. And actually, we made some mistakes to be 15th and it quite easily might have not got the opportunities we had. So it's interesting, the psychology on a day like today. I think you just you're scrapping the whole way around the racetrack. And ultimately, can I get out of today with less than 20 points accumulated over the three races? I think if I could do that, I'd be feeling relatively happy going forward. Um, as, as that's a fairly solid first day. But we'll see what those averages work out as, as the day goes on. Thanks, Stevie. Nora, when we come back after a break, I want to ask you about strategy for what will be the final race of the afternoon, race three in Gold Fleet 49er men. Back to you shortly.
Welcome back to Lanzarote. We're in the south of the island. Uh, we're sailing out of Marina Rubicon. This is day four of the 49er and 49er FX World Championships. It's Olympic year, so there's a lot riding on it. I'm Andy Rice, and I've got two former Olympians with me, Nora Ruskula from Finland and Stevie Morrison from Great Britain. I understand uh, that we have the opportunity for an interview fairly shortly. I'm wondering if we're going to be hearing from the Spanish Diego Botin and Florian Trittle who managed to win that race just at the end of the run to the finish. So let's see if we can hear from the Spanish. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to, not sure if we're going to be able to get them. Um, Nora, the strategy, is there such a thing as strategy on a fluky day like today? I'm thinking, for example, do you hit the sides like we're seeing some of the French teams do or do you try and play it up the middle like we saw the Dutch do so well in that race just now? Yeah, tricky. I mean, there's always strategy or at least we try to simplify things because that's easier for our heads. Uh, but yeah, we, I think... I would stay more like try well play the fleet a bit more like don't do anything crazy. I mean, some it does work out sometimes, but it just as we've seen, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. And normally we highlight we see the ones that come, you know, have went all the way to the right, for example, and then come with a clear lane. But we don't notice the ones that when it doesn't work out. <laughs> so, uh, Stevie, what's your view? It's a percentage game, isn't it? So one strategy isn't going to work all the time. So so what's the best percentage play, do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a risk management game, isn't it, that we're playing out here. And, and I think uh, 
think it changes day to day, moment by moment. I think ultimately you, you're trying to keep yourself in touch with, say, the lifted tack and a bit of pressure early on on that leg. Um, but if you see something on the side of the course that is the breeze and you've got to back yourself to make those judgment calls, you don't you don't win gold medals by sitting around in the middle of the fleet. You, uh, you, you know, you've got to do that a lot of the time, but you've got to know when the opportunity is there to take it. And, and I think the French, you know, they were they were pretty punchy on that race, but but it worked out well for them. They were brave and they and they were accurately brave. It, it's when you're brave and you get it wrong. That's the, that's the trouble. So I think, yeah, it's being consistent, stay in the middle, give yourself opportunities, but you're not going to win a lot by just tickling around in the middle. At some stage, you've got to make a brave decision. And uh, and that's what it takes for, for any of these guys, really. I think that was well said, Stevie. And I wanted to add as well, I think the starts have played a, a big role now today in the afternoon racing with the 49ers. You can really see that the ones that did good starts or found opportunity to get out of the start if they had a bad one and just get on the right beat with the shifts uh, made a difference. Because if you had a shocker, it's it's tricky to climb up from there. Yeah, I, I would say that was very true of the first race. I wasn't so convinced about the importance of the start in the second race. It was, it was a messy start anyway, so maybe That's some true. people didn't... Uh, uh, maybe it didn't matter that much because of that, because it was quite a sloppy start. Belgium had a good start, and and they they made the running early on in the race, and the, and then not quite sure where it went so badly wrong for Belgium. Um, but uh, yeah, I I wasn't I, I felt like some people really came back from quite deep from the start and still still had a good race. And I, I, I'd say all, all day long for the 49er FX and the 49er, if you, if you get a bad start today, there, there's enough opportunity on this race course to, to still come back. But of course, you always want a good start if you can get one, don't you, Stevie? I, I definitely think that if you're, if you're out in the lead, you're giving yourself every opportunity that sometimes, I mean, I think what you've got to remember back to is the first race. We can kind of wax lyrical about how how well Bart and uh, uh, and Co sailed back through the fleet in that second race, and they did. They did a fantastic job. But in the first race, they stayed exactly rooted where they were, right at the back of the the low teens result wise. So I think it, you know, it, it's hard out there on the race course. And yes, there might be opportunities to come back through, and there's certainly a lot more chance for there to be an opportunity to come back through than on a sea breeze day in Marseille, where the wind's not really shifting at all, and and the track's going to be really closed down. But here with some shifts there'll be that opportunity but a hundred percent if you're the first person arriving at that bottom gate you should get the best decisions now unfortunately for the belgians they chose the wrong one uh, and, and i'm sure it's a lot a lot harder than it looks uh you know on, on, a, on a simple day but you definitely want to get to the bottom first and that's what i mean by diego bottin he won the race but he'll be more worried about the fact that he was 15th at mark one and he'll be wanting to sharpen up his game on these first Two, three hundred meters out the start. Quite crucial here in this third race of the day. We're slowly, slowly finding us, the guys are finding a spot on the race course. This is the yeah third race of the day. And uh, yeah, to be fair, I think the racing committee have been doing these races pretty quickly. Like the conditions have been perfect. They've been spot on. Just like rolling in the next start right after a quick little break from the previous one, which makes the racing and everything so efficient. That's what we all like to see. Now let's have a, have a look at the overall leaderboard. So Fisher and Picard still holding on to the lead with 34 points ahead of Lambriex and Van der Verken, still in second in 43 points. Uh, but that race win moves Botin and Trittle up and into the podium for the first time this week. Uh, sailing on home waters there now in uh, with 54 points. Same as Daniel and Storch, the Polish team, also on 54. And Grummet and Hawes, well, a little bit of a drop down, but still very much in the hunt in fifth place. Cibitek and Piasecki from Poland also making good gains today. And Dortoli and Del Peck um, climbed a little bit thanks to that race win at the start of the 49er afternoon. Uh, and then we round out the top 10 with Switzerland, USA and New Zealand and we are just what just over a minute away to the start looks like we're um, pretty much in 
sequence and um, the uh, the fleet looking very lined up and as long as there are no last minute curve balls no last minute shifts this looks like it should be a a much more even start from left to right across the the start line bit of a gaggle up at the committee boat end Nora looks looks a little bit too busy for everyone to be able to good get a good start out of the right hand end it does maybe yeah potentially but also it clearly there must be a benefit on that we can't see from here on the com starting from the committee boat because wow okay looking at this you see how the boats are lined up pretty far away from the pin end so they i think now slowly coming closer but i probably can't notice that don't see there's no like landmarks on the other side so you can't see if you're actually in the middle on the line like how close or how far you are from it's hard to ju judge but here's five seconds left here we go, just about to get launched off the start line and there's big gaps, big opportunities down at this end of the line. Netherlands won a bit slow to pull the trigger off the pin end, but it looks like they'll just get away with it and just manage to squeeze around with Australia on their hip. Spain 74, winners of the race just now. Not a particularly great start for them either, but look at Poland 64 wow. up on the far side. Absolutely incredible start by Poland 64 also very good starts just out of just behind some of the other sails but I think a pretty good start for Switzerland too the furthest right hand boat as we are at the moment and then coming out the middle in reasonable shape GBR 12 also looking pretty good with Italy 23 but absolutely launched Stevie Poland 64 yeah Poland 64 yeah, they, I mean, they look like what they have their... so sorry Stevie continue <laughs> Oh, no, no. Yeah, sorry. It's uh, just saying what timing. And they, they were really lined up perfectly with a little finger of breeze. They had great pressure. It's a right-hand shift, so they're rolling forward. It's, it's going to be pretty hard for the Dutch down at this end of the line. And, and, I, and what's really hard in the decision-making is I don't know that they could have seen that three or four minutes out. So they wouldn't have known it was going to do that big a shift, I don't believe. Um, and, and you can find yourself pretty handicapped. That's why I think that's why we come back to the percentages, that percentage of being up the line, then you've got a little bit of a better chance. <clears throat> that said, you'd have been absolutely hammered in race one with the big left shift. So hindsight's a beautiful thing. But for the Dutch, they are at least going to be on the lifted tack, sailing the way they want to go. And it's now going to come down to what pressure is there out on this left hand side. As we see the British crew, James Peters, having to tack. Looks like he started to get a hint of a left shift there got a pretty good angle back across and they'll actually not be in too bad a shape all the boats are starting to tack now obviously starting to feel some left shift up in the middle of the pack but yeah absolutely superb execution by the polish and uh, and there you go middle of the pack the french team overall leaders still heading out towards this left as are the dutch and the dutch now look like they're in pretty good pressure so they will not be too worried just yet yeah the dutch are actually knocking as well so i'm I'm surprised to see they're still continuing, but there's a bunch of boats really committed on the left side going for it. So we'll see. I think they'll probably tack soon, but they will, they'll probably be a bit behind the ones that already tacked it because of the left shift. Could be, but yes, it doesn't look too bad now, does it? It, it looks like if the, the, the Dutch have managed to be patient on the left-hand side, that, that patience could be starting to pay for them. I, I wonder if Denmark 66 wasn't there, if, if the Netherlands would attack by now. I'm, I should imagine the Dutch are shouting at the Danish to tack on to port. But actually, it, it looks all right for the Netherlands right now. But the breeze also coming back for Switzerland on the far side, up closer towards the Lanzarote shore. Yeah, I think that the interesting thing that we can't see from this camera angle is what breeze can they see on the left-hand side of the track? Because as much as you say it's tricky conditions, which it is, if you can just see a solid line of breeze out to the left of the island, you'd be pretty happy carrying on. I do agree that once those Danes go, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Dutch go fairly soon. But he obviously can see the breeze out here. And this is what we talk about. This is your, your sort of gold medal back yourself moment here because the wind has headed since the start. They are in good pressure. And he must see prep breeze out there. If you can see wind out there and it looks solid, could be the time to be brave. Looking at the Dutchies here, actually, how the boat moves, I think it looks like there's way more chop than what it's been earlier today. It was like a big swell and pretty flat, but now the boat really rocks up and down. 
And maybe that's another factor. I, I should think it's a, a pri one of the lower down the priorities, but uh, sea state from side to side on the race course, probably not a massive issue, but, but it might be having an effect on boat speed from, from side to side. There, there we have a different angle on, on the Dutch, and now is the moment of truth as they are on a converging course with, with the rest of the fleet. And they are very exposed right now. I, I just wonder how this is going to work out for them. Now we can see the, the Swiss all the way in the top of the screen. They, almost, they kind of have their personal gust there, like we saw earlier with the Polish. So this is going to be, I think this is going to be an interesting race now. We're getting more like personal gust and things happening. They're knocking a lot, or at least the angle looks like that. But I think, yeah, you can't just tack on every single gust and knock and hit it, whatever you have. You're going to stay on the lane for a bit longer just to see what's next. This, this is probably as much tacking as we ever see in a 49er race in this kind of wind, wind strength. I mean, there's the, the gusts and the lulls and the, there's so many potholes in the road and it's worth putting in the extra tack to avoid one of those potholes or hurdles or whatever you want to call them. Um, but oh, look at that. That's a, that's a beautiful shot if you're a, a, a Swiss <laughs> fan. It's just chalk and cheese, isn't it? Yeah, and it really looks like yeah, I mean, the, the boats <laughs> all the way to the right. They're like they're so far off, and it looks like they have way less wind. It's a game of wow. two halves, Stevie. <laughs> it's a game of two halves, but you wouldn't mind being a few meters up at half time, would you? And uh, and the Swiss here look like they've done a brilliant job of putting this beat together. They're certainly looking really well positioned into the top mark, but they've still got room to go here. I mean, I think that's the interesting thing. You'd be wanting now, where's the breeze? Is the breeze left of me? And I want to be sailing a slightly high mode and keeping myself up in that breeze. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, the drone pilot's got his ears out for us nicely. Looks like they're sailing straight towards pretty good pressure. Be interesting whether that does head them a little bit though when it hits, but they look nicely powered up here. And they're just, yeah, look, little mode change there. Anticipating that gust coming on. They've set the boat up ready for this next gust. And they're into it early on with those shifts there. Fantastic angle there behind the boat. The coaches probably won't like us seeing that, getting that close on board, having spent the whole winter protecting their uh, sailors from any attention. But we'll put the drone right on board so everyone can see. You're welcome. Um, yeah, there you go. Look at that right in there. Brilliant setup for the Swiss here. And I think this gust should be enough to get them across in front. They'll be looking to keep the boat going pretty fast. They're exposed to boats on the right, but they're not too exposed to boats on the left. So it's time to be in a relatively fast mode, close down that right-hand side, and then set yourself up for a good ley line. It looks to, on the tracker like uh, they've got good speed and also good height on port tack. So everything going the Swiss way at the moment. And here's another angle. In case uh, the other coaches hadn't, hadn't caught the setup of the rig from the transom, we're getting the setup from the front. And uh, these, <laughs> these guys are coached by Ian Barker, who, uh, Stevie, you, you'll know very well, um, a silver medalist for Great Britain at Sydney 2000. And um, Ian Barker knows the 49er inside out and probably is one of the best technical tuning coaches there is in this class. So um, he's probably cursing harder than anyone right now, Stevie. <laughs> yeah, no, Barker will have uh, will have done a good job, and he's been he really transformed the Swiss. They've they've had a fantastic eighteen months or year since he since he got involved. Um, but no, Ian's very experienced. Although I do remember the last day he coached me on a day like this, the feedback was rather you than me. So um, I'd be interested to know what advice Seb got before racing today uh, with these shifty conditions. But absolutely, that Swiss boat looks superbly set up, and um, and Ian will be enjoying watching this one. But now the Swiss are in a three-way battle to see who's going to get to the first mark in first place. Have they overstood or have they called it just right? Will the two boats just to leeward be able to steal their thunder? It looks like it could be Poland and Spain also in the mix as well. Is it uh, a chance for Diego Botin and Florian Trittle to take a race lead after winning the previous race just now? Let's find out shortly. No, there's another tack involved for the Spanish, so... Um, looks like it's still playing the way of Switzerland too right now. That was such an incredible shot seeing three of them just like lining up perfectly. And it, oh, wow. yeah, it it, uh, it it was it looked like a very even battle, but actually not knowing where the ley line was, it's um, it it wasn't quite as clear cut as that. So this yeah. is. 
Oh, actually, Switzerland's still got some ley line to go as well. So they've, they've still got some fighting to do to, to make sure that they lead around the top mark. But I like the Swiss that they went a bit further just to tack, like pretty much on all of the boats right now. Uh, they didn't go too early, so they have they could still keep the French behind them. Was that the French? Yeah, France yeah. 16. Uh, because they didn't have that much left to the ley line. Like I could believe they'll tack pretty soon. Yeah, here they were pretty, they were not far off, but you could never know. Obviously, I they had to. Very very sensible, really, considering how much we've seen of overstanding the ley line. And Stevie has pointed out that's not always a bad call. But in these lighter breezes, um, I think probably overtacking the ley line is a bit more expensive. So so better to put extra tax in, provided that your your tax are good enough to, to justify the extra manoeuvres. Just about fully powered up. And if they've... Called that ley line correctly. No, they haven't. An extra double tack. That's oh. going to be a little bit expensive. Stevie, that that was a a, a bit of a, a a missed call from the Swiss. They didn't need to do that, being as close as they were to the mark on that previous ley line call. Really, did they? No, I don't think so. I think they could have given that an extra couple of meters and got round at the, the you know setting an extra couple of meters there compared to what they would have lost in the tack was was a bit of an unforced error. Um, easy to say that sat here, but I think for, for guys as good as that, that was um, something they'll be a little bit disappointed with. However, what they won't be disappointed with is such a good lead there, as we see now. Interestingly, first to split away, second, third and fourth are early to jibe. We can see there is good breeze coming down on the fleet, but they will be sailing through the dirty wind of the fleet. Second place jibe, so we've got to anticipate fairly soon a jibe from the Swiss to cover that off, I'd imagine. I feel like it's definitely a right shift at the moment. So I think the jibe set's probably not a bad call. And those boats there in the middle of our screen heading off downwind look to me as though they're aiming quite well down the course and in decent pressure. So, um, yeah, tricky call for, uh, for Seb Schneider. Now, what does he do? Does he extend or does he try and cover them off? Surely cover them off. Well, let's find out surely. No, oh, no, not covered off yet. Maybe don't feel that they've got the, the gust or the shift to be able to get back across. So this must be rather nail-biting moments for the Swiss because one feels that if they had the opportunity to jibe, they would have taken it by now. Here they go. And now they'll find out shortly afterwards if they've got any decent breeze to accelerate out of this jibe. Beautiful jibe. Very nice, wasn't it? Yeah. Very, very flat and straight into full power again. So, so no problems about the quality of the jibe itself. It's just, is there enough breeze to get them safely back across the attackers on the far side of the race course? It really looked like, uh, yeah, it's beneficial to do a jibe set or like the Spanish did, just jibed after they set the kites when they saw uh, a gust coming, a bigger gust coming in when they went around the top mark. We are getting... Ah, oh, this is a replay of the top mark rounding. Right. So so there they did the uh, the double tack that was a little bit expensive, but uh, we'll see if it actually causes them any problems. It looks like they're nicely pressed here at the moment. Um, so the this is a, a pretty good view for Swiss fans again. It, it looks like the Swiss are in pretty good control right now. Yeah, and looking at the tracker, like their angle is is pretty good. It looks like it's going like way to, more towards the bottom mark compared to the ones that jibed early, uh, that did the that are still on the right side of the course and now coming back slowly from there. The Spanish, for example, are all the way to the right together with uh, the Polish. Beautiful jibe from the Italians there. And Italians are once on the, yes, all on the far left side of the course. So we have basically the, the ones that are approaching the mid, well, we have the Dutch, but they're a bit further back, but they're in the middle and Swiss more middle left than Italians all the way right and Spanish and Polish all the way right. Did I? Now I got confused. <laughs> <laughs> it it depends, on your left, Andy. <laughs> depends on your left and right. I it's meant always, left and right. It's <laughs> always difficult to call, isn't it? What's what's left and what's right? Yeah. Um, is it from <laughs> our perspective or is it from, from theirs as they go downwind? And, and that's a communication thing as well, Stevie, isn't it? Sometimes people can get that wrong on board boats as well. 
Oh, absolutely. And I uh, can't hold your hand up to check the old left and right with your thumb and your forefinger when you're sailing one of these things, that's for sure. So it's definitely uh, definitely a problem area. But we're on board the Italians here and it's noticeable how much the crew on this jibe where they're sailing down the swell. Watch the crew, how he's running forward and backward there to try and kick the boat down it. And I think, you know, these kind of conditions, that kinetics that you can put into the boat can be quite crucial. But a lot of that tends to land on the shoulders of the crew as the helm's trying to lock himself in position to be able to steer accurately. Setting up for a jibe here. And after a perfect jibe from starboard onto port, you can just see how much harder it is jibing from port onto starboard. That's just due to the difference in the swell angle and how the boat loads and unloads from the different jibes. So a lot harder the jibe across as we come on board here with Peters and Sterrett. <clears throat> They're somewhat in the middle of the pack here. They're fifth place. So this is a decent one for them today. They've got the boat up and ripping here nicely. And it's how well are they lining themselves up for this bottom gate. They set up for a jive there. Spinnaker a little bit late on the clue of the spinnaker there. But they pulled it through. Good handwork by Finn to catch up. And they set themselves up nicely there. Look like they're in good pressure. But the Swiss dominant position right now. Sailed a very nice downwind leg. And we see looking back upwind, there's a lot of breeze coming down for the start of this next upwind leg. So that's all good news for the Swiss. As long as they can get around this bottom mark in good shape. As Stevie just said, that looks like there's a good band of breeze coming down. So they won't need to fret too much about sitting in the no wind zone at the bottom of the race course. We, we know that from the previous five races today, three in the 49er FX and two in the 49er, there's plenty of place changing that can happen. This is a really un, unusually open race course where so much place changing can happen. And then you look about a minute further up the course and there's a really dark band of breeze coming down. So uh, there, there is plenty that can affect the, uh, the current running order of this race so far. Absolute minefield for this upwind leg, really, I think, here. As you see that huge gust coming down and how much the gaps have opened up in the fleet, there's already some pretty big gaps. Those boats out the back are a long, long way behind. And they do include the Dutch. The Dutch are showing us back in 17th place, 18th place at the moment. So potentially a very expensive race for them with the France 16 up in third at that bottom gate. But yeah, where are you picking your money on this upwind leg? Can I get in that nice patch of breeze early on? But up the course, it's going to be harder to read. I think saying somewhere near the middle of the course early on is not a bad move to see what pans out. And the ones coming downwind, they also have to obviously avoid the ones going upwind. I think it looked like the Dutch had a bit of an issue there. You could just see it in the far of the screen that when they were driving towards the marks, there was some boat coming upwind and... It's wait, what what's happening now? I'm really surprised of the Dutch you see. They're coming from the left side of the, the bottom mark towards the right and they chose to go to the right even though they were all the way next to the left. Stevie, did you see this? What do you think they were thinking? Yeah, I don't know. I can only think they wanted to go to the left of the course and they didn't want yeah. to be following people. So they've come left turn and then gone for an early tack, but it was a lot of extra distance to sail. <coughs> um, very strange decision really by them but yeah it just shows that even the best can get themselves in a position where it all gets quite hard quite quickly because now we see the breeze really coming down the middle of the course it's quite quite windy and uh those lead boats are going to be able to really stretch away some big gaps the first five six seven boats have got a big lead over things here but the swiss i don't know how they're going to be faring against those polish boats that turned left at the bottom of the course because it looked like really really good wind up towards the top of our screen and that should be diego bottin somewhere up that way he was the first boat to turn left at that bottom gate also, we think we see everything here with all the tracks and videos and drone angles, but there clearly, I mean, there, there can be some things that we just totally miss on the race course and we can't see from, from this angle. No, that, that, that's always the way, isn't it? If only we could look further to the left and, and, and see what uh, Seb Schneider and Arno de Planta are, are looking at further upwind. But it does seem like their lead is under threat from the boats further right from Poland 64 and Spain 74. So um, a very difficult, difficult race to defend uh, for anybody. But I, I think the Swiss have a battle on their hands after having a fairly decent lead towards the bottom of the course around the leeward gate. 
Yeah, the Spanish did a good job, like sneaking in. They were third in the bottom mark, and now they're just sneaked into the first. Well, first would, position. wouldn't that be amazing if if they can win two races this afternoon and. That would uh, really put them up into contention. They already got up into a podium spot. Will it be enough to start threatening the front two, uh, the Dutch in second overall and the, the French in first overall? It seems like the Spanish are making sense of these really difficult conditions. Yeah, and I don't know if this is actual their home waters, but I know they have spent a lot of time here. That it's actually the opposite end. I mean, you couldn't where they come from in Santander. It's about as far north as you can oh, get yeah, in Spain. Oh, they're both from there. That's true. Yeah. So, so they come from the rainy part of Spain, and we are in the furthest south bit of Spain. Um, I, I don't know how much further south it is from mainland Spain, but it's probably a, a thousand miles or so. Yeah, um, it's the opposite. But Santander has similar kind of swell, and I would say we had the worlds there a bunch of year, years ago. That's right. But it's not so different compared, like, looking at these conditions, they're pretty similar. Actually. Yeah, yeah, def definitely some similarities. Um, so there they are flying along, and, and uh, I, I, you can bet, Stevie, that not everybody's got the kind of breeze that we're looking at on the Spanish boat right now, and so they will just be stretching away while they're charging as hard as this. Yeah, they've, they've definitely got big right-hand pressure. You can see they're fairly eased on the sheet there. Plenty of twist in that mail, and they're fairly hammered down. They look like they're sailing in a pretty fast mode at the moment. They're trying to get forward across this shift. They're slightly right of the middle of the course, but relative to the fleet, they're beautifully lined up, and they're just using that gust. Fast mode to try and roll forward, and I suspect they can see some breeze towards the left-hand side. No one in that picture there threatening to the right, so it's all about hammer down, Fast mode across that gust of wind. It looks pretty good for them right now. If it stays like this, it'll be an easy decision at the top mark as well for them to make. It's a pretty comfortable position for them to be in. Um, Schneider and De Planta, they were leading around the bottom mark and you can see their purple tracer on the tracker there. They're down into fourth place now and they're being threatened by GBR30, Peters and Sterrett in, wow. in fifth place. Looks like there's a big, big uh, shift right now ongoing. Oh, yeah, the Spanish and the Polish. You can see their angles just going, like, further away from the top mark. But And I was kind of waiting, like, when are they going to attack? But clearly, they probably wanted to go into the gust that was approaching and then do the attack. Since, as we spoke earlier, they don't really move the gusts here. They kind of stay set, put, and you have to go in there. So we're on the final beat of the afternoon. This is race three, Gold Fleet, 49er men. We've already seen three 49er FX races earlier in the day. Uh, we just saw Spain ESP74 win the previous race in race two of the Gold Fleet men. And it's currently Spain 74 who hold the lead yet again, um, to coming towards the top of the course in race three. It's once more around the windward mark and then it's the charge down to the finish and it will be the end of a long, mentally taxing day. Stevie, it's, uh, it's been a bit of a mind twister today, hasn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, we've had to do six races. They've only had to do three. So I guess mentally it's been a real twister for us, Ricey. But um, yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's been hard, hard racing. The, the saving grace has been, there's generally speaking, been enough breeze that they can be up and planing. I think it's the moments where you see the helm and the crew crouching in and they're in a displacement mode. Then you're really in the lap of the gods. We saw the Spanish there. They sailed a dramatically different mode to get to that new wind speed, which you can do when you're planing. But as soon as it's that little bit lighter and you're in a displacement mode, it's very hard to sail the different modes aggressively. And then you are limited. So I think these last couple of races for the 49er men has been a little bit. No, it's no way has it been easier, but it's been a little bit more. We can make some actual choices and get to the wind we want to get to. As I think some of the FX races would have been pretty painful because you were so limited by by your moding as to what you could actually do. And yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the top of the beat works out. Can Diego hold on because that Polish crew's not thrown away at all quickly? No, and um, the, there's a bit of a split developing between them. The Polish sailing out towards the left-hand ley line towards the top mark. And the Spanish, I thought, were heading in the right direction for the next gust. It looked like there was a good gust from their direction. Now, I think it is the right call for them. I think they look a little bit higher and faster. And if anything, maybe it's the Polish in second who are looking a little bit more exposed at the moment. 
but actually, yeah, the, the gaps are, yeah, it's still reasonably comfortable for the Spanish, but um, we know how much things can change on this final run to the finish, and, and Poland still has a chance of attacking Spain on the final downwind leg. Now, the big decision next, is it a straight set or is it a jibe set? It's a straight set and a pretty good one for Diego Botin and Florian Trittle, soon to be followed round by Poland 64. I think um, quite quietly here as well, Fischer and Pekan have done a nice job. We've already talked about them a lot in the last two races, but they've been right up at the front of the fleet. They've been chipping away quite nicely. They're sat right now. They're sat in fourth place, very tight for third. Um, you know, they're right in the match here, that French crew. And, and I think as much as this has been a good performance by Botin and Trittle, the French have been chipping away. They're potentially being overtaken by James Peters and Finn Sterrett here. Um, but yeah, great day for the French. And probably bigger story going on is way, way back in the fleet is the Dutch. Back at 24th, it's showing out on the tracker right now. So this could be a huge, huge moment in hopes of defending their world title for the Dutch because they've already got a 20th from the qualifying series that they'd need to go back on. Yeah, this is disastrous for the Dutch. They rounded the top mark in 16th. They, they sure, surely thought at that point, well, we can only go forwards. But unusually for Lambriex and Van der Verken, they've gone pretty much to the back of the fleet. Just, just, just one boat off the very back of this 25-boat fleet. So scary moments for the Dutch. And uh, they'll, they'll have to see what they can make of this final run downwind. Looking at the final race now, we can see it's it's getting way more patchier now throughout the end of the day. Uh, it picked up well after the FX races, but now it looks like we will there will be bigger differences for sure in speed and just angles as we've seen throughout this whole race. More opportunities, but also bigger distances between. I think bigger distance def definitely between the lead and the, like the pack. Yeah, of the feet. yeah, it, it it is it is getting a little bit patchier. There we were with New Zealand four very briefly. We're not seeing as much of them this week as I expected to. They're they're in about ninth or tenth in the race at the moment, and it looks quite comfortable for Spain when you see that angle. They're sailing the same direction as their closest rival, Poland sixty four, and they're doing a, a loose cover. The Spanish keeping themselves between the finish line and where the Polish are, and it doesn't look like there's any banana skins on this part of the course, but there does look like there's darker water further up the race course, so uh, they could still, Stevie, do you think, be some uh, significant place changing in the further down the order? I think definitely further down the order. The French, uh, not the French, sorry, the Spanish here, look like they've managed to poke right round the bottom of that lull that the Polish find themselves in. So I think this could turn out to be quite a big lead for the Spanish when we get down towards the finish line here. They look well set, but without doubt, if you're back in the pack, there's plenty to be played for. That's the Polish with the black spinnaker out the back there. And they were just, you know, tens of metres behind Bottin at one stage. But yeah, they ran into a big hole and they're going to have the whole pack breathing down their neck now as Diego and Florian. Well, look at that. It's a bit of a... Bit of a show for the crowd right now for them. They've sailed fantastically in these last two races and they are always not happy with the drone. Come on, Diego. Keep us entertained, mate. But um, yeah, he needs to uh, he needs to needs to chill out about that when he's that far ahead, I think, for sure. He's doing a great job. They've sailed brilliantly in the last two races and they're going to go in absolutely full of confidence. What a time to hit this level of form on a day at the World Championship. Absolutely amazing. And uh, if things stay the way they are, then they would move up to second overall. So really good gains by Spain 74 today if this proves to be the second of two race wins on this three race day, the first day of Gold Fleet. We've got more Gold Fleet racing tomorrow, three races on the cards each for 49er FX and 49er. And then we got... Um, more Gold Fleet racing on the last day, but the most important part of the last day is the medal race. So we've still got two full days of competition to look for. And, uh, well, that's that will be good news for Lambrex and Van der Verken looking to, to make amends for what has been a pretty horrible race for them. But uh, are, are there any updates on, on their progress further back in, in the pack, uh, 
have you have you have you, have you managed to see Stevie? Uh, to be honest, right now, just having a few glitches with uh, with my tracker. To be perfectly honest, so relying on what what's on the live screen here. I mean, what what we would say is when you look back up when and you see that breeze filling down. The Dutch will have absolutely had the opportunity to make some gains back through the fleet. So it'll be interesting what they can do with that. Their tracker currently shows that they've made a massive gain. Um, but I think uh, it's been jumping around a little bit. Uh, and I'll wait till I see them cross the finish line before I hold my hat on it. But yeah, definitely going to have been opportunity on this day for some big gains for those boats behind. And if there's any crew that you'd put money on making it, you'd put it on that Dutch crew. Meanwhile, up the front with just metres to go. Can you believe it on such a difficult day? But it is Diego Botin and Florian Trittle who win their second race of the afternoon. And what an amazing performance by the Spanish sailing on home waters with the overall series leaders about to come across the line. It's France 16 who have also had a, a fantastic day today. Actually, sorry, that's Poland. That's Poland that came across in, in second there. Poland 64, and then Daniel and Storch. And just behind them. Yeah, thank you for, for that. And so, yeah, still a really good day for Fischer and Pican. And then GBR 30, James Peters, Finn Sterrett. Good finish for them. That's a bit more like it from them. Bit disappointing for Switzerland too, for Sebastian Schneider, Anna, Arno de Planta after leading that race to end up dropping down to fifth or sixth, whatever that was. And there we are back on board with Botin and Trittle heading back towards Marina Rubicon and some well-earned uh, rest and recuperation when they get back ashore. And partnership duration, 29 months. So two and a half years these guys have been sailing together. Diego Botin did the uh, the last Olympics uh, with Iago Lopez. They finished just outside the medals in fourth place. And uh, Florian Trittle was in the NACRA 17 uh, with Tara Pacheco. But then he switched to the 49er to team up with Botin. And they, they got second in the Worlds a couple of years ago. They are, I think, possibly up to second in the overall standings now after today. Um, that's how I've got it. I think they've just moved ahead of, of Poland. Um, but there are our finishes across the, the finish line of uh, the third race of Gold Fleet. It's Spain in the lead just ahead of the Polish, um, who are now down to third, but only a point overall in the standings. But it's Fischer and Pekan who are uh, continuing to hold the lead. But a disappointing day for Lambriex and van der Werken, who would have hoped to have make, made inroads on the, the French lead, but instead the Dutch have slipped back down to fourth place overall. Here's the start of the race. So it's the Dutch who managed to get away with a, a pin end start, but maybe that wasn't where they wanted to end up. And uh, Sebastian Schneider, Arn, Arno de Planta lead in the early stages of the race and, and hold on to that. And then vital intel from the drone telling us how they set up their rig, something that Stevie enjoyed an awful lot. And just coming up to the mark, they had to do a double tack, a little bit expensive for them, misjudging the ley line so close to the windward mark, but still in a very nice position at the front of the fleet. And just in the background, you can see France 16, uh, Erwin Fisher and Clement Pecan, always there or thereabouts. So we're still leading round the bottom mark, but then things were going to change significantly on the the leg up, and uh, they didn't manage to to maintain their lead all the way towards the top mark final time because it was Spain 74 who managed to seize the advantage round the top mark for the final time of the afternoon and managed to maintain that lead all the way to the finish and take the second of two race wins this afternoon. So, as Stevie pointed out earlier, Diego Boti not terribly happy about the close attentions of the drone. <laughs> First drone complaint we've had of the, the, the day today, Stevie. Um, he, he's going to enjoy that further down the line after he's got his feet up in his armchair, though. Being able to look back at all this stuff um, we, we don't we don't have quite that level of um, historical recording of back when we were sailing the 49er, but it's great to have those drone shots, isn't it? I was just looking into where oh, we lost the Swiss, actually. We lost them on the second upwind. 
they I just went a bit too far left in the beginning and I think they missed like a gust or a shift that was just crucial because they couldn't get back into the game after that or they could but not well enough not well enough not leading yeah um Stevie and um, uh, who were your who was your standout boat today is it is it the boat in picture or is there somebody else you want to highlight I, I think it's very hard to look past them. They've sailed a, sailed a fantastic day. And that second race especially, they really worked so hard to get back up through the fleet. I think Fisher and Pecan, you know, they had a tricky first race and then they've kind of quietly gone about their business for the next two. When we look ahead to a windier day tomorrow, could well suit them. They're a big crew and they've got some, got some really quite good pace. And then for everyone else, been pretty up and down, really. I mean, it just almost what we'd expect. It's a high quality, it's a tight fleet. Um, there's a lot can happen on a day like today. So yeah, I think I'd give it to those two boats. Hard to look past the Spanish really for the boat of the day with two wins to end things with there. They'll be going in pretty happy and um, and I'm sure Diego will be more than happy to have the drone back with him tomorrow because he seemed pretty happy to have it following him behind him after he'd finished the race. So uh, he'll be he'll be looking forward to that tomorrow. Um, but it's all going to be about getting a good rest tonight. The crews will already be thinking nutrition, rest, and we've got to go and do this again tomorrow because uh, winning the World Championships doesn't come easy. So there's a lot of hard work left ahead. Yeah, and we're in for a, a windier day tomorrow, we understand from the forecast as well, Nura. So um, it could play into the hands of, of different contenders. And, and who, who do you fancy in the 49er FX fleet if the breeze does pick up tomorrow? If it does pick up, I would expect to see the Swedish to send it pretty hard with their speedy. But for sure, there's many teams that could be good. But I think the Swedes for sure will, will challenge both well, the Brazilians and the Dutch. Well, I, I, I tend to think that Anhalt and Doots, who are uh, Van Anhalt and Doots from the Netherlands, who are leading at the moment, um, I don't think they're weak in the, in the strong winds at all. But I, I do think that Bobek and Netzler possibly have an extra click of speed in the, in the strong wind because they're tall, they're a little bit heavier. And that's probably what they need because uh, the Dutch really aren't putting much of a foot wrong. They, they managed to negotiate their way through a really difficult day today. And Grail and Kunz, we haven't seen much of them this week until today. And they, they saw a really great day for the Brazilians to lift themselves up into third, just ahead of these Australians that are surprising us in fourth place, Harding and Wilmot. Yeah, it's really cool to see them up there. And we hope to keep them there for the upcoming days as well. But I think the Spanish could be pretty strong looking for tomorrow as well. They're... They're strong in, in wind. They're, they're, they're tall, they're experienced. And as Stevie, you pointed out, I didn't know this great stat, but they, they won the World Championships leading into the previous two Olympic Games. So uh, that's, that's 2016 and 2020, they, they won the World Championships. So uh, Destiny says that uh, it is the Spanish who will win here on home waters. Is that your <laughs> thought, Stevie? I'm not too sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not too sure. We'll see about that. I think personally, I thought the Dutch sailed superbly. Uh, I, I really rate their boat handling. So I don't see you getting many free points from them. I think the Swedish could rue a couple of races today when it comes to it. Of course, we'll see a strong performance. Um, but I think the Dutch did put down a real marker today of consistency. Let's see. Joe Alley will be looking. She had that capsize at the bottom gate in race one today. That's potentially 20 points you could take off her total. That would put her somewhere near Martine and Kiana. So, you know, there's plenty of points left out there, plenty of opportunity to be found on the race course for sure. But, um, but yeah, I think it will be a challenging day for the crews. But I, I, think, um, I think they're all going to be hanging out for a mistake now from the Dutch. Yeah, no, I, I think that's probably right. I mean, they, they had a, a minor blip last year, not winning the Worlds, coming second, but that was with Annette Dutz carrying a pretty heavy knee injury and, and in doubt for whether she was able to race those championships at all. So um, overall, Dutz and uh, Van Anholt have really been the, the standout performers. And um, Nora, you and I were commentating on their first World Championship win together in Amman yeah. uh, just over two Three, years ago. Yeah. And that was the first time that we saw Bart Lambriex and Van der Verken, uh, Floris Van der Verken win 
their first world championship together and they haven't long teamed up actually at, at that point and it was a bit of a soft world it was just after the Olympics and we there were a few people missing so we didn't really know just what an indicator of, of how they would be but I mean um, Lambrix and Van der Verken have been the, the, the dominant team of, of this cycle in the men as well so a um, bit of a surprise to see them struggle as much as we did today that, that's the first time I can remember in quite a long time seeing the, the Dutch world champions struggle the way that they did today That's true but let's be fair everyone has their you know even though they have they struggled today I believe that they can pull off tomorrow and just climb up the ladder again pretty quickly and Stevie you, you said that that um 20th that they got at the end of qualifying was was a big mistake. I mean, a 20th actually means a 40th when you, when you think that it's one half of the qualifying group. I, I, I didn't see how that happened. Did you, did you have any insight into what happened in that race and, and why they got a 20th yesterday? Do you know what? I, I, I didn't actually, Andy. No, I, I don't know what happened. I mean, I know it was very gusty, very shifty, and there was quite a sudden change in, in one of their races where the wind came from being, it was constantly left of the mountain. It was a bit further left than yesterday, and then it ended up much more towards the right. But, but yeah, suddenly, if that had just been a tenth, you'd be able to take 10 points off the Dutch total quite easily because uh, that they wouldn't be using their discard up in qualifying, which is, you know, I just always felt like the difference with these world championships, you want to get out of qualifying, yes, with good results, but also having not burnt your discard. So that that definitely jumped out at me. Um, young British crew there, James Grummet, Ross Halls, I mean, they're in pretty rarefied territory there, so they'll be pretty chuffed to have had a good solid day today. They'll see what they can do tomorrow. And then, yeah, what can these boats further back down the top 10? They're already starting to be some big gaps. And in fact, there's already starting to be a big gap between second and first. So for Fisher and Pecan, you know, a solid day tomorrow where they can actually use that big lever of a crew, get that boat speed happening, and they could be pretty hard to catch already. Which is going to make them, put them in the box seat for selection for France. And and um, this is really impressive. And I, I shouldn't be so surprised because we saw another French team uh, win the uh, the Europeans at the end of last year. But the, the French really seem to be coming on strong just when they need to. Uh, and also today, the Spanish, Diego Botin and Florian Trittel, uh, now up to second. And we didn't have much to say about Staniel and Storch, but Poland 64, they, they've been chipping away all day and that's going to do them uh, no uh, no trouble at all in terms of the uh, whether they get selection to represent Poland at the Olympic Games so uh, there's a lot else in play other than um, who's going to win this world title it's it's about who grabs what they need to be selected to go to Paris 2024 uh, later on this year. So make sure that uh, you tune in with us tomorrow, 49er.org slash subscribe, and then you'll make sure that you get all the notifications to make sure that uh, you're with us and you don't miss the action tomorrow. Uh, from uh, me, Andy Rice, uh, from my fellow co-commentators, Nora Ruskala and Stevie Morrison, thanks very much for watching today. We're going to finish with some highlights and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for day five of the World Championships.